Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day number two of the TFT Vegas Open. We are live here from Las Vegas, Nevada, in one of the gaming capitals of the world to bring you this incredible TFT event, and it's already been pretty fantastic. Yeah, it has been amazing here. Just the energy in the room yesterday was so fantastic, walking around, seeing players popping off, seeing players, even, you know, the eliminations, there's so much emotion. You walk past, you see player head in their hands, you see just a defeat screen sitting there, and even that, it just makes you feel so good about the just entire progression of TFT from set one until now. Yeah, it's been pretty wild. Uh, the fact that everyone's here, we got the in-person land for the first time. It's been crazy to see all the face reactions, all the games that have been going on. It was a long day yesterday, so now you kind of have that, like, who's got the zombie look, who's, like, ready to go, <laughs> who's still energized. But it's, just, it's, it's a lot, and it's been, it's been amazing. Yeah, agreed. Like, getting to see the highs and lows of TFT in person is awesome. Like, modding at home on your computer is one thing, <laughs> but seeing it IRL, it's amazing. <laughs> That's been really, really fun to watch, for sure. And I feel like we even have more of that emotion to come as well. When we look at how today is going to play out, because these lobbies are intense. Not only did we already cut the competition down by 75% yesterday, but that is why these lobbies look even more difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be super tough. Up. And then on top of that, you know, you're going to have to play for the top two spots instead of the top four. So what we saw yesterday, people really fighting for those, you know, top first, second, third, playing that top four. They have to even go more aggressive to be playing first or eighth style. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think we'll definitely see how the meta is going to evolve over the course of the day. But I think a lot of players are playing for that first place spot because there's a grand prize of $100,000 on the line here for, who, for whoever ends up taking that first place spot. But you can also see how these seats get broken down. Yeah, this is the important thing today. Yesterday was top four got to move on, you know, 512, 256, 128. But now it's only top two. You've got four games, but when it's only top two, that means a single eighth place can be devastating. So we're really going to have to see how people can handle that mental and what kind of plays they make, right? Do you play conservatively? Do you go? Because even getting a few top fours might work if everyone's going like eighth, first, eighth, first. But really, you need like thirds and higher. Thirds and higher is going to be the key. And, you know, there's a lot of comps right now that are pretty risky, right? We've seen AD comps that if you don't hit the right pieces, it doesn't play out. And that's, that's going to be the big thing today. I mean, we see so much Fast 9 yesterday. And mm -hmm. I think that we'll see potentially even more today because you can't just roll down heavy on eight and hope to stabilize for a top four and expect to make it into the top two. And as you were saying, an eighth is probably going to eliminate you. I think it pretty much does because when we look at the games yesterday, if you got an eighth, you still needed a first to counterbalance it to even make that top four. And I think, you know, yes, we've got an extra game. We've got an extra sample size. Maybe if you go like one, 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 eight, you can still sneak through that top two, but it gives you a big uphill battle. We had a lot of players, though, that did go like 1-1, one, 1-1. One, one, one. Yeah. It's actually a very surprising amount of those players. But when we take a look at some of the action that happened on the main stage, Alex, I know we brought you on for that dev panel in the very middle of the day, but what did you think about the action throughout the day? Yeah, this one in particular I love. Like, I feel like all of the games with these two, they were just duels to the end, and we yeah. didn't know they were going back and forth. These games were probably my favorites from yesterday. These were awesome. It, it's, it's so cool to see, especially when you reach that late game phase, you're seeing the Jins, you're seeing the Canes, you're seeing the Sonas amp things up, and those late game fights get pretty intense, but that's kind of what we're seeing here, is we're seeing classic TFT, right? It's not the reroll comps other than really like country, it's build up to those late game, play those legendary units and do great. And I love the pop that's off so here. Nice. He's so <laughs> excited, and again, this is the thing I love about this event. We're seeing the emotion, the hype, and even some of these players like Flightsy we saw, who, you know, generally a little bit lesser known. Man, when he got that first, it was just so excited. It felt so great. Everyone getting the, the giant scuttle crabs here. And yeah, that final game, especially where Flightsy sealed the deal and was so excited. Yeah, he came to play on this stage, right? He was he was so excited about it. We saw tweets afterwards of just how happy he was that he got to do it. He got to play on the stage. He went first on the stage and just the smile on his face during yeah. the interview when he was up there is amazing. This is a reaction. He can't believe it. And then he's got that kind of relief and happiness at the end. I mean, it was just awesome to watch him. It was great to watch the action on the main stage, but we also had a ton of other lobbies that were playing out throughout the rest of the venue. And you can actually see some of the overall standings of how some of those other players did. And I feel like there are actually not too many surprises when you take a look at maybe some of these players that are in those top 16 spots. 
Yeah, I mean, we definitely see like the big names here, right? Like you're seeing Soju on screen. We saw Casey Double. We saw St. Vicious, stuff like that. But the bigger thing to me also is like, there are players that have been around the scene for a while. They're just not necessarily famous, but they've been challenger for multiple sets. And this is their chance to kind of make a name for themselves. Someone like Sia Nerds who's sitting there in second place, just like a ton of points doing well. And so that's really cool to see. Yeah, the other one at the very top, uh, B-Bear Dota, he was another player that has played in multiple cups, both him and Sia Nerds. And uh, like you said, these are players we don't talk about a lot when they show up at a cup because frequently they, you know, maybe make it through the open bracket and then they end up getting day three, but they can't quite have that spot. Like, but they've come in on this patch. They're playing very, very well. I mean, Sea Nerds went like one, 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 five. I'm pretty <laughs> sure, which is you know like the Robin scoreline. The lag. The lag. Yep. The lag. Yep. I mean, it's it's like incredible the way he's playing, and I'm I'm really looking forward to see how that progresses now because the lobbies are getting so much more intense. And if you can do that here, that is extremely impressive. For sure. I feel like we are still yet to be able to experience maybe some of those even higher highs from some of these players. But one player in particular that we ended up seeing do really, really well yesterday was St. Vicious. And we got a chance to talk to him a little bit about his performance. Well, I'm in like a study group with like other, some other TFT players. And they had this whole like idea that like you're supposed to roll an eight. And I like kept telling them like, no, you need like fast nine only. And so I was like, kind of like, like, man, maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, it just turns out like that's that's the people that are winning like every single lobby. Yeah, I mean, the, the the fact that you know he's still playing that fast nine. We talked about it a bunch of times with that new UI that showed how much gold was being spent on rolls, and Saint often was reaching level nine before he had spent any gold on rerolls. He was putting together boards with the headliners he'd find, with the items he'd find. And it was just such a creative play. And then even when he got to nine, he understood that like there are different ways to play this, right? We would see him play around Jin, which has been a little less popular than some of those other legendaries. We also saw him play around Kane. We saw him play around Kiana, stuff like that. Yeah, I was gonna say, not even like at the end of the game, we have to play flexibly. Saints done a great job playing flexibly throughout the game and picking up different headliners along the way. Um, we were talking about it a little bit before the game, but his just comfort in these settings, I think has shown a lot throughout the weekend so far. Yeah, it was the most impressive thing from Saint was the fact that he is able to play these vast uh, different uh, level nine boards. And this was a big thing with him being so good on the previous patch and climbing so much LP. It was around playing fast nine. He's been playing fast nine for so long and he was one of the first adopters. It was pretty much Setsuko and Saint were kind of the first two people we saw grinding out level or fast nine throughout the, that first patch. Yeah, and then the other thing to call it, we, you know, you mentioned it briefly, was like, Saint's been doing this a while, right? He was a competitive league player, he did a lot of LCS, stuff like that. So for him, coming here and being on stage is sort of like a, a return to form. It's like, I've done this before. But for a lot of our like younger TFT players, this is their first time having one of these major events. And we saw players like Setsuko, like, that kind of affected them pretty heavily. But Saint even was saying that he did get a little bit nervous. Like usually he's not very nervous, but even still maybe feeling some of the jitters of seeing all these people out there yep. that are there not only to support him, but also to cheer on some of the other competitors too. Yep. Yeah. I think the funny thing for me though is like, I think Robin finally has some competition in the old category. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real storyline here. It's true, it's true. <laughs> Definitely a lot of different players, a lot of different regions, stuff like that, different ages. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's been, again, like that's the cool thing here is like, it's not just a bunch of names on a tag like it's been when it's online. Here, you get to see the emotion on people's face. And it's funny, even the people that are going eighth, they're like, yeah, I know what I could have done, but it was so cool to be here. And I'm, I'm kind of ready. Can we do another one next week? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, can we? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably not next week. <laughs> no. well, like, hopefully someday. <laughs> it would be very, very cool for sure. And I've heard some similar sentiments around the board that uh, it has just been such a positive experience. Some people sadly did not get a chance to make it through to this second day of competition. As we said before, 75% of the field did get cut. And I think some of these names might surprise you. Yeah, on this list, Setsuko, Robin Song, this guy is so scar a box box. That's a lot of DSG players. Robin Song, especially. I think Robin had a really good first half, but I guess that second half was rough. Wolfie, Dog Dog, Tapu, Leffen. Uh, you know, Leffen, I think we kind of look, you know, a little weaker on yeah. the side, but like Dog Dog and Wolfie put up great showings. Um, didn't get to see Hapu's games, but she's always been a, a competitor as well. So, yeah, some of these names as well. 
Yeah, I mean, Soldier Song, see, we've got more of our international players that got knocked out. Tamura had a really good start. So does Soldier Song, so the fact that they're out is uh, definitely rough. Here we go, one of the better Chinese players that came over, um, not quite making it through. And Altanawe, player from the World Championship, he's someone who I think probably had high expectations for himself coming in. I know I, you know, he was one of the people who answered Gangly and I's survey. He was pretty confident, actually, on the patch and coming in, so definitely, I'm sure he's disappointed on that. Setsuko is still the one that like sticks out for me. Like oh, to your yeah. point, like he was so good at fast nine. I think he even went one five one in his first few games. Um, so he was actually probably the shocking one yeah. to me. On the alive side, we saw people like Soju, Milk. We've got Leloch, Coco, Shans. Shans being here, big representative from France. You know, Dobbs, BCLF. So yeah, we've got still got a lot of really high, you know, notable players left. There's still 128 in the field, but still a lot of players to go through. You know, Flancy, Goobum, obviously Saint we've been talking about. Dish Soap, I think somebody, Dish Soap was an interesting one in that he didn't really like last patch, but this patch, it seems he's much more in his comfort zone, knows how to play those strong like level eight boards and then get to nine. Very different than Saint's play style, for example. Yeah, he was really not confident coming in. And I think, as you said, it is very different from Saint because Saint doesn't roll a lot. He just kind of goes straight to nine. But Dish, we do see actually roll quite a bit on eight, but he tries to make the most efficient roll downs possible on those level eight boards. And we see him really create some very, very strong and creative level eight boards around multiple different four cost carries, and then use that to get to nine and pivot that board into something, you know, to cap out. And that's why we actually saw a lot of second places from Dish yeah. instead of first, because he's not quite getting that max cap but he's getting real damn close. Yeah, that's what I was gonna to touch on, the fact that he went like, I think it was like 2-2-2, two, 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 honestly, or something like that for his first half, and that he's been able to have those strong boards. And that's a score line that like can get you oh, yeah, even the top 75% things that we've got, or top 25% we've got going on today. If he just goes 2-2-2-2, two, 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 that's not gonna burn. Um, but if he knows those consistent lines that can get him there, that might be the edge he needs to get to that top 32. So what are we really expecting out of some of our players then? I know we've talked a little bit more about this like first versus eighth style or maybe just top four style that we have seen out of our players so far from day number one. I would love to know your take on maybe where these players need to go in order to get those first and seconds. Yeah, I mean, I think we always see the meta develop over the tournament, but I think with this cutoff, it's going to be even sharper. And I think it's going to be, unless you can play extremely flexibly and know your outs very well, I think it's going to be a really harsh, like, cut for today. I, I think the big thing here is going to be that a lot of people are going to look at like players like Saint and go, OK, fast nine is the way to play. But what's going to be the difference between who wins that all goes fast nine? It's actually going to be how you stabilize and get there on that one to nine journey, right? There's a big difference between getting there with 80 health and getting there with 20 health. And that's going to be the big difference, right? It's the people who understand that a level five board that saves you health is this, or the early game items that preserve your health are this, right? We saw a lot of like the Ginsu's Shojin Hodge slams. Those are the things that are going to be the difference makers here. Everyone kind of knows like, yeah, okay, go to nine, get the legendaries. I, I get that, but the path, that's the key differentiator. And I think that's actually where Dish Soap's style of play ends up being a li little more stable than yeah. a lot of the other Fast Nines. And even though he might not be able to get to those big caps if other players are pushing level nine a lot quicker, are trying to get there as fast as possible instead of as stable as possible, then maybe he doesn't quite beat the people who are you know, high rolling a little bit when they push that, right? They're hitting their you know five cost chosen immediately and they're able to build that huge board. But Dish might be able to consistently find those second and thirds. And that kind of style might end end up being king in a situation like this where you play four games and if you are just kind of sending it hey maybe you lower roll one of those games you take an eighth and that just kills your chances we actually saw a lot of players even invest into a bit of an hp cushion when it came down to picking an augment like tiny titans just to get a little bit of that stim boost i feel like that did help some of our players navigate maybe a more awkward mid game than they were expecting yeah i think a lot of players take a lot of extra damage when they're kind of i noticed they're searching for that perfect headliner mm -hmm. instead of playing more flexibly i think those augments do help you get through that midpoint if you don't feel as like confident in this space. Yeah, I think we're going to end up having to see whether players continue to, to do that or maybe they learned a lot from that first day of competition and they can take some of those learning experiences and apply it to day two. I, I think that's a big thing too, right? Is like maybe there was a line you weren't as comfortable with, right? Like say the Viego or the Akali and then you saw someone else do it. A lot of these players are quickly able to adapt and understand. It's like, okay, that's how you play the Viego line. 
now that opens up. And so I think we actually will see players even get better as the day goes on. So players like Saints especially can really pick up those extra lines, go, oh, these are the great items to build, etc. Yeah, I would love to see how we're going to end up actually seeing that meta continue to flesh itself out as we look at the competition later on today. But we have a sneak preview for you, and that's going to be the end of our pre-show. Over 500 players starting out, 75% of them eliminated in day one. We're in Vegas and we're gonna have people rolling the dice on some risky strategies. Vegas is a good choice for a TFT event because people would just say TFT is all about luck, but there is strategy, there is skill. You keep seeing the same names at the top. I mean, I've, I've played in like, tournaments on land for God knows how long. I definitely think it gives me advantage over the other players. I saw them, you know, kind of like buckling under the pressure. I feel like the best thing you do is just like keep your cool. The first fan I saw gave me a bracelet today and it said, they won. I thought it was really cute, so I wore it because I thought it'd be give, give me good luck. But it gave me exactly what it said, so I got day one. I. Uh... Okay, honestly, I think me and Soju right now we both suck. But like, if we study tonight and maybe like we find some random strat, maybe we can win the tournament. Winning. I'm winning the tournament. He's winning. He's winning. I'm winning the he tournament. He always says that. I'm like the most competitive player ever. It's super competitive. If someone's a high roll. Why not me? I love getting a chance to see this preview for day number two, because honestly, that video makes me even more hype about the games that we have today. I mean, I just love it. If someone's got a high roll, why not me? Let's go. <laughs> Bet. Yeah, come on, more dogs. <laughs> I mean, look, high rolls help, and we definitely have seen them help. But, you know, it is going to be about that knowledge. And so let's let's not like pretend it's all luck here. I think especially the first three games we saw, like the skill differential really made a difference. It's just now that difference in players is getting much more narrow, right? All the players in the top 128 are all really good. And so now it will be those sort of micro differences, right? Do you hit your headliner early? What are those small high rolls? And we might see a bit more of that make the difference here, but we'll, we'll see. I wonder, I wonder, because I feel like some some players, even when we took a look at St. Vicious's play style yesterday, maybe they did get a little unlucky when it came down to rolling down some of those like larger levels, looking for something like a five cost headliner, not hitting it. And so I wonder where you feel like maybe we will see some of those players start to make adjustments. Is it still going to be a level nine roll down or like what do you do if you're well, 40 gold in and you still can't find what you're looking for? Yeah, I think I saw that a little bit yesterday. I was watching some of Melk's games, and if you he got third in that game, but I don't know how in the world he hit that third. Like, looking at the first two in that lobby, it was crazy that he was able to flex through and make it. Um, but to your point, he was looking for that Viego. He wanted Viego, and he didn't want anything else. So I think in this day, today's games, like he's going to have to play more flexibly and play the Yone that he hit, um, or the Zed that he hit, even though he had like was running Titans and BT. And, and I do think in the you know in the previous day, in some of these lobbies, there was enough of a skill disparity that some of these players were able to find that edge. You know, Milk is such a good player that he can maybe find those the, a little extra HP from positioning, or you know some of the other things he's doing throughout the game, little micro decisions that he's making. But as we advance with these lobbies getting a lot tighter. If you go for that roll down and you're looking for just Viego and you're not finding it, yep. suddenly you're taking 20 every turn <laughs> yep. to the chin and you're going to go down so fast. Those uh, are some heavy hits. <laughs> yeah, I think another big difference here is the fact that like we've seen people get to level 9, but they need enough gold to have the odds to find it. And we saw some people get stuck on like one cost legendaries and not, or one star and not be able to do well. So. Yeah, we did see a lot of that, but I think on the flip side of things, when you look at how those legendaries did end up uh, showing up kind of in the statistics, Kiana, 
Any any Kiana believers on this couch hey, right now? Right here. Just one more. Mort knows I've been a Kiana believer for weeks. <laughs> Max, I've been talking about it backstage all the time. It's true. Uh, yeah, I mean Kiana again, that just that extra power, right? She as soon as you cast that first time, you generate extra items. It's just so powerful. All right, well, maybe we're going to see some of these players continue to invest into the Kiana at the top end in order to cap out those boards. But we are moments away from getting into our first game of the day. Remember, everybody, this is going to be our top 128 from the crowd that we started with yesterday. You can see our eight players that are taking their stations on the Rift. I always love that countdown to game start. Here we go. Picking the first portal of day two. It's going to be great here. And right now, some clear preferences here. Most of the players standing on one side. Not a lot of people going for multi-talented here, interestingly enough. Yeah, we need so. re-replay to be in here to one guy these yeah, days. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was going to say, Alex, what do you think about just like forcing players to stand on multi-talented? <laughs> So it's going to be Component Anvils, our first one. Pretty solid start here. This one's always nice because it gives you those anvils, which will allow you some agency. And so I imagine this is the kind of thing where we're going to see a lot of those Ginsu's Shoujin slams we saw before that allow you to play really well with something like the Senna in the early game. The one that's even been better on this patch has been the uh, Shoujin red buff because it's a little bit more flexible yeah. than the Ginsu. We were talking about this a lot on the desk yesterday where the Ginsu, you really want to hit nine with it. It's a lot worse on eight, whereas at nine, you know, you get the Sona and yeah. that works a lot better. But also in the early game, the Senna that you talked about, the Ginsu is a little bit better. But when we hit that mid game point, the three cost, the four cost, a lot of times red buff fits into just so many different units that it feels like the best slam and trying to get two bows, pretty tough, but with component anvils, it gets a lot more possible. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting to see the Kennen here. Kennen is one that generally had been, last patch especially, perceived as a very powerful carry. Especially with that true damage, it means you don't have to play like the Yasuo or something like that. So to see this one get past here, kind of shows how the meta has adapted since the previous patch here. Now gets a Jinx this time, and I can't imagine, we have not seen much Punk this tournament at all. So I can't imagine this one gets taken. I feel like Punk is one of those compositions where it gets you a really nice early game, but how do you pivot out of it in order to actually make that late game finish? Especially now when you have to get a top two, capping Punk is very difficult. You must have to rely on that emblem and getting that top two with Punk is gonna be really tricky. Pretty much like I only even consider Punk on ladder when I'm like, hmm, my spot doesn't feel that good to, to play, you know, to cap out. So maybe I'll just play for like a fourth with Punk, like a third or a fourth and that feels kind of like the ceiling of this this trade, at least for right now. Sometimes you can kind of push it over the edge if you hit fast enough and you can push those levels. But yeah, definitely, uh, I think it's a trade that people will just stay away from. All right, going into Gold Augment here. Five people have already made their choice very quickly. This is also with the component anvils. You've got to make it relatively quick, so you've got time to deal with your items here. So we're going to get a look at the augments taken here. Solus getting that Scrappy Inventions. That's a really good one. Gives you a ton of item value early. Um, other than that, we see the Gambler's Blade from Gitung. That's, uh, that's going to be a good one. We see the Thieves' Gloves from Chaos. That's another one where we've seen that have some success. I think Precipent picking this is smart. You can tempo even harder with items early and slam and have a lot of early strength on your board. Yeah, I agree. Having having this many items with the anvils, you're going to be able to make a lot of combinations. And look at this, by the way. That is a Senna 2 with Ginsu's <laughs> and Gambler's How? Blade. What? Woo! We talked about high rolls before the tournament started. This is definitely a good spot to be in. Hilariously enough, he goes up against Precipent, who only has two units in. That's actually kind of bad for him. That's less time to generate auto attacks to possibly get extra gold from the Gambler's Blade. So it's almost best case scenario for Precedent here. Yeah, it's actually so interesting that Precedent went for this, right? Because he takes the buried treasures, yeah. generally a tempo augment. We just talked about how good it would be to slam all these items. But if you saw the units, he couldn't find anything that looked really powerful. It felt like it might be a Lost Streak anyway. And so Precedent decides, I'm just going to go for Lost Streak. I'm gonna make 10 here. He's actually, it looks like the only person who made 10 at the start uh, of the game. And so he's gonna be able to try and build up an Econ lead from there and maybe go Fast 9 and then itemize everything because he's just got all these extra items. I love what Solus is going for here as well. You can see that you got the like quirky headliner. What a nice way to be able to get that two big shot into your board right away. And also felt like the tech from yesterday in order to actually get to level 9. <laughs> 
Yeah, Corky's been really stable. I mean, this is a really strong board. Scrappy <laughs> Inventions, he's already hit the set with that Bruiser health early. He's in a really good spot. The, the two belts, especially with Scrappy Inventions, oh, yeah. you get a Sunfire, as we see here, or you get a Warmog. Those are items that aren't necessarily as good in the late game, but early game, you're going to have a lot of time for that burn to do damage. The Warmog's just going to mean more effective health to get through here. So this is a pretty good start. Does go up against a red buff, though. Again, we're talking about the power of that red buff. And Kennen, who I was talking about here, and so... I don't think that Corky's going to be able to win this. So despite all of that extra power... Oh? Wait, the Bloodthirster plus the Ginza? Oh, yeah, he gets yeah. there. Wow. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. Bloodthirster actually being a massive pickup in this spot. That was a massive difference. The shield made yeah. such a big difference it, here. It's actually interesting because I wonder if it was a different sword item, if it just did enough damage that you didn't need it. But the Bloodthirster <laughs> worked out and it still got the win there by, you know, the shield coming in clutch. Yeah. So this is another interesting play, by the way. You play the two bards here. You play a strong front line, generate enough time. And occasionally you get lucky because Bard has a 1% chance to generate a tip where he'll get an extra gold. And so you never know. This uh, That one extra gold, what did the player say again? 20 equals 30 equals 40. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that can make a difference. He's also a great Shoujin's holder. Like if you can get that plus extra gold here and there, like that's really strong tempoing. And the big thing with the Cassante buff and now he does so much damage, being able to heal him up yep. is huge. And that is a oh. second TG yep. wow. for Chaos with that. Is that Sleight of Hand? I can't remember which one yeah, this, this plus. Sleight of Hand, sleight of hand yeah. yep. I, did want, I was going to call it the Thieves Gloves as well. It has two at two, three. That's crazy. Uh, but we did see a tip drop. We did get one gold out of that. <laughs> so there we go. If he wins the game, it was because of that one gold right there. Absolutely. That all that's how the it difference. works. Sometimes all you need is one, <laughs> and yep. it could really get you there. But it's really interesting to see how many of these players really are investing into some of those more economy starts to these games, just to know where they have to go and the power level of the lobby that they're playing in. Yeah, completely to add on to that, Precedent going for that loss streak, and then he actually has a Yone already alongside the Heart Steel with the Cassante, and he does not have a headliner. So he's looking for that Heart Steel to play. I usually don't like like aggressively digging for it while Lost Streaking on stage two though, because I like saving a lot of HP and then Lost Streaking stage three or stage four with the Heart Seal instead. Yeah. Looking at the lobby and the items, Chaos is one that really stands out to me. Already has the two Thief gloves here and has the red buff and has the super fan for like, <laughs> look at this Senna with a front line of two Thieves gloves. This is so much power. Yeah, Senna is one of my favorite red buff holders. I think she holds it so well throughout the game and just gets that damage, especially on the headliner version. You're pretty much red buffing the entire front line. Yeah, it's it's absolutely ridiculous to see that board. And hey, Gangly was saying it yesterday. Chaos was ramping up and he's going one, 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 one today. He sure he's did. Hyping up SCA a lot. And Chaos, you know, <laughs> is a player who's been around since the beginning of TFT, playing a lot with the North American players back in the day. And very excited to see him here. So the big thing right now is look at the gold totals, right? A lot of people are still at that like eight and nine, getting ready to maybe hit ten. We've got two, you know, Jitung at twenty here, but Precedent at thirty. Yeah. Precedent definitely going for the highest econ. He's going to be our lost streaker in the lobby. And I think, you know, if you look historically at the games we've watched, at least on the main stage, lost streaking hasn't been the way to get like the first place. There haven't been a ton of major comebacks. Um, so it will be interesting to see if Precedent can convert this, but overall that can be a difficult threat. It is, especially when you look at sometimes not being able to make a strong enough board that you take as little loss as possible. And I think that's where a lot of players really have struggled with that type of strategy. And he's definitely not. He's at 72, and Wet Jungler is also on a four loss streak at 84, and that 12 health is a pretty big delta. Yeah, and like you said, even if you do, like, let's say everything goes perfectly, right? You, you get all your gold, you economic, you get a strong board. It always feels like there's just like one bad matchup that you're just like you didn't quite position for. And being at that low of health can make such a massive difference here. And so we see Precedent here basically not really playing a board here, is going to be able to get his five loss streak, but is going to take that full damage. At least goes up against a level four player. He does in Wet Jungler's loss streak, which is big for him. Yep, that's going to be big, so. Yeah. That was the big thing with Preston is it was, you know, contested loss streak. And I think he probably recognized that pretty early because initially he was just like, okay, sell the whole board to, you know, make 10, make 20, make 30. But from there, there was a little room for him to play slightly stronger boards and recognizing another loss streaker. He's like, okay, well, it's open for it for the uh, stage two to just ensure that I get all this econ. So we talked about the loss streak, but on the win streak side, Chaos with that amazing yeah. board we were already hyping up was able to beat Solus. So two streaks getting snapped pretty quickly here. That being said, Phoenix did lose his first round and then is on a four game win streak. So at least get a little bit of extra gold here. Not that full streak, but overall, not too bad. And so again, Chaos looking like the favorite, at least 
coming into Krugs here. Krugs has been a little weaker. Now, we did hear yesterday that four people lost to Krugs yesterday. <laughs> so hopefully we don't see a fifth here. Wait, was that confirmed that it was Krugs that was the PvE round? I, I saw at least one person reply, yeah, it was me. <laughs> My board with like Annie 2 and Kennen 1 was not enough to beat Krugs. Oh, so, no. Um, you know, but... Hopefully we don't see that here. I know Preston had a pretty weak board, but I think he knows the beat Krugs here. So. He also just had <laughs> enough gold, like above 50, to just, just put whatever put in. units yeah. on the board yeah. because Zekon was so good, right? Yeah. Like those are the spots when you're doing the open fort loss streak where it's like, okay, well, I just have so much gold now. Sometimes you even like level and play another yep. thing because you're just that far ahead. Yep. We see Chaos go to level six. That makes sense. Again, with the board and how far ahead it feels like he is on the tempo. I can't imagine anybody else really threatens him. We do see a level six here from Phoenix. He does have that uh, quirky, but again, I still feel like you compare Chaos's board to this, even what we saw before the PVE round, if he goes up against that matchup. Oh, here we go. Is. We see the matchup here. We see it's an Echo one, it's a Kennen one, but still has that Senna with three amazing items. And yeah, just I mean, tearing through the front line. Front line's gone. Front line is almost gone completely. And so, yeah, I mean, not only was it not close, it was a 4-0 ends the streak here, so Chaos is going to be able to, to move forward here. And again, with this format where you really need these first places, this is the kind of start you want. Now, that being said, we saw Zaza, for example, yesterday many times be in this situation and then go fifth or sixth. So really, it's about how can you convert that to that late game column. Well, we saw Chaos on the mainstream yesterday, and something that was really impressive to me was how well they were able to navigate through just such a strong board to have enough HP preservation in the late game to secure that like top three, top two. So that really could be just a big difference maker for him for this lobby. Yeah, his play style was just that consistency. You know, we talked about Dish Soap earlier playing around that. Chaos kind of plays a little bit similar. He, he did roll more aggressively on like six and seven than we saw a lot of other players doing, which is why he stabilizes quite a bit. Okay, so this is kind of a big deal. If you look at these augments that were chosen, <laughs> three players took Tiny Titans. That means the pace of the lobby just got ground to a halt, right? That is 90 extra player health across the lobby here. And so what's going to happen now is if we, if we thought we were fast nine before, it is now a fast nine lobby. You are not going to be able to out-tempo anybody in here. He's got Solus at 126 health now. Chaos is in fourth despite never losing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. And so now, I think at this point, if you press the reroll button, you are playing the game wall. I agree, yeah. This is really going to come back to pressure than a lot of around that lost streak. Now that is even starker, that health difference. So we'll have to keep a close eye on him and see how he pivots throughout the mid game. The big thing with that is Preston also just did have a massive econ lead. And because everyone's kind of grinding to a halt, as Mort said, he may have an easier time finding a stable board to work with while still having an econ advantage and make it towards nine. Now his HP is still going to be lower, but we might see him start to have a massive win streak once we get to stage four, because he improves his board a bit with the extra econ, the fast eight, and then everyone else is kind of catching up to him and he's just hitting people hard. The other thing to watch out for here is players like Solus, Wet Jungler, who have this like very high health total. This is where Heart Steel can be the amazing play, right? If you can get in five Heart Steel right about now, even if you lose every single round, drop down to 60 health, you're now up like five, six components. You're up a bunch of gold. Because usually, as long as you've got that five heart steal in, you're going to get some of those big rewards. And we look at what Jungler and his headliner is Cassante. I'm going to guess that he's kept a, a heart steal Cassante. We'll see if we get a chance to actually confirm that. But it looks like he does even have three heart steal in. So yeah. it has to be a headliner. Um, and so that's massive, right? He's on that 100 HP, just as you highlighted, and he's going to be trying to build up those components. We've seen Wet Jungler do this yesterday. He was having a lot of success playing around Heart Seal. Yeah, on the other side, you get to see Solus, and he's still getting so much value out of that Scrappy Invention. Just three belts in the front line gives you so many good options, so he's going to be really tough to fight through Stage 4. Yeah, that's why that augment is so fun, right? It's like yep. you can just spread out the components, get five full items of value early, and then when you're finally ready to make a board, it's like, okay, now I can combine these items. And you don't have that disadvantage of selling things. We do see a spatula, but Precedent not able to get it here. Little frustrating, loses the 50-50 on what side it's on. That's always a frustrating situation when you're in eighth place and you just can't quite get it here. So. I'm, I'm actually interested on your take on this more because I see the item slams from Precedent. And to me, this is just like, okay, I'm playing Ari. Like there's actually not that many other units that want to use exactly these kind of items, right? I like Nasher's blue buff Giant Slayer. That's kind of actually like really, really solid Ari items. Uh, maybe 
you can put, you know, the blue buff Giant Slayer on like a Jin later on in the game and actually play that fast nine, but it seems like Ari is heavily the thing that Precedent wants to hit. Yeah, I would agree. This definitely feels like I'm looking for that Ari. Blue buff in particular is a slam I think that is very unpopular right now. Uh, you know, like I said, there's Ari is really the best user. Other than that, it feels like a slightly worse Shoujin. So to have to slam that this early, and it kind of feels like, why are we slamming these items if we're already on this loss streak? But right now, if you look at the health, he's at 40, right? There's a 32 health gap between him and seventh place here. So he needs to preserve some health. He's using it on this Twisted Fate, which is fine for now. It will probably win him a few rounds, but this is definitely not the situation you want to find yourself in on game one. The angle he really wanted chain. He really, really wanted to be able to slam a set fast heart, and he did not find it in that those options. So he still grabs the tank item with belt, but now he's just floating this glove. Oh, that's and uh... I will say the one thing that he has kept going for him. If you look through the rest of the items, they look a lot of AD flex, and he thinks he's the only one going straight AP. So he may have some open lines throughout the mid game to save him. Yeah, right now on a nine loss streak though, and I think we saw there were a few players yesterday that were able to go a 13 loss streak and then go eight. So yeah. hopefully that's not what we're seeing here, but nine loss streak, 35 health. This is the kind of thing to be very scared of. Uh, on this board here, we do have, it looks like the heart seal, but has not been able to find the set, the set or the Aphelios. Aphelios being very popular paired with that Senna. And this is what I was saying, like you kind of need five heart steel to really make it worth it. Three is a little bit of extra econ, but almost not usually worth the health trade-off. We've got the Mort special here with three Sentinel. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's not quite three Bruiser, but yeah. it is three Sentinel. Um, it's always it's always funny when you're playing the game and people like to be like, hey, you don't have an exact <laughs> breakpoint here. What's going on? How have you messed up your comp? Oh, it's, it's I feel, it feels so bad because you look at that and it's just like it's an uneven number. Like you're not you're right in between both tiers. Like why? it's it's so awful. <laughs> okay, and I'm, I'm gonna keep calling it out because it is the main focus right now. But precedent ten loss streak, chaos ten win streak. So wow. we have two very stark experiences going on here. Getting a look at these two boards, chaos right now on that ten win streak. Solus on a five win streak though basically has only lost that round to Chaos. So these are our top two players in the lobby right now. Soul is playing around that Corky with three items. We're seeing that Shoujin and Chaos again with those Seize Gloves and that Senna. It actually, it really is the power of Scrappy Inventions. This has heavily been used as a win streak. Dogman, of course, as, as you talked about, you get those belts in the front line, suddenly you just got so much more item economy over everyone else. But it's also just the power of Corky. We have seen this time and time again, players mm -hmm. playing it all throughout stage four. We even saw people playing it in stage five and having that combined with the Scrappy Inventions, I think has been massive. I also uh, think I just saw an early level seven Yorick for oh, Chaos. Ari. Oh, that's what wow. he wants. That's what he wants. Ooh. He wanted KDA, but Spell. you'll take Spellweaver. <laughs> <laughs> He's at 28 health on a yeah. 10 loss. Yeah, you'll take it. Finds an Ari, and you're like, oh, no, you're but it's the wrong but one. It's, it's I better keep one. rolling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta you roll that down. Roll that down. Uh huh. Uh -huh. You, might, you might find the other one. Yeah, yeah maybe we'll hit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you are right, though, that, like, Spellweaver generally not considered the exciting one. The gap between three and five Spellweaver doesn't usually feel like a big enough buff to invest in some of the, the units that you're not really looking forward to, whereas compared to KDA, you get all that extra health that could really make a difference. But again, now we are still seeing an RE2 with very good items on power one. This is where she'll be good. Finally snaps the Lost Streak. That's great. But we also know RE does not cap very well. So the question is now, how do you get from here to a much larger cap? Yeah, I'm actually curious. Uh, I haven't seen RE3 since the uh, the kind of change to allow her to hit multiple targets. Uh, I was a victim of going sixth with uh, RE3 uh, twice, actually. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's my fault on the second one for actually rolling for that unit again. But uh, I'm curious if that's actually a way to cap out. Have you seen it kind of take down uh, other cap boards? Yeah, I mean, the, the change where she shoots the two orbs now definitely has increased her output, Ooh. so that's really good here. We do see the five heart steal from Jitong, who still has 83 health to work with here. So this is what I was talking about. This is a great spot to be in. Even if he loses the next four rounds, that's actually almost best case scenario. That'll probably drop him down to about 40 health. He'll get that seven loss streak. 
and then get some really big rewards, right? Like that's the kind of stuff where you might even see stuff like a tactician's crown. We're getting a look at this 8-bit board here with the Caitlyn. Very good items on this Caitlyn. These are amazing Caitlyn items. I also just want to point out that Solus found a Yorick on 8, and I don't think he's been rolling heavily at all as we still see the Corky deck. Yeah, so he hit that naturally. Yep. He hit naturally <laughs> and on 7. Yep, on 7. The big oh, you thing. saw it on 7? We right. saw it on 7 <laughs> earlier, so definitely one of those like, okay, I'll take a Yorick, all good. Unfortunately, we see the Caitlyn board lose here. Press event, despite the Ari, is going to lose this fight. Wow, part Ooh. three. You can see it in Press event's face. He's just a little stressed out now. It's like, I got my carry, I got my blue buff, and I'm still losing. That is not where you want to be right now. It really feels like RE2 with these items sh should just win Street Stage 4. I mean, he even has a pretty decent front line, but running into that bar to three that had been rerolled the headliner bar, and I don't know how long it's been stacking up, but it, it seemed to be strong enough at least at this point. Th this is a lobby where, again, look at these health totals, right? Solus and Chaos right now, both win streaking. Time to time to make the, the tweet to Mort about how the, the matchmaking isn't working here. But the fact that these two have not fought each other in a while, the second they do, that's going to really see who's got the stronger board and who's going to make a difference. We do get another precedent matchup here, but he has to go through this Blitzcrank. Watch how many casts it takes. Okay, we are seeing the Solus Chaos matchup. Solus is eight, Chaos is seven. You know, we see that Senna versus that Corky. Neither of them have really rolled the gold invested. We see the Karthus not really doing much with an Infinity Edge, but just the value from this augment and the fact that he is level eight. It's going to be really close here. Senna, this next Senna could wipe it. Oh, the Karthus oh. almost burst though. It looks yeah. like Chaos is running. She's, he's going for Senna 3 here. He took uh, the Duplicators and he's got two more on his bench. So I'm not oh. sure if he'll cap out high enough with that Senna. That's an interesting choice because, like you said, Senna in particular is one of. It feels like one of the few reroll costs that can cap out well, but you need a lot to go right. You need, like, a true damage emblem or something like that to really escalate you into, like, a first place comp to really cap it. You probably wouldn't need to find Kiana pretty quickly after you level yeah, up as well Kiana's to kind of like, link yep. the true damage and then still help the board cap out higher by giving those extra items, and I think that's a really great way to make it work, because Senna's damage still is pretty good late game. It just especially, yeah, especially if Kiana's giving those tank items, that really puts together a board for you. The other interesting one I'm going to call out here looking at this is, and I'm not a fan of this character personally, but the three-star Bard. We have a three-star Bard yeah. here, and again, in a format where you need to be getting like top twos, top threes, I feel like investing in Bard is not the play. Feels rough, especially with the changes to Jazz. Like you're just not capping out those Jazz boards nearly as highly as what you would have been There's able the to before three. that patch. But that's a nice hit. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. He hits the center three, which is great. Like I said, we're in a good spot now. But look at the econ. We are still a pretty low right now. We've got to recover that. Has plenty of health to work with. He also has a Sona and a York on his bench, so <laughs> he's high rolled at seven for sure. Yeah, also the pair of Akali's I think is pretty big as well because we were talking about playing around true damage. And if you can find that extra item economy, right, true damage uh, Akali is a really, really powerful unit on this patch. Yeah, I always feel like Senna, this is where Senna starts to struggle a little bit though, because every time she like shoots her ult and only hits one target, that can really cost you the fight here. And sure enough, despite spiking with the Senna 3, is going to lose this fight. And that's not what you want to see, right? Every time you hit a three-star, that should be a spike in power because every round after that, your opponents could be getting stronger. Big cash out from my jungler. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. Hey, build a front line. <laughs> that's six Ezreals. It sure that's is. I wonder if he'll go for it because a lot of people play around this unit in stage four, so I'm not sure if there's a lot out of the pool right now. Uh, there's five left, actually. There we go. We've got it on the screen. <laughs> I mean, the big fact here is, like, again, if we talk about trying to get a first place, right, having six Ezreals, what that can often do is it makes it really hard for anybody else to three-star or two-star an Ezreal. So they might go, okay, I just, I'm not even going to consider it, which will then mean all of the rest stay in the pool, and that gives you that out. And we talk about ways to cap a board. Three-star four costs are one of those really high caps, right? And Ezreal in particular can just delete backlines when he reaches that cap. So there's definitely an out here. Pressament, by the way, down to 12 health. We switch over to this Ari. Ari's going to be able to win this fight, being able to output the damage. Although that front line should be okay here, though. It's going to get the win. And snaps Snola Solus' win streak, actually. So good there for Pressament to stay alive, but 12 health as we go into the PvE round. Yeah, so no one's on a win streak at Ooh. all anymore. Uh, That's a we're radiant have to item. See what's going to happen there, but that is a really great hard so, steel cash out here. G Tongue's actually been doing really well with those items. Yeah, it's a it's Titans. Do you ever just 
reforge that? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think okay. the Radiant Titans is pretty good. You could even play it on Kiana. That's an okay that's, spot. That's the fact that he has the Kiana is pretty good. But the other thing to call out here is look at his, you know, we talk about good spots here. He has 52 gold still, right? This is, I'm going to hit level nine on five, two with plenty to work with. And this is what we're talking about with the pacing, right? If this becomes a Kiana two very quickly, we'll have to see where he puts the items. Okay, goes nine now. We're gonna even some Zed rolling. offered and he skipped it because he wants the five costs. Yep, we're seeing the roll here, but now we're starting to get to that point where you need to hit now. We're out of gold, right? This is where it can be a little dangerous to go this early. We don't have a headliner in right you now. You can rent Zed and you actually have three Zeds already. And if Ezreal's being rerolled as well, odds of maybe hitting a Zed three is, is a good potential. Another great unit of that Radiant item. This is what we talked about earlier. You really have to play for your outs here and go for that really sharp win. And a Zed three will get you there. Yeah, it's interesting to see it not get taken here. Precedent has the Ari, has moved the items a little bit. We end up with a... Did we switch Ari? I think we might have. Hard to tell. But those items got moved somehow. So seeing the Ari try to crank out the damage goes up against the Senna 3. But look at this front line. This is, again, the weakness of Ari. She just ends up being a little too slow in the stage 5. And I think we're this going to be after Precedent. Yep. yep. Yeah, Precedent's wow. going to go out in 8th place. And again, we've talked about this tournament structure. Going eighth in game one is going to put you in a really tough position. You've got to overperform hard the next two games. Well, if there's a player that can do it, I feel like it is Prestivin. Prestivin's been yep. one of those top NA players that has really run the circuit for a while. So I feel like he will be able to kind of come back here. But we're going to get a chance to take a look at Solus's board and what he's trying to make of this level nine. I mean, that's a great shot. Th this is the second player we've seen this now, right? Where they go nine, five, one, five, two, with about 30, 40 gold, give or take. They don't hit a five class headliner, but they don't take much of anything else. And they end up with this, frankly, I think, weaker board, right? Like they're downgrading their boards quite a bit. So he ends up taking the Poppy here, which gives him four Mosher. So that's actually a pretty strong front line, but he doesn't really have items for her, which is tough for Poppy. Yeah, and he didn't even want the uh, Karthus upgrade. He actually had a Karthus upgrade available that would have made this board pretty strong with the front line that you're talking about with the Poppy. He just didn't have the gold to make that all happen. And I know he wanted to swap items to this Sona, which I guess with the front line being that strong, attacking Sona with double Ginsu Shogun is just massive, and this board is still going to be a nightmare for everyone else. Even yeah. without that attack speed affecting the ghouls anymore, it still is oh, very yeah. strong. Yeah. That three-star bard is still putting in so much work. Yeah, I think it's hard to evaluate because it looks like that was a ghost fight against the other three-star bard, so we'll see here. We do see another RE player here, though, so it's interesting to see now we've seen two Aries, but clearly the big difference here is that's an Ari with an Akali in the front, right? Being able to do a lot of extra work here. That's also another headliner Ari. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of Ari. Alex, is it because you're here? Yeah, it is because I'm here. This is my, uh, <laughs> my special take. I'll say that Alawi's doing a lot of work on this KDA board as well. That's a great uh, champ to have on this board. Yeah, Alawi always buys you extra time, extra units you have to get through. So we get a look at this board here. We see a Sona 2 here. Does the Sona 2 have, okay, the Sona 2 has Ginsu, so that's gonna help quite a bit. But we're still seeing no headliner, right? This is another board that is trying to adjust, trying to make that level nine change with no headliner right now. And looking at the health totals right now, Soul is still over 100, by the way. That tiny Titan, Ooh, is this gonna be health. it? Yeah, it might be. Yep. First player to go nine, yep. never finds the headliner, bleeds out. I mean, there was the opportunity to try and play around the Z. There's opportunity to try and play around some of these four costs. Didn't take it and ends up going seven. Yeah, and this is where, you know, someone like Setsuko, for example, on ladder has shown that he's really good at knowing how much gold you need, what are the outs. But I think a lot of players right now are kind of going, I need to play fast nine, but I'm not as comfortable with it. And it's showing, right? They're not really seeing, or they're trying to play that 10% five cost headliner lottery. And when that doesn't hit, they're not really sure what to do. Looks like the Jazz Emblem got denied from the Bard player. Oh, it's that is a smart move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, anyone can kind of slot it in relatively For easily sure. on these level nine boards, because now, what, you just play a Lucian and you get to play your Jazz Emblem. Now you just splash two Jazz and it's pretty strong. Yeah, and even if you hit the Headliner Jin, you still throw in the MF and then you get three Jazz. Exactly, there you go. Really yeah. strong. All right, Wet Jungler's board here. He has those crash test dummies. Those are also really great for providing extra frontline, buying time for this Ezreal to ramp up. Still has the six Ezreals. Here we get a look at the, uh, the so this is already four Jazz, actually. We have a Jazz emblem on the Bard player. So if there is gonna be a Bard that works, it is this. But again, what are our carries here? We've got a Ziggs one with a Thieves Glove, which is not bad. It's gonna provide that shred, that Dazzler effect. Dazzler, two Dazzler, I think is secretly one of just like the best traits in the game. 
especially with the Ziggs, everyone is now doing 15% less damage. That is a big swing in power, right? If we nerfed something in the patch notes 15%, people would lose their minds. That's how, but that's what Dazzler's doing to the board. He's really got to put together a front line, though. He only has a Nico one and an Echo one, and that's going to bite him very soon. Yeah, it still seems to be enough for Chaos. It doesn't quite uh, end up... He doesn't quite end up losing, but the, the front line just, like, can survive Senna, but is it going to survive, like, I don't know, if we end up with the Ziggs 2 or, like, some other big backline Or that Mosher carry? board, I don't know if Yeah, the Mosher board, that. no, yeah. oh, no way. I, I gotta say, if the Bard ends up top 2-ing, that's just amazingly well played, because, like I said, I'm not a big fan of Bard here, but the fact you hit it early, you committed to it, you got that 4 Jazz, and you built around them, that's very impressive play. But, again, everyone has kind of been doing these awkward transitions, so I feel like some of that is just you're winning these fights against people who have been transitioning. Will it be enough to beat them once they stabilize it, right? Solus, again, Solus still at 102 health, by the way. I think it's still good to identify that spot where you can see all the other players are struggling a little bit and are able to kind of take advantage of that a little bit and have that three-star bard, but we're now getting a chance to look at how Phoenix is going to be doing in this matchup. They are on last life, and while well, the Alawi is doing their best in the front line, this Parthus in the back is just doing so much to help shred that. Yeah, Phoenix running face first into this Solus board. The fact that he's actually able to find the win is huge, and it's really Solus just having these one-star backliners, but I I'm really impressed with the way Solus built this board. It's actually relatively cheap. I know we're late in the game, so it's not, you know, an actual cheap board, but um, by being able to play around these Moshers and then just the Sona making them all do a bunch of damage, it's, it's actually working really, really well. And as you said, he was over 100 HP still at this point in the game. And in terms uh, of capping out, win I was gonna say, in terms of capping out, he also has a Golden Nico on his bench. So if he like, starts seeing a four cost or a five cost un uncontested, he's in a great spot. So Wet Jungler, by the way, just hit level nine, sold the Ezreal, found a Lucian. So we're seeing a Lucian headliner, definitely a big pickup for him was able to get there a little later, had more gold to roll down. Uh, and so that's gonna be a pretty high cap. We've seen Lucian, interestingly enough, be a, a champion that some people really don't believe in, but others are like, no, no, I, I can don't. make this really work. I don't yeah. believe in it. I, I'm a non-believer, and I also <laughs> think that the Ginsu Lucian is uh, pretty tough. Uh, I don't I don't think that the attack speed is, is very good. I think you just want like heavy attack damage, and that's kind of where he can work out okay. And usually the, the big thing is he needs to go to like second or third cast to actually feel good, where he gets the you know shred on the first cast and then continues to, to shred down that front line. And sometimes he just ends up being too slow. So, but this front line is very good from Wet Jungler, so I could see see Lucian working out. I will say the utility of Lucian and Ziggs here, if he can hit that Jin 2, he'll be in a great spot to, to shred through some pretty beefy front lines. Yeah, the other thing that's worth calling out is he did get the rapid fire version of Jin or uh, Lucian, which is always nice because that means your team is getting that 10% attack speed. You don't have to run what people usually do, which is like the Caitlyn or the Aphelios. So in a way, Lucian just being on that board as is, that's 10% extra attack speed. And then Oh, this Akali. Yeah. I think this Akali has it. this. It's yep. going to be really close. Oh, oh, can it? Can no it? way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Phoenix is hanging on by a hair there. That was very, very close. I mean, okay. that Akali's been so nice. So Wet Jungler, we are just talking about the Lucian, does lose on a four-game loss streak here despite hitting that Lucian and despite having everything in a good spot here. Might be going sixth place, right? We're at three health here. We just lost our last fight. It's a Kiana one, Jin one. Ziggs won, uh, Alawi won, Yorick won. Finally hit the Ziggs 2, but I don't think Ziggs 2 is enough to really swing it. Do you yeah. ever remove any of those items from Lucian and put them on the Ziggs here? I don't think so. Because the Lucian is still very powerful. It does get against the Bard here. And the big thing to watch is that first Bard where he throws out all those extra dudes, getting extra damage here. And the Lucian full casting in is able to hit the back line a little bit but we're still not quite through the front line. Jin is ramped up, does have the blue buff, which is at least nice here. The Bard's on the loose though. Can we get a big ult on the Bard? Jin, oh, does take it down here. Oh, Lucian's just missing. Lucian's just missing. Lucian, oh. Oh. This, Lucian. This, Lucian, this is why I don't believe in this unit, but also <laughs> this was a not selling your bench div. The, yeah. the Jin would have won the fight if he sold his bench and yes. he doesn't do it, ends up losing the fight and it drops him down to sixth place. Yeah, Phoenix, a little lucky here, does get the fifth on the tie break there, so at least saves an extra point. But again, with this format, you know, you're really not even happy about a fifth or anything like that. You really need as many points as you can get. So we do have our top four here. Chaos has been able to stabilize with that Senna. 
Uh, Coco, on the other hand, has been our win streaker now in a five round win streak. So, yeah, big on to, level eight. Big to point out Solus, 56 gold, level nine. He's lost, you know, half his life from the last time we were talking about it, but he's going 10. Yeah, I was going to call that out. I was going to say, like, we have to be really careful if he chooses to use his gold at nine or go to 10, because I've seen a lot of players here go to 10 and then realize, oh, I don't really want anything to put in. Um, and they should have rolled that gold at nine, especially to take advantage of that golden duplicator that he has. So this might be the end of our Bard here. The Senna just out putting too much damage. Bard's trying his best to keep the front line alive, but that Senna true damage rips through it here. It's gonna be, oh, oh that was really actually pretty close. close. Yeah. Not gonna kill, Ooh. so thankfully still alive here. Coco though now on a six round win streak. So clearly the strongest board right now. We're getting a look at those full champions and things like that. And yeah, Coco playing around this Twisted Fate and this Ezreal, like you said, more like a level eight board than a level nine board. And so the fact that that's, you know, what's wind streaking here, are people gonna start going, hey, is Fast Nine not the play? Well, it's got the Dazzler tech that you were talking about yeah. too, because you do have the Nami as well as the Twisted Fate. And so that's really nice. You don't have to invest your items into trying to get that shred instead. Um, and you don't need the Ziggs either. <laughs> yeah, we, again, so we look at Solus's board, has some strong champions there. We got this bard here that's trying their best so hard, has stacked so many dudes. Can never hit that MF3. That's that's a lot of damage he's missing out on. Yeah, the MF3 would have been nice. You look at that jazz board though, and yes, the jazz trait is nerfed, but look how many traits are active. So that is a lot of power still on that four jazz. It's doing its best. We go into what could be the final fight here, up against Solus here, who does have that cane. Not great cane items on the Thieves Love roll at least, to maybe give a chance here. We're gonna see the Karth Assault come out here. Ziggs doing his best to apply that burn. Kane's already down. So now it's gonna be all about that Sona damage. Can that Sona damage do enough work? Thresh locks the Bard into place and that Sona has now fully ramped up here. Can the Bard kill everything one by one? It's gonna to struggle to get through this Mordekaiser. Yeah, the Declaw. Declaw's a bit too much, but he's still tanky. This Bard actually is trying to get through. Oh, Doesn't yeah, quite get there. He's doing some work. Uh, it's going to be a fourth place for our Bard player, which again, honestly, top four for a Bard comp. We take those. Not bad. We take yeah. those. You know, and so that's okay. Um, Coco does get the win streak snapped. So right now we have Chaos with that Senna. We've got Coco with the Dazzler comp, the Dazzler Disco comp, and then we've got Solus with that full legend. Yeah, this is the uh, the Twisted Fate Ezreal tech. This is actually something that was pretty popularized by uh, ISU Michael. He was playing this a ton, uh, actually climbed a ton of LP, just like grinding this comp over and over again. And I think a lot of players picked this up when he tweeted about it and were like, oh yeah, that seems very strong. Just play two strong four cost carries. Ezreal's really good. They combine together where uh, TF hits the entire board, drops it low, and then Ezreal sends that true shot barrage through. I think Cradle we saw this comp with a lot of Ziggs. Um, I love the Ezreal tech that people have started playing with. Is this a, is this a ghost? I do believe this is a ghost. It's got the Senna though. The, again, the, the Sona in the background just doing so much value here. Those double Ginsu's are stacked up. It's gonna apply that attack speed. Thankfully does win the fight, stays alive here. Ezreal's able to keep away. So it's gonna win the ghost fight here, stays alive. We see Solus lose now, and now it's Chaos on the win streak going to be able to go in. So we're going into the dragon round, figure out what last item you can get, which carry you need. Solus does go 10. 10, has 35 gold to roll, is starting to roll it down here, finds an Alawi. But the question is, what is the play here that really makes him that much stronger, right? Throws in that Alawi. But how do you get stronger when you're looking at Solus's board? And it's not going to be an Alawi, right? You've got plenty of front lines. You need some backline damage. And one of the interesting things is there aren't a lot of like frontline, you know, legendaries at this point that you're really looking for that's going to change things. And so this can be one of the problems with the legendary suit. Throwing in something like Arcane 1 is not going to make the difference. I was actually wondering if this was a board where Jin was kind of the best out because you do yeah. have the Giant Slayer and the uh, Shoujin on the bench and Jin kind of allowing the bench to be fully open. His front line is amazing. Maybe that's kind of actually the best thing for Solus, but we see the Kiana instead as the pickup. I find that so interesting because usually when you see the, like, the Kiana headliner, it's like you really kind of want to have that early, but I feel like just the damage output still may be enough to help top off this board. We see the items get slammed here. That is a Kiana, by the way. Headliner Kiana gets the Thieves Gloves. Very good Thieves Gloves. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. Woo. That's uh, one way to do it. Yeah. Has the Ziggs one here with a lot of items. And so the big thing to watch here, watch the Kiana, watch the Sona, right? The longer they live, Kiana's doing good, but Kiana's starting to take a lot of damage here, does end up dying, but is going to be able to swarm this board down, I can. Does? Yeah, I believe that was the ghost board as well, and so yeah, Coco gets knocked down. out here. 
And so now it's Chaos versus Solus, kind of our two win streakers, again, showing the power of that early game board. We talked about this before. Fast nine is one thing. Fast nine with enough health to play it comfortably is a completely different one. And so now Solus here playing with the power of that scrappy inventions, just getting so much item value, has the Kiana, has the Sona, has the Alawi. You know, now at this point, just something like a Ziggs 2 would make a massive difference, and that might be enough. I love the secondary carries the Senna board has. He's got the Kali, he's got the Kiana, he's got Ari um, with a pretty solid front line. So he is trying his best to cap out this board as best he can. All right, this might be the final fight if Chaos can continue to board and dominate with this Sona or Senna. We've got the, like you said, Senna, Ari, there's so many threats on this comp. The Sona gets the first cast here, so this is where the team's going to start outputting a ton of damage. The front line is gone it's on Solus' side, though. Just too much damage from all those threats. Oh, but Kiana Ooh. got the back line, but now it's kind of just like it's the Sona left the Sona Ziggs. Ziggs. Yep. It's just a Sona match, though. The Ziggs alive, that makes a difference. Ooh. Very, very close fight, though. That could still go either way. I think the Senna is actually really impressing with how much damage it is actually outputting. They count that Alawi with three items. I mean, the Archangels definitely helps here, because like, the, if the fights go longer and longer, that is just going to ramp up, and those ults are going to get bigger and bigger. The big thing is the Ooh, positioning here. Look how the tentacles are positioned along with this Alawi. Senna, in particular, does that AoE damage. You kind of need to spread out. And so when your front line is this many melee units, it puts you in a position where that Senna ult can really just output a ton of damage. Does find the Ziggs too, though. That's a massive upgrade. Throws in two Jazz here. I like this. Throws in two Jazz just to make the existing board stronger as we head into, again, another fight here. It is 7-3, by the way. We talked about the pace of the game with those three tiny titans. We're on 7-3. Unless this is like a one-unit loss, this is probably the last round. That front line, again, Solus' front line just evaporates thanks to that RE. Senna getting some big pulse here, but we saw it with that Sona gets casting. This here comes the big damage. Threshold. And yep, now wow. this went much stronger the other way. That's going to do it. And Solus taking a big yep. victory here. Tiny Titan into a first. Big smile on his face. That is a happy player. First place in a tough format. A tough format and a tough lobby. Did you see how stacked that player lobby was? I don't even think we touched on that enough. Just how much star power we had in this lobby. Yeah, I mean, it's big, right? Wet Jungler, second place of the World Championship. Solus has been a top player since set one. Chaos, another player from set one that's been around quite some time. Coco was a big top player from Emiya that kind of, you know, took a break. Restavins in the lobby still. I mean, it's incredibly stacked across the board. And, you know, we saw some very unique compositions finding good placements. The Bard and the Senna, two cost rerolls. They do a little better when you hold hands and roll them at the same time. But usually these aren't the performances we expect out of those comps. Uh, at least not on this batch. Yeah, I mean, Senna in particular feels like one of the reroll comps that can really at least stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of those legendary cap comps. Senna feels like a little bit of the outlier of the early game power right now. Definitely something that you can get works well. But that, it was interesting, that choice to re-roll it, right? Like, we saw Chaos on that big, big win streak, and he could have kept pushing here, but instead chooses to re-roll it here. So we're looking into some of the highlights, and, you know, we talk about the Corky, right? The Corky being another strong champion that just does so well, but goes up against that Senna. And again, Chaos, 100 health here with that Senna, but choosing to re-roll it here. Solus, on the other hand, another player playing that power of the Corky, playing that really well. Yeah, Chaos, I think, what, went on like a 14 game win streak or something ridiculous. And then we saw all the Tiny Tights picks ended up being in fourth place in the lobby because of all the extra health that ended up getting invested into the game. But it was just really impressive to watch both Chaos and Solus navigate these higher power positions, but so differently. I will say too, this lobby also shows like the stark reality of if you do go that lost streak comp, you never know what augments are coming. And then all of a sudden you're in a tiny Titans lobby and you're in a really, really rough spot. So we'll see if that changes anyone's mindset going in if they want to go more tempo and play that win streak style. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you have everyone going for this fast nine, some people are going to miss. And if you slow down and you play reroll or you play around level eight, you're going to eat those boards alive of the fast niners who can't find the board that they're trying to put together. And we've seen that on the previous patch, trying to play consistently on the ladder. And now, you know, with it being a little bit stronger on eight, maybe some of these rerolls being able to push uh, above, punch above their weight class, maybe you can actually find some really great placements. Yeah, we look at the board here, and I think the other key decision is that one of the things we have not seen much of this tournament, level 10. Yeah. Right? The fact that Solus was like, look, I have this tiny titan. I've got plenty of health to work with. The correct play here is not to stabilize. It's sack. 40, 50, 60, like he sacked a lot of health yeah. to go to 10. 
and that gave him better five cost odds that allowed him to more safely hit the two star zigs he had that kiana headliner he had the sona and that capped the board to a point where the Senna just couldn't keep up. And we saw that final fight. That final fight in particular, that was not a close fight. Solis stomped to get that eight point. The win. stark difference of Ziggs 1 and Ziggs 2. I mean, that was, that was the big thing in that fight. I was going to say the, the Jazz Tech as well was really smart. He knew he had a strong board. And he was like, I just need a little bit more to really push me over the end. And that's going to give me that first. I, I like this graph a lot, by the way, because if you look, a lot of the players in their positions, there's a little bit of swapping. But overall, the people who are at the top kind of stayed at the top. The people who are at the bottom kind of stayed at the bottom. And again, that's kind of showing the importance of that tempo. I think the one exception is we see that line that kind of goes from about fifth, ends up in about third. So not a bad spot for Coco there, I believe. But overall, it shows that we're not seeing like big swings one way or the other. It's tempo, save that health and play well. So now that we've had one game with this lobby, we are sticking with it for another game here. And what are kind of some of those learning moments that these players can take from one another that you feel like may influence this next game, if any? Ooh, that's a tough one. I think the big thing here is, you know, I think if, if I had one takeaway from that lobby, it's looking at someone like Coco who played that level eight comp rather than nine and seeing how some of those fast nine players went nine. Uh, who was it that went nine first? Oh, it was a... Uh... Wasn't it Jitong? Yeah. Jitong, yes. and then Jitong, he never hit Jitong a headliner. First. Yeah, and then couldn't find a headliner. Ended up with a bunch of a weaker board with a bunch of one stars. I think that's the cautionary tale from this lobby, is if you're going to go nine, you'd better be damn ready. You have the gold and the stability to do it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna echo that because it definitely feels like it is... This lobby felt a little low roll on the nine. A lot of the, the level niners were not quite hitting uh, as we've seen other people do so. But that is the danger and that stabilization is so important. We even said before this game that we thought maybe that the style that Dish Soap was playing, you know, stabilizing on eight before you ever go to nine uh, might work better. And I think that's what Lococo was even kind of doing was like stabilize on eight and just never found the, the room to, to go further. And was like, okay, well, I could still stabilize out to a third. I also think it's important, like when you are going that center reroll, that you're paying attention to the lobby. Like he took that duplicator augment, and that it helped him keep tempo. Yeah. And I think if he didn't keep tempo, he would have been a he wouldn't yeah, have gotten that second place. A lot to take away from this first game, but even more action ahead. We're gonna take a short break, and when we come back, we'll have game number two of day two of the TFT Vegas Open.
everybody who just paid the people snuck up in the trunk. I'm from Brazil. I live in the northeast of the country. The home, my hometown is Recife, pretty warm city. I love the love there. Um, started playing TFT because I just loved League of Legends. Played since uh, season three, I guess. And when TFT came, I started playing uh, in the beginning of the set one, and it was it was like never stop. I just got addicted, addicted to the game, start, started watching a lot of, uh, a lot of streamers, and I, I just love the game. It, it's, it's like, it, it turned out to be my work, but I never thought I would be uh, doing that for a living, but it's, it's just great. So great to hear from our players, as well as being able to get some of our special guests here onto the couch. Just wanna give another thank you to Alex, who is the gameplay product lead for TFT. So great to be able to have him here to share his insight on the game and just join in on the fun. Yeah, Alex is one of those faces that you don't see a ton of. That you know, obviously the TFT team is really big. We work, you know, a lot of people. But Alex is actually one of the people I work the closest with. Oftentimes, if we're talking about whether or not we're going to do a B patch or something like that, Alex is making those helpful decisions. So Alex, a big part of the TFT team, and it's so awesome for him to get to come up here and be a part of this. And to show off the rest of the TFT team as well, because yeah. I know that you've been a face of it for a very long time, but there is a huge team yeah. of people that are working on this game and making it as good as it is. And there's a lot of fantastic players that are also behind it as well that's really pushing the growth. And I'm excited to welcome one of them here today. You've got a silver fuse on the desk with us. I almost said welcome back to Legends of Runeterra, because uh, <laughs> we do have three Legends of Runeterra casters on this couch right now, which you are one of. So how are you? Yeah, I mean, it's great be up here with you all again and it kind of feels reminiscent of last year but now we're here for Vegas land and TFT and the oh it's just so great being here uh everyone is just so excited to be here and it's just so hype and I just can't believe it's real yeah and you are competing here too yeah, so tell us a little bit about your run and how you enjoyed your competition oh um I I was oh well, it went really well at the start. <laughs> <laughs> started strong. Yeah, started start strong. strong. Start strong. Yeah, I started strong with the second. I was like, okay, it's doable. Because if you go eight, then it's like, oh, this is doomed. <laughs> and then went to a six, so I was kind of on the bubble. And then I got a first, and I was really hyped. And I was just, I wasn't expecting to make it to day two, or to round two. And I didn't expect to make day two either, which I did it. My next lobby was really hard, didn't go well. But, uh, uh, now I get to be here, and this is pretty cool. So. <laughs> this is pretty cool. <laughs> did, did you have fun at least? Getting oh, to... I had so much fun. I, it was so cool just being next to the person that you're competing with too. Right. Like making names with faces, and it's just, oh, oh, that's what you look like. I've seen you on ladder maybe 50 games now, but I have no <laughs> idea what you look like. I love that. We all get a chance to put like names to faces. I'm a very bad person when it comes to names, so I may need to ask a few times to, to some of those people, but it's still very cool to be able to say, wait, I know you. That's me. Yeah, that's Max. That's Max. <laughs> yeah, we know you. And, and Christine. Yeah, we know <laughs> you. Hey, we know them. No, but it's been big because especially, you know, in North America, a lot of times we don't have cams on the top performing, uh, you know, the, the, the top <laughs> tournaments. And because of that, you know, I didn't know what a lot of these players look like that I had been casting for years and years and being able to meet them here and kind of, you know, exactly put the face to the name has been really nice. Yeah, actually, one of my study partners, I had never seen him before. So he was like, oh, let's meet up here. And I was like, I don't know what you look like I could walk right past you and have no idea who you are like you need to, you need to help me like stand by Kaisa or something I mean we heard this from the lab yesterday as well right they were like we came together like we've been talking a bunch but we came together because of this event and we get this opportunity to all be you know here in person and, and get to be a good group and so they're like can we do this again when's the next one because like yeah, I want to be able to meet again you know and like this is fun so I think for a lot of people that's the opportunity right it's again that common interest of, of a game that TFT come together, talk about it, nerd out about it, and stuff like that. And so, 
get to look at some of these other standings here. X the Farmer X, that's another example of a player who's yep. been around for a long time and having a breakout performance here. And I want to call out Yunwil if he actually won uh, an LCQ, I, I believe his last set, and tried to, you know, make it through regionals as a player. He keeps kind of popping up and having like a random, very good performance. And then generally over time, he doesn't get a ton, but you can see Goo Bombs and Soju. And this, this is a scary lobby. This Flancy, lobby. Soju, Goo Bombs. Man, the fact that Flancy fell in seventh, though, that's crazy. Yeah, that's a, that's a really Ooh. wild to see. But even here, you look at like uh -huh. Milk kiting his hard, also going six and seven. But Zaza going first, right? We saw True. him struggle a bit. He did really well here. And Asa, Asa, Asa the player, been coaching a lot of people, been teaching the set a lot. And I think that's paying off. He's doing really well here. On the bottom side, though, Dish Soap, I think, not having that game he needed. And again, we only have four games. You need to be in top 25%. So that seventh place is a little rough. That cutoff is definitely going to be very scary. Obviously, when you look at this right now, if you go 7th, 8th, you're not out of it quite yet, but you do need to be able to put up those first places over and over again. And I think something else we didn't get a chance to see is that Sia Nerds actually got another first place. Ooh, this wow. was one of the players that had like the top of the average placement when we looked at the games yesterday, playing six games, put that one, 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 one <laughs> lag. lag. Uh, and, and now, obviously, the lag is gone, and definitely like yeah, back, back in peak form. <laughs> back in it, another for farming for us out here. That's crazy. I, I was like, okay, you, you had a really hot run on the first day. We'll see what happens. But the fact that he claims another first in the first round, insane. All right, so we get our view of the portal here. Three, two, one, and we are off to game two of day two here. Taking a look at what portals they're interested in. It's the unit accelerator. No one's going to pick that one. We have the Golden Prelude, and my eyesight's not that good on the last one, but... No one wants it either. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but nobody, nobody likes it. <laughs> Golden Prelude, the one I could read. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone's kind of generally happy with this one. It's just like, okay, Golden Augment, we're down. Yep. Uh, makes it really, really easy, really simple. A lot of players really enjoy those in general. The, the full gold, I think, is one of the most popular ones among pro players. So do you have a favorite gold augment you're looking for at 2-1 that you're just like, oh, I can't believe I got this. This is great. I like all the gold augments, so I don't really have a favorite unless okay. unless it's to make items and I have a hard steel opener. Then I'm pretty excited about making items for gold. That makes sense. Yeah, there's some gold ones, like some of the trait ones can be a little scary to take, but you know, if you can get something like, I'm a big fan of Cluttered Mind. That's one of my yeah. favorite ones to like try to level up here. We haven't seen a lot of cluttered mind here today again we see a lot of people picking those sort of safe generic combat power ones things like harm assist the items buried treasure stuff like that i think people have missed it a lot actually because cluttered mind i think is very popular among players who like to play for that fast nine and i think a lot of those players just either haven't seen it or haven't had a spot where they feel really comfortable going in that direction clear mind's another one i think it's a lot worse than cluttered mind personally right now it's harder to build the good boards but yeah i've seen those a lot of the econ augments to try and go fast nine yeah, and playing in the lobbies, I did see a lot of people taking those combat, but I did see a cluttered mine in mine actually. But they got in a really awkward spot and almost went eighth, they were able to pull out a fourth. But if you can't go nine with cluttered mind, it feels terrible. And right now it's such a high tempo in these lobbies, especially later in these in the in the rounds. It's it's more scary, but when you're playing for first and second, maybe we'll see more players taking that instead, instead of the top four where we can go really safe and just take combat augments. Agree. Solus here finds the Senna, finds the Aphelios. Two heart steel, not three. But we do have a five item start here. Has a Ginsu's, can get even more items from these gold augments here. So we'll get a look. I see a, that's Jazz Baby, which has clearly fallen out of favor since last patch where it was this insanely powerful augment. Things like shock treatment, harm assist we talked about. Um, six players have made their choice already. So what are you saying? Preston's got the, a very awkward selection, right? Crown Guarded, Shock Treatment, and then the, that's Jazz. It, it, nothing really stands out to me. It's like, oh, I really want that. Maybe if I have another Crown Guard already in my items, I'd go for Crown Guarded. Chaos getting that sleight of hand again. Um, wow, Solus, by the way, finds a set <laughs> in his shop here. So a big high roll for Solus here coming off that first place, being able to get three Heart Steel in early. Now, again, we talk about three Heart Steel, not necessarily going to like decide the game early, but if you can convert that into a five Heart Steel later, that's going to give you a massive advantage. Ends up being crown guarded for press event. I do, uh, you know, calling back to, to Solus, we talked about wanting to win streak stage two with Heart Steel. I think the set and then having a Senna with Ginsu, that might actually allow him to do that. but. Preston really wanting to look for a win streak as well as we see him stacking up this Evelyn. This is an insane early headliner with the item selection that he's got with the crown guard with crown guarded. He's got the Nasher's tooth alongside this uh, uh, 
Hodge to help get the healing, and Nash's Tooth works especially well around Evelyn's uh, steroid that she gets when she casts. So a question for you, because Nasher's Tooth is one of those items that slamming that early kind of locks you into a few different positions. Where do you find Nasher's Tooth to be useful for you? Yeah, I generally end up going uh, when I have Annie sometimes. Evelyn, I usually go into that Ari line because it was such a safe top four yesterday. And then later, maybe you go Ziggs, but I did get a Ziggs too yesterday, and I, I won a couple rounds, and then I started losing really hard, and I had to sell them. So it feels a lot worse than it used to with the Ziggs being nerfed, but Ari does feel really good, and then after that, I've been throwing it on Sona sometimes. It's not the best, but you know, a little bit of Gwensu, a little bit of Nashers, and if you get her to cast the first time, then it actually does something. Yeah, Ari was where my head went as well, and we saw him build it last game as well, press event building that Nashers. But I think that's the thing that worries me, is we saw him actually kind of high roll that Ari that he was looking for last game and still ended up going 8th place. So to invest in that line again right off of that 8th place is a very interesting decision that we'll have to see if it pays off. I think it's great in the early game, though. He's got that Evelyn. It's taking great advantage of it now, but it does mean you're stuck with that item. And after coming off an 8th, can you be stuck with suboptimal items that may not get you that first place? It's actually a very good point because, you know, we see the Nashers that screams Ari to me as well, and the Hodge is a pretty good item to be able to use slam onto an Akali. So that was the missing piece of his composition in the previous game. He never actually landed on that Akali. He didn't get to go, you know, 5 KDA in a very comfortable manner. And so maybe, you know, with the Crown Guarded being a good way to get a lot of HP on your frontliner, this is still the comp he wants to play, but it feels incredibly narrow, and I don't like that on this patch. I, I think something else that's really difficult too is I think Spellweaver is a very like awkward interval trait where you're really looking at something like seven to feel like it's actually being super powerful or like, I don't know, just five feels a little awkward. Yeah, it just doesn't quite do enough, especially with how strong the late game boards are. just can't get through everything. She does a good job of getting through a couple units and she can work really well. But then as soon as that stage five or so or six hits, she starts falling off really hard, and then not having another Nash or Soul is really rough. I think one of the worst Ari experiences is when you're ult, you take two ults, you kill a tentacle, you take two ults, you kill another tentacle, and then uh, one has come back, so you take another two ults to kill another <laughs> tentacle, and you're like, what am I doing with this champion? Why am I here? So, a little scary here. We're gonna get a view of the board here. I wanna see, okay, there's no three star. I thought I almost saw a three star earlier, but Coco has that Yone already, as well as the Yasuo, so playing that Edge Lords, that's pretty interesting. Solus has that hard steel we saw earlier. Wet jungle as well. Anything standing out to you? Yeah, I mean, really, it is the big thing is multiple players having hard steel in. I think that's, uh, you know, what we have to watch out for is who can actually push it to five. Who's got the headliners that can actually push it to five hard steel in stage three, especially if any of them have been able to preserve a lot of HP <laughs> stage two, so where if they lose streak stage three, they're still in a pretty stable spot. Now, I know this is a little bit of like defending my own work here, but I think we're seeing a lot of heart steel here, and a lot of people might be like, oh, is heart steel OP? And I don't know that it's necessarily heart steel is OP, but this format, right? This format yeah. where oh, you course. need those really high finishes, you have to take some of those big risks to try to get that extra advantage, and heart steel is great at that. Yesterday, in one of my final games deciding who would move on, we had four players take heart steel. One of them wanted it so bad, they took heart throbs. <laughs> they actually took heart throws. Uh, they ended up going seventh, but they still made it through because uh, the person who needed to go first that took the heart steal actually went second. But everyone in the lobby was competing with Fire Steel. Yeah, inter interesting. interestingly, we saw DK take Heartthrobs on a on-stream game. He had actually good success with that, using it in the mid-game to actually, you know, snowball a lot of items in economy. So yeah. it is it is actually a pretty viable take. Huh. By the way, we just saw a Yone 2 here. Coco had the Yone 2, so pretty powerful at this point in the game. Could be a line if you want to go that Yone 3. We've seen Yone 3 be okay. Uh, you know, it feels like a solid A comp, A tier comp, working cap out really strongly. Soul is doing well. So getting a look at the board, by the way, precedent right now on that win streak, doing very well. He's on that four round streak. No one on a full loss streak, though, it looks like. Feels like everybody's been snapping each other. So we saw there that the Heart Steel player actually got a win. So it doesn't feel like the best when you have that trait. But we've talked about that a little bit that Heart Steel doesn't necessarily need to lend itself into a loss streak in order to actually find that value. 
Yeah, and I, I want to call out Precedent once again slamming Ionic Spark, and I, I, I see that, you know, of course, this is the RE line that we like to see that in, but we have not seen many players taking this line, at least not so frequently. It seems like Precedent wants to be in this line. It's not that he's stumbling into it. Yeah, that's a... It's almost a little concerning, because don't get me wrong, the line can definitely work, but we've also seen that the players who kind of like force lines right now are the ones that tend to end up struggling when the headliners don't go their way, right? When they're level 8 and all they see is Ezreal's and Caitlyn's, what do they do? They kind of struggle here. And Pressman really needs this win here. Unfortunately, it's going to be really close here. Evelyn trying yeah. to do her best to heal. Going to get the crowd diver. Oh, this is unfortunate. Pressman really needed this win. It would have put him at 530. Oh, play. the Katarina? I, good, no, it's so close. Oh, yeah. close. Heartbreaking for precedent here. Isn't going to be able to reach Econ. Not going to keep that streak. And so no one ends up streaking here. We do see a little bit of a heart steal cash out here. Eight gold. That's going to swing the game. It's over. <laughs> it's all done. <laughs> it's over. Phoenix got it first. Eight gold. Let's go. Well, he did find Senna with a Ginsu if he wants it. So that's that's pretty solid for the mid game. Uh, to try and turn things around, but he is playing around hard steel, so he kind of wants to lose stage three. He could try and win as much in stage three, and then potentially lose a little in stage four if he's got enough HP. But he already kind of lost you all through stage two. Yep. All right. Looking at some of these augments here, by the way, um, you know we've got that inspiring Epta that's going to be extra combat power. We've got the ability to level up fast here, so some good augments there. Three players took stationary support as well. Stationary support is very powerful augment, especially we talked about yesterday, right? If you high roll that needlessly big gem, that's a ton of power in stage two. I'm guessing no one got that though. We probably would have covered that yet. But overall here we have a Thieves Gloves, some good Yasuo items. I doubt that, we do have six Yasuo. Are we gonna see a Yasuo? I don't believe it. Edgelords? Yeah, what? this feels like maybe holding items for <laughs> Ribbon? So yeah, it definitely wants to swap. Okay, so this is actually the way a lot of um, People who have spanned the most Edgelords like to play around it. They like to play things like Runons, i.e. they like to play as much damage as possible. And then you tech in Pentakill, and the idea is late game, you get the five kills from Pentacle as fast as possible, and it snowballs the fight super hard with the attack speed boost onto your Edgelords. And that's kind of the game plan with slamming a bunch of just high damage items. So this does look like wanting to play around Edgelords. It can be Riven, it can be Zed. I know he's not an Edgelord, but it can be Zed. It can be... Uh, uh, Viego and it can be Yone and any of them can kind of take similar items and they can all play in that same style All right going into our augment choice. We've got another gold augment here. So pretty standard game gold gold so far uh, And again so far we've seen a lot of bias towards those like generic combat powers Things like that sleight of hand. I do see a blank slate there. Not <laughs> blank slate on three two. Blank, not a <laughs> lot of people taking blank slate on three two But we left it in to see if anyone could cook something pretty crazy with it. So uh, I do see a tome. Is that a tome, by the way, in the top right? We've yeah, got an emblem like choice a... here. Oh, he's picking. Oh. So definitely have to see what emblem that ends up being. Looking at the augment choices again, like Chaos has those healing orbs, pretty generic power. Wet Jungler, you have my sword, Precedent, healing orbs, things like that. So again, overall pretty generic power. Uh, Coco, I think, has that stationary support. So that's another stationary support out there. Solus with the cybernetic bulk. That's been another one that I think has been kind of underappreciated. That extra health value really good. And so did we see it? Was that an executioner? Yeah, it was. And it looks like committing towards the country line of the uh, Samira. Uh, not having the headliner yet, but a lot of the early units that you would want to see with it. And I like executioner emblem with this, but it does feel like it relies on which headliner you get. You really want, I, I would assume, country. Well, no, executioner, you wouldn't have to put another one in. You just play Samira Vex and then you have the emblem. You're at four. That might kind of be the best angle for it, is you want the Executioner version of Samira. you can put Poppy in to play with Urgot if you want to. And then you also get the emo. Yep, it'll give you the emo and the washer. Yeah, Executioner, definitely not one of those emblems right now that's going to, like, massively swing the fight. You know, I think if you're looking for an emblem that's going to swing things, Superfan and Country have been the two that have been like, oh, okay, this is a lot of extra power. But who knows, maybe you can cook something crazy with like a six executioner board. We haven't seen a ton of that, but that is a lot of power at that spike. So maybe something like that. Solus right now still playing off these heart steals, has the, you know, the even shroud on this Cassante, so generally looking okay. One of the big things is the synergy. You were talking about bulk and how it's underappreciated sometimes, but in this set, all of the, you know, tank traits play around HP really well. Bruiser scales with the HP, Sentinel gives resist, which is gonna work well with the HP. Guardian gets the shield off the HP. But in this spot specifically, Solus 
getting that Randuin's and then giving his units a bunch of HP around it is working very, very well in harmony between those augments to make an incredibly strong board. It's interesting looking at this Yone, by the way. Like, obviously, it's a Yone 2 with some okay items, but I look at those items and, like, you can't stick with that long term. Where do those items end up, right? Is that going to be a Viego? Is that going to be a Zed? Something like that? Do you have any, any thoughts on where you would put those items? What were the items that couldn't be? We, we had a Gunblade, a Red Buff, and a Triforce. Oh, I could see that going on a number of AP carries with the Gunblade and the Red Buff. I mean, for me, I do also think Ari with Gunblade, Red Buff, and then moving out of it later. And I would say Ziggs potentially, but he hasn't felt the greatest. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. The only other one that comes to mind is Kane, because you have one of your two healing items, and then you'll get one later. Mm -hmm. And I think that Red Buff could reasonably work. It's maybe not your favorite thing, but the percent damage scaling is nice. You apply the anti heal, so you'll get through kind of whatever. Sure. Target so if you went like Gunblade, Triforce, BT, Kane, that could be a yeah, game yeah. Play you might keep the sure. Triforce instead of the the Red Buff, and then you move the Red Buff to just something else to apply. It. Yeah, I mean, red buff is such a flexible yeah, item, right? Course. Ziggs especially being an, an amazing user of that red buff, but really just anyone, because attack speed is always good on a unit, right? They're going to be able to cast quicker, totally fine. You're getting that anti-heal, which is always valuable. So that part's pretty flexible, but it's, it's more of the, like, the combination of the three don't usually end up on the same champion usually, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, which it's is weird pretty combo. interesting to see. Wet jungler right now on this big win streak, and precedent, we talked about this, you know, had that four win streak, now on a four loss streak on the way down though, has those items. We'll have to see if he can stabilize that board. He just pushed seven, so I wonder if he's now he wants to try and flip it or if he's you know waiting because he didn't roll. He just leveled at the last second to put something in. And I'm curious, maybe that was fifth heart steal. Maybe he was on three or four and he, he just tried to go to five. So I'm curious of his spot. I imagine he's trying to play around heart steal in stage three, but I don't know if he actually had it. Yeah. We see Solus right now at four heart steal, so it doesn't quite have that five. But again, has that really good economic value. Has a Senna 1, unfortunately. Uh, the Cassandre actually doing a pretty good chunk of work here, but the Akali just deletes the backline. Solus is going to lose this fight. Yeah, pretty good loss on Hearthsteel, though. Three units, they able to pick up quite a few kills. As we mentioned earlier, so much health on that board from that cybernetic bulk, along with the Randium Zoman. So we get oh. a look at Pressman's board. Still playing that Evelyn, has the Super Fan in. Decent Evelyn items overall, but the question is what kind of, you know, what are we going to change it to? Has the 5 KDA, which is okay. But again, as soon as Evelyn gets targeted at this phase, this isn't an Evelyn 3, this is an Evelyn 2. She takes a little bit of damage, she's going to fall over, you've got nothing left. And that's kind of what happened, right? Even on 3-2, he took healing orbs, he was trying to keep that win streak, and then he just lost four rounds instead. So definitely not what Precedent wanted. It wasn't an intentional kind of loss streak there, and that's why we saw him push 7. Yeah, I think too that if he had five streaked out of the first stage, that he would have probably sold that Evelyn and found something better. But since he lost that fifth round, he decided, you know, that's too much money to spend right now, so I'm okay with whatever happens, and then I'm gonna find a better chosen later. Yeah, the Senna going up against this Kaisa board. Kaisa is doing a lot of damage here. How's that Ginsu's that Infinity Edge? Able to win the fight, being level seven, and so Wet Jungler now, our big streaker, and then Chaos on a five loss streak as well. So we're getting to look at Chaos's board here. Still has that Yasuo. So again, if we're going to see that transition to something oh. like the Edge Lords, we're going to need to see it soon. Look, uh, Jitong found a Assassin Spat Kane or on level but yeah. yeah, on level seven. <laughs> on, oh, yeah, the, the, yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it is kind of re reminiscent of the Assassin sure Spat from, from this distance. It kind of looks, it's got, it looks like that. But little yeah, bit. execution of Kane. and something a bit underrated on Kane too is the ability to farm some gold early is worth a lot. Yeah, you farm the gold, you farm the health, but find the duplicator. So now we are in a situation where hypothetically, if you find a cane off the carousel, or you somehow get incredibly lucky, or I press some buttons backstage <laughs> and you find another cane, <laughs> that's gonna be a cane too early. And you know, the jeweled Lotus plus the executioner, that synergy is a little off. But again, we have a healing item, we have a damage item, find another healing item for this cane. That could be a solid three item cane this early. That's a great way to at least swing things in your favor. Oh, I mean, it's it's very potentially game winning because of the fact that cane would start farming a bunch of gold as well. And then you get to push the levels and you can cap out really quickly. So level seven cane, if you can find the two star is absurd. So here's this Viego, right? We see those items finally moved over to the edgelords here. This is a Viego. It's still only three edgelords, it's still a Viego one. 
but at least you're seeing some of this damage here. So we at least, like you said, we know where he's going. We know the direction he wants to hit. The question is, can he hit it now? As we head into 4-2, our final augment choice this is where people start to... And we have a prismatic. All right, so we're looking for eight golden eggs here. I see at least one on the one, screen. But it's chaos. He can't play that. Oh, no. Who doesn't pick golden egg? Come on. He went ahead There's another golden egg. Yes. I see another one. Uh, I wonder if it's clickable for Phoenix. It's probably not. It's probably Freaky Friday instead. Yeah, I wanted to yeah. see one. I'm wondering if there were any boards that, that might have been actually clickable on. Maybe Wet Jungler had a big enough lead where if he saw a golden egg, he could click it. But I, I would have been ecstatic. But yeah. <laughs> but looking at the augment choices, what, we see a lot of the uh, the pretty safe one, the new recruit, right? That's going to give you the duplicator. Oh, oh, the duplicator! No, but I, I don't think it was, uh, was it? It's oh, it's Jitong! Oh my god! So that's Kane okay. 2! That's probably Kane 2, you're right. That is probably Kane 2 I for forgot the game duplicator now! That's amazing. <laughs> so, we'll have to take a look and see if that's what happened. Impressive it was able to find Azari and get that Nash. He got it again? So, wow. if he didn't find it, it would be really awkward. It even has the Akali there, too. So, Impressive was able to find things quickly. And he is low on gold, though, so... He, he also has the two duplicators, though. So, all of a sudden, there's just an influx of duplicators on the board. So, maybe someone found my control panel backstage and we're pressing it. But I this love is pretty wild. Yeah, this is pretty <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and because this board is really stable in this stage, he should be able to save up some money and maybe he can go for a legendaries with this. Yeah, it's a good way for him to cap his board, right? He just he can go to nine with actually pretty minimal gold because he just has to hit one copy of the five cost there to get there. And there's the cane too <laughs> from those duplicators. That is massive. Jitung seeing that prismatic was such a big boon for him in this game. He had a rough game one and so being able to come back, utilize this cane in stage four is absurd. Yeah, we have the cane, um, you know, it, it's still level seven, so a little bit behind the curve. The big stories right now are, look at the lobby, right? We have Wet Jungler on an eight streak, Yaroi on a five streak, and then Solus on the other hand, kind of the opposite of last game, all the way down to 28 health here, kind of struggling. Coco doing a big transition to the Twisted Fate, has amazing items for that Twisted Fate. We talked about the value of the red buff and what that can apply. So slamming those items to the last minute here. Wet Jungler playing around this Ginsu's Ari. Goes up against the Katarina headliner though, the crowd divers. Is it gonna be enough? The Katarina is able to take out the back line. Akali gets locked down. So finally, Wet Jungler losing his streak here. Yeah, and you're right, actually, with the crowd divers, has hit a Kiana very early, and that's the best way to cap out the crowd diver board. He played around a two cost reroll previously. Now he's gone to level eight, so I don't think he's gonna reroll the Katarina, but I wonder if he still sticks with crowd divers for the rest of the game. Yeah, the scary thing here is you look at Jitong's board, we have a Kane 2 and not much else. That's a lot of one-star units to be at this stage in the game. And so that's a little worrying for Jitong. Kind of on a loss streak right now. He's the only player who's not level eight. So a bit of a backfire there. Otherwise, we see the Twisted Fate. We see a Blitzcrank. We see two Aries, things like that. We see the Viego. Chaos was able to hit the Viego too. So that's going to get that Edgelord board going. And now we're getting a look at Solus and Jitong, the two bottom of the lobby right now, as they try to transition and stabilize. Solus especially has finally gotten rid of that heart steal, but what is he going to play around? Executioner Samira offered for Jitung and he passes it. He, he wouldn't be on six Samiras, but he'd have to hit on this roll down because he can't really swap the items and it feels awkward to play two Samiras at this stage of the game. Ends up taking a ribbon. I assume that's an edgelord ribbon to try to at least bolster this cane, but this cane really needs a third item to be able to really take advantage of that fact. So we'll have to see going into this fight here now with Jitung. Yeah. Let's see what this cane can do here. Kind of rough positioning right now. The Kane is just kind of walking around here. It's going to slam a crown oh. guard. That's actually an okay slam here. Loves the AP. It does mean you only have one healing item, but it is a Kane too. And gets taken out by the Ari. Kind of worst case scenario for this fight. The Ari just two shots it. That's why you often sometimes you want something like a second healing item or an edge of night to drop the aggro. And it was slammed mid fight, so you actually you don't you get don't much get value the, the at all You're right. from the crown guard because You're right. all combat start. I, I, even the extra AP after the uh, shield right. breaks, that's a, a combat start mechanic. So all you get are the base stats, which is not very good uh, overall for an item, right? A little AP, a little armor. Yeah, I'm sure once he realized that Ari was there, maybe was hoping for a little bit more survivability, but didn't quite get it there on time. But that's why Ari is so strong in this stage, is any melee carry that walks up to Ari doesn't exist anymore. It's gone, poof, just yep. as we saw. Yeah, I think that's why the value of Edge of Night has gone up so much, right? If you can at least, if Ari gets on that carry, you can drop the aggro once, heal back up, 
make force her to attack one of those frontline units, then maybe you have a shot at taking it down. But without that ignite, as soon as you're targeted, like you said, bye Kane, see you next time. I think G Tongue's in a lot of trouble here. Actually ended up selling oh, no. the chosen, doesn't long, long have path. one. He's like shaking his head right now. And just Ward's getting evaporated right now. Across from your Roy, who is was win streaking just a moment ago. Yeah, he's up to some positioning oh struggles as well. His Goodness. Kane took a very long stroll around the park before coming to the fight, going around the entire front line. This is one of the hardest parts about the set, too. There's a lot of builds right now that force you to kind of have a lot of melee units. And you end up in this situation where you want your front line, but you also want those like edge lords and stuff like that. And it kind of ends up being a situation where the positioning almost feels a little random, right? Where it's like, who walked which way first? And we saw there that fight the Kane had to go the entire long way around because of his ribbon. But you need the ribbon there because if you don't have her and the Kane takes aggro first, then we're back to the RE just deleting it and things like that. And then on top of that, Viego giving that damage buff too. You want him to be in the front line near everyone as well. So there's just so many things you want to fit there and it does make it really hard to position. We actually saw Saint play around this yesterday by opting to just not position his Kiana and instead he pulled back Kiana and a couple other of his frontline you know, softer units and then left the tanks on the front line and then let everything kind of walk forward because then the uh, opponent units will kind of wrap around his front line and then his melees walk up and start hitting instead of running into any kind of issues like this. It doesn't allow you as much control on your positioning, but it makes it so you're still getting value out of all your units consistently throughout the fight. Yeah, and I think that's definitely the way to play it. I think that's a great call. And so now we look at this board here and we have a, a Viego with very good items, although no healing, which is a little scary. We have the Kane, so really the lack of healing items being the main thing. But we're also at four Edgelord, not five. We're at four Pinnacle, not five. So a little bit of an awkward trait breakpoint here. And even if this board is stable, the question is for how long, right? We talk about how being eighth in this position is always scary because it's so hard to turn around. If he can at least win a fight, maybe Kane can farm some player health. But Kane is already dead. Viego's about to die, and unfortunately, this might that's be it. an eighth place. And for G Tongue going seventh, then eighth, that's probably that's the end of the tournament it, yeah. run. Yeah, that, that's so hard to see. Especially when you can see the thought process behind holding the 40 gold, hoping that you might be able to snap your lost streak and then econ forward to maybe roll for something a little bit better. But we're also getting to a stage of the game now where we've got our players starting to look at leveling up to nine. Here we go. We're actually going to see that on Phoenix's board. Yeah, this is usually the 5-2. We'll go to level 9. On the left side, we see Pressman kind of hanging out with his RE, pretty comfortable with his RE. But on the right side, we see a big level down. And again, last game we saw people struggling with this roll down. What do you end up with? So far, we have a 1-star Sona, a 1-star Lucian, and a Country Thresh. And that's what we got. Like, was this really the right time to roll down? Now, we do have six Threshes Ooh. here. So the nice thing about this is now he can sell out of the Thresh Headliner pretty easily later on. He can rent it for this round with the Sona with great items, utilize that front line to buy time. His board's still not very strong, and unfortunately for him, there's a Zed just tearing up his back line. But at least this gives some opportunity to kill off some units, buy a little bit of space, and then Phoenix can try and find a better Headliner than this Thresh now that he's got an additional front line. He's not going to blow up his front line by selling the headline. This is such a wild fight, by the way, that shows the power of Sona. I'm pretty sure Thresh was the top damage. Oh, definitely. Thresh just yeah. autoing like crazy <laughs> with his double Triforce and the Sunfire. Doing his best. Honestly, a one unit loss here for that board. Not the worst. It's the power of the rental unit, right? Because you just slam Triforces on this Thresh. You're like, I I'm selling this anyway, so let's just get it's every little bit of value that we can out of it. All right, we're getting a look at Precedent here, and Precedent did just lose the last round, it looks like. So, has this Ari again? We talked about decent Ari items. Has the Akali. The thing that's scaring me a little bit here is Precedent's down to 20 health, still has these two duplicators. And this is often a trap players run into, right? It's like they try to hold for that maximum value. I feel like you should have used these on the Akali a long time ago to at least stabilize, try to get some points here. Because again, if Precedent has another bad finish, that's probably the end of the tournament run, if you could so. And then on top of that, too, the, he doesn't have that much gold when he does go to nine, likely at five, five. So you are taking a big risk there. So if you hit, he can hit really big with the two dupes. But if he misses, not duplicating that Akali earlier is going to feel terrible because he would be at so much health right now and he would still be able to go nine and roll even more gold. So to push on that a little bit, what's the best thing? Like, let's say you do. We got 30 gold. We've got the two duplicators. What's the best thing we're hitting, right? To really Allowy two, usually. Sure. So an Allowy two, and now you have a little bit better of a front line. But that means you're still carrying, like, an Ari 
And so this is where I feel like that long-term game plan, you've got to think ahead what's going on here. Unfortunately, Solus, by the way, did lose, loses his win streak now on his last life. Crescent as well, last life right now. See if they can come back. There are some emblems here. Hyper Pop, an interesting choice if you've got that Zig, mm. you can do some cool stuff. Super Fan, usually not great right now in this point of the game. There's a red buff, blue buff, and a Sunfire. So a lot of anti-heal. Coco does go with the Hyper Pop emblem. So I think that one can be a great one to cap out a board. Again, if you can find the Zigs and the Lulu, the attack speed, the mana generation ends up being surprisingly high. It's a very interesting emblem too, because it just immediately gives you the trade, even if you have no other, you know, units to link with it. And so if you can find something that casts very frequently uh, that you already have on your board, you can just throw that on and you'll get a lot of mana and attack speed from well, I that. think he has the Twisted Fate in the Ezreal. So those are not too bad to have in your back line that you might want to be able to boost up. Yep. All right, Pressvent goes to nine. We talked about the gold. Finds a Kiana, yeah. is going to duplicate the Kiana, put some items on that. So there's going to be a Kiana two. Has the true damage active, the bling bonus should be fine there. On the right side, Solus playing that Twisted Fate. Doesn't look like that strong a board right now, though. Doesn't have much to support in the back line. We'll have to see how their fights go. Both of them on their last life. Solus at least off that first. If he goes seventh here, it's not the, the worst. It's not great, but could still come back. Precedent, though, needs to win this here. Going, and unfortunately, and going that's going to be it. And so, Precedent now, another player in this lobby that now with a 8th and a 7th, probably going to struggle. Solus, Solus too. unfortunately, is going to get knocked out, but at least he's got points. He's not out yet. Just going to have to bounce back and figure out. The question is, did Solus get a 7th or a 6th? It looks like six. a 6th. That's that massive is great for Solus. for Solus, at least to get an extra point here. And so now with them out of the way, it looks like Coco is our next player at 4 health. And it's interesting because we didn't really see the hearth steel pay off for these players, despite yeah. being a, kind of it makes the lobby a little bit weaker when you have multiple hearth steel players. But they all just didn't quite conserve enough HP. And then, oh man, I wonder how Preston is feeling right now, thinking like, did you know, should I have just Nico that Akali and then gone nine safer and maybe found my legendaries the natural way? It's such a tough call though, and it's one of those things too that once you make the call. You can't, it feels so bad to go Nico the Akali afterwards. Sometimes it's still the correct play, but at that point he was in too deep and there wasn't really another option to really get out, especially when you have to play for the top two. Absolutely, and we got another player close to elimination here. Lakoko had a good first game. It looks like it could be a fifth year, but might even hold on for another fight. The Akali though, trying to go infinite here, has a lot of HP, a lot of healing, one more cast. Gonna take out the Ooh. TF and that is gonna be Lakoko falling here to wet jungler, but Third and then fifth, not a terrible spot to be. So with Jitong and Preston, by the way, I know I said like they're kind of out with those eighths and sevens, but we are seeing a little bit of discrepancy in the lobby. They do have like one tiny hope, which is back to back firsts. You do need something that big to really swing it to even have a chance, but it's a such a minute chance. It's just really tough. Um, right now we're getting a look at Phoenix's board here, who went, you know, fifth last game. Now we have our top four, so looking all right. And then we've got Chaos. Chaos right now looking to kind of be the favorite here. Went second last game, has made another top four here. So definitely one of the stronger players. Played Senna reroll last time. Uh, both times played with that sleight of hand, by the way. Really showing the power of sleight of hand as an augment. Um, but overall, oh, that's a Jin with a Shoujin. Whoa. Jin headliner with Shoujin. I almost wonder, do you put both of the Triforces on this? I was this? thinking, I was thinking about it. Thing. It's interesting because you end up wasting a lot of the tank stats of the Triforce. Like, I almost wonder if you put the Triforces on, like, the Kiana or the Thresh. I think crack the Anvil first and see. That, yeah. That's what uh, I'm really surprised <laughs> that I mean, there wasn't the Anvil first. Because you could have got, like, a Gunblade, which would have yes. made a massive difference. I.E. <laughs> would have been good. Nah. Yeah, at least here he's got Gargoyle. He's got Adaptive. He can put those on the front line. I think, you know, putting something like the, the Adaptive could be good. Instead, it was with the Hodge on the Kiana. Hopefully that'll help the Kiana at least generate a few extra items. Because once the Jin gets ramped up, it's going to do a lot of damage. The thing about Headliner Jin is he also starts with a turret on the bench, which means he gets to that state where those turrets are pumping out damage even quicker. And Chaos, by the way, goes out in fourth place. Right now, Yaroi just dominating this lobby with this board, with this Zed, with this Katarina 2 of all things. Yeah, I kind of like that he kept it at two star instead of rolling down. I've seen people do this a lot, especially when Katarina Headliner was even better before the nerfs, is you would hit it and you didn't have a ton of copies by the time you'd normally want to see maybe five Katarinas before rolling down. 
And instead, it's like, okay, well, I maybe hit a Z1. So let's push levels and try and just cap out the crowd overboard that way. And Roy hit the early Kiana, if we remember. So having the opportunity to go six crowd diver if you wanted to a lot faster by leveling up made a lot of sense. Yeah, I was gonna say, you look at this board that Yaroi has, and I don't think you see a strong board here, right? It looks pretty weak. You've got Katarina 2, Yone 2, Zed 2. But this again, showing the power of that early Kiana, the ability to maybe generate some extra items, some extra threat, things like that. Wet Jungler versus Phoenix here now, battle for second place. The Jin is at that fully capped state with all those violins. It's gonna take down the Ari. Is it enough though? It's gonna take down the Sona. I know the Sona did just buff that target dummy. dummy, but unfortunately it does not fight back. Can't take advantage of that Sona buff and Phoenix is going to win that fight. The Triforces though, uh, like actually kind of coming in clutch there. You could see that the Jin ended up getting jumped on in the back line, still able to maintain its health and keep that preserved to be able to get those turrets off and do that damage. Jin is one of those units that if you don't have the front line to really go with him, then he feels terrible or someone does get on him and assassinate him. But when you get to these spots where you're in a pretty comfortable position, it just feels like Jin's unbeatable. Yeah, I mean, the fact that, especially when Jin has that Shoujin, once he gets to that point where there's about six or seven turrets on the bench, every shot is just like, you're dead, and you're dead, and you're dead. It's very satisfying to watch. Yes, it's so satisfying. And the fact that <laughs> once you do, have, yeah, having it set up and just watching him, just 1v9, essentially, <laughs> a little bit of healing on him usually feels good, too. Even though we don't have that, we were still see He was so... He gets that extra tanky stats from the Triforces, so he wasn't in real danger there. Yeah, and it looks like the Crow Divers are falling off quite a bit at this point. Now the two-star is just not doing enough, right? It needs to be three-star to even be able to play with this. So Yoroi has to now figure out how can he transition this board, or how can he cap it further? Does he need to try and level the 10? Or is there a way to actually kind of sell out of this Crow Diver line and build something better? His board is so cheap too, so it's really hard to be able to replace that number of units. So you kind of have to pick and choose because it's not it, there's not really an option to be like, oh, I'm just gonna sell like five units here, and even though the there's gold. so cheap. Yeah, there's no gold. Yeah. yeah, I mean, really, it feels like the bailout here is possibly Kiana too. So at least you have the Kiana two Z two with the crowd diver. But I think the big thing is you want to sell that headliner, right? You don't want to be stuck with a Katarina headliner at this point in the game. That means you're going to lose your six crowd diver, which is a big boost of power. And that's always the scary thing. Whereas you look at these other boards, we have that Sona 2 with Ginsu's on the left with the Ari, the Akali. Again, we talked about how Precedent, you know, not using the duplicators on the Akali, but we're seeing an Ari Akali board here that has stabilized, has done well, backed up by the Sona. And we've talked about Ari falling off in a lot of these games, but the reason that she's still doing really good here is there are like three, four carries on this board. We have yep. the York with the TG, and we have the Akali with items. So she's able to take care of the front line while the rest of the team's able to take care of the back line. So that's why she's able, and also her items are great too. She's able to support the rest of her team. And we got both of them winning again. Phoenix <laughs> and the jungler staying alive. Yoroi taking hits. And of course, we saw the ghost board for Wet Jungler being able to take that down. But the big thing that Yoroi has done with the way he played this game is pretty much ensure to top two. It seems like this fight RNG has not been good for him, uh, but it still feels like he had enough buffer where this fight, we probably will lose either Wet Jungler or Phoenix. Yeah, it feels like this is the one they're due to fight each other. We'll have to see. But when they do, who's going to come out on top? Looking at these boards, I feel like, especially, okay, big thing here is the Edge of Night on the Yorick. That's going to buy some time against this Ari. That might help. The Thresh Alt could also help give Jin that time to ramp up. The other thing that's interesting here, and maybe I'm seeing it wrong, but I want to be sure, that's a healing zone. We always talk oh, about how, it is. which is good. I actually like this choice a lot. This is one of those things where, again, everyone kind of defaults to the attack speed Sona, but when you're playing Jin, you can't take advantage of that. So I like the healing here to generate yeah. more time for the shield. That is a great choice. It blocks the Karth Assault here, and this is using Sona to her full potential. I like this play a lot, wow. and I think he was rewarded for it. Great play from Phoenix. The only thing that matters with Jin is time, right? Yeah. You just need time, and the thing that buys it the best is going to be that healing. We've seen it's a bit weaker nowadays because of the nerfs, but this is an exactly perfect use case, and I'm glad that Phoenix was able to pull that off. Yeah, and I specifically in that fight saw Yorick was able to take some extra hits there, and that was crucial for Jin to get those extra couple ults off. Yeah, and so again, we talked about how Sona's this really interesting, flexible champion where she can do that, and just taking full advantage of that was really nice. So now we have this final fight here, and the big story is we've got this fully capped Jin board that's in a great spot. 
but how does the crowd diver comp adjust here we're level 9 20 gold and we still have that katarina on the board and we're not selling it right it so this is so a six bad. crowd diver board yeah i think if you sell it you're just this since a six buff is so big you're just not going to be strong enough and it feels bad to cap out here but you're still she's getting your in the top of the group so she's done her job you really yep. she's a two star two cost well, i mean what else can you ask from her no i totally agree right like even if this is a second place seven points you're happy with it like you said it's a two class it's great was able to find the kiana too as you pointed out um necro so that's gonna be a big spike up against the sona two now yeah that's the big diff though is like you hit the kiana two but the upgrade that phoenix got was also massive and i mean the kiana items are great but you see Jin gets on her pretty much immediately and this yorick is just an absolute unit over here and the fact that he gets to keep spawning the ghouls gives you even more oh, look at that over shield. and over again the Sona's shield is huge so much. i mean it is just phoenix all the way yeah this looks like a pretty clear win for phoenix i always talk about the sona design and when i was talking with the other designers i was like you know what is this number and it's like look it's basically two seconds of invulnerability that shield is so big that's what it may as well be and we've learned from past sets that like invulnerability on a tank especially is a lot of power and like you said the yorick was just tanking so much extra damage even like this Alawi one just gets an 800 shield on it. It's hard to chew through that and it buys so much time. And then the Jin with these Triforces, you've also got the Dazzler lowering their damage. This is just, this is a very good capped out Jin board. All right, now we get to watch kind of the coronation ceremony for Phoenix in game number two here. See if we got the wrap though from this Kiana, so maybe there's actually yeah. some way that Yoroi can play around this and he actually only needs to win one fight. So still watching that Kiana. Has wrapped, but there the Jin takes her down. Watch the shot. Typical bench. saved it. And there it goes. And from the garage to the grand, Phoenix gonna pick up a win here in game number two. So impressive to watch that play through and through the way that Phoenix navigated that game. And also just to make sure that he's creating such a strong board throughout the entire process. That is some great TFT that we got a chance to witness there. Yeah, again, we talked about this before the show, right? That Jin was a champion that not a lot of people look at and go like, this is a high roll, I'm so excited to get the Jin. But when you get to that cap state, when you've got that front line, when you've got the Shoujin, when you've got the Sona to back it up, it feels, what was the word you used? Almost like helpless? Yeah, unbeatable. Unbeatable, yeah, it's just like, okay, you're dead, you're dead. We saw it, like, you were like, keep an eye on that Kiana. <laughs> Oh, well, she goes gone. <laughs> she's gone. <laughs> Actually, got snapped out of existence. Yeah. yeah. And so Jin just playing his uh, his melody there, knocking everyone out, and getting a first place here. And so now we're you know we're halfway through. There's two more games left, but again, only top two advance. And we talked about the standings, and like we know there were two players basically sitting on like three points, kind of almost out of it. How can, you know, can they do anything else? What's going on? And because those two are near the bottom, it actually makes the rest of it extremely competitive because a lot of the other players are incredibly close in points. It's not like any player specifically has run away with it all, right? Yoroi finding that second there already had five points. That's pretty solid. That's one of the higher placements overall, but nobody's completely, you know, no one's went 1-1, one, one, no one went 1-2. One, yeah, so looking at the highlights here, we saw Preston here earlier winning, but we talked about how he kind of fell off and ended up in seventh place here. We see Wet Jungler playing around with this Kaisa here, getting some key wins, win streaking with that pretty hard going to take him into that top two. I love this little portal, by the way, that we've got going on. <laughs> Solus definitely struggling a bit here. Uh, you know, not quite as dominant as the first game. Had that heart steal, wasn't able to really convert and pay off. Ended up with kind of a weaker disco comp. So struggled a bit here and Solus getting knocked out there. Uh, Coco, we saw play a pretty interesting comp, a better version of the Twisted Fate. But again, Twisted Fate just not quite capping as much and the Akali able to take it down so fast. And unfortunately, a tentacle cannot solo a Kali. She takes it down. That was the end of Coco. And so now we look at this final board, the final fight. And again, it really wasn't close. Look at the size of those Sona shields. Those are massive. That full bench of Jin turrets taking everything out one shot by one shot. And look at that. Happy to win. <laughs> First place. And you can even see here with the rounds, you know, Phoenix actually ended up winning less rounds than Yaroi, but all that matters is that yeah. end game state. And so we finally get a look at our points, by the way, here. 12, 12, 12, 11, 10, 9. So we've got six players really in contention. And unfortunately for Preston and Jitung, that 3, 3. So. 
Yeah, yeah. It makes it very tough for them to climb back up. And yeah, we were talking about six players so incredibly close. This is just two more games to go, and it almost feels like a reset at zero for those six. But there's still a lot more TFT to play. While this is the midpoint, I think Ooh. our players will consistently start to kind of figure it out. But that is a very interesting graph to look out for Phoenix and how their placement went throughout this lobby. Yeah, this is a great graph, right? Last game, we saw that the top two players were kind of dominating. But this time, we saw a player who was able to kind of take that loss streak, get that gold, convert it back up, and then roll with it, right? Stage two loss streak worked really well in his favor. So that was great to see and kind of showing how you can take advantage of that economic advantage, convert to a late game comp, and go from there. I feel like we've seen so much a great TFT on the main stage. I'd love to get a chance to check in and some of the other stations. So I'm really curious to see what those standings are going to look like when we get a chance to preview them later. But we are going to take a short break as we get our lobbies ready to go for this game three. Silverview, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see all of you very shortly.
everyone, Azale here at the TFT Vegas Open with the man, the myth, the legend, Dish Soap. How you been finding the event so far? Uh, man, it's been uh, it's been crazy. Um, just the atmosphere is way different than anything like I've seen from TFT. Um, I got an opportunity to play in the main stage like at the start of the yesterday, and then also in like the main area where like a bunch of people were hanging out. Um, yeah, it, it's just a way different environment, and it's really really fun. I got to cast your first games on the main stage. I saw you did really well there. How did how did the rest of your games go on day one? Uh, they went really, really well. Um, I got kind of distracted. People behind me were just like talking about all my decisions. It was, it was really weird. I could like hear like all everything they were saying, but ended up going four to one. Can't be uh, upset about that. Um, yeah. So advance. I don't know. It, it went well. Nice. So we're in day two now. The competition's ramping up. Seventy-five percent of players already eliminated. A lot of great players already got knocked out on day one. What's your mindset going into day two? You know, it's going to be a higher level of competition, obviously. The lobbies are going to be kind of heating up. Um, it's a really brutal cut. They're cutting 75% of people each lobby, so only two advance. Um, there's one more game to play, so that's like helps a little bit, but it's like, it's crazy brutal. Um, no one should expect to get through. Um, top twoing in, in four games is, is crazy, but I mean, I'm going to play my best. Hopefully, we can make it. All right, well, best of luck. Disguised dish soap. Hope you do well today. Thanks a lot. I'm here on the tunnel of the TFT Vegas Open with the Mix Master herself with Sona. What a great cosplay. How did you actually make this? What was the process? Oh, it was actually like quite a hard process. I was able to choose uh, the cosplay that I was going to bring to the Vegas Open. And out of all the ones that I was being like on, on the list, I was like, I want to do the biggest challenge. So definitely this was like the most complicated. I had about two weeks to make everything. And uh, it was a fun process, actually. So it was quite fun. You definitely pulled it off. I think it's amazing. Why Sona specifically? Do you like the champion herself in League or in TFT? Um, this is my second Sona actually, and she's always meant uh, something very, very dear to me, you know. And I think that out of all of the musical universes that were being mashed together for this event, I felt that she was the most important one because I, I it's it's my favorite actually. Well, I, I also love KDA, but I think that she was the most special, special one. Sorry. Thank you so much, and I hope you're enjoying the event as well. You look so awesome, really. Hey everyone, Azale here at the TFT Vegas Open. We're here with Flo and we're going to do some trivia. So first question, this is kind of like a, just a champion question. Which champion is known as the Widowmaker? Um, I would say Elise. Evelyn, close, close. Okay, we got another one here. This one's a TFT one. It's based on Remix Rumble. Name all of Kane's traits in Remix Rumble. Edgelord, wildcard, and... Um, it's an econ trait. Uh, Earth Steel. Yes, yes, you got all three. Thank you very much, Flo. Right, Hope you enjoy you. the day. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Hello, everyone. I'm here just outside the TFT Vegas Open venue with not just a special guest, I think the most special guest in this venue. Completely swagged out with a hat, with glasses. He has everything. And you do not want to miss it. You have to come over here, take a photo with a pengu, and post it on social media with a hashtag TFT Vegas Open. We'll see the best photos today. Welcome back, everyone, to the Team Fight Tactics of Vegas Open, day number two. We now have had many guests already on the desk, and we're adding one more. Casanova joined by Azale, Gangly, and now Bill, one of the set 10 composers. And I want to talk to you a bit about what it was like to help develop a set that was so heavily focused on the musical element. Yeah, it is definitely one of those things that I, it's one of the coolest things that I've made in, in my career as, as a game composer, for sure. I felt like it was somewhat, I don't know if you ever had one of those phones, like a Sony Ericsson phone back in the day where you could have like these four track music sequencer thing. Yeah. And it's like, it gives me that kind of feeling a little bit making this set where you, you're giving a little bit of this sense of like, um, uh, control to the player where you, you could actually be making music as something that's very awesome, but you're actually just giving them a lot of like sort of these pre-made, really cool, um, it's almost like a cool ingredients that you could play around with. So I think that that's something that I never thought that I would get to make because that was like actually how I got into learning to write music was those like phone apps of pre-made loops and stuff like that. So getting to do this was almost like a cool 
full circle moment for me in some ways. Can we talk about the, I guess, almost problem solving that goes into sure. this? Because it's a really grand project, and I imagine that there's not a lot of frameworks set in place yeah. for making so many different songs that have this through line through them. How much of it was doing a lot of work up front and then figuring out a direction, running with it, versus figuring it out as you go, iterating, and then scrapping it and trying again. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have a, a plan. Uh, it's, it's a big, grand one, actually. And, and I think that the, the plan has been hatching for a long time. One of the first meetings that I um, got to be a part of as soon as I joined Riot was about this, and it was ab about like November of last year. So we started talking oh, about wow. this set Dang. a year before it even came out, and there were even conversations before that. And um, Cole Hicks, our lead composer, I don't know if he's in this building right now or not, but um, he, he sort of drafted a little bit of like um, a sketch for us to follow. So it has a chord progression, has a song form that everyone was going to follow for all these different genres. Um, and there are two songs in total, and each song has like 11 or 13 genres or something like that. Um, so we have a framework, but with game development, it's, it's never a sort of a linear line to finish like film or other type of things with music. It's always going to be this circle of, OK, we make something, and then we test. It doesn't work. Let's come back to the drawing board again, and then we go over again. Like One of the things that we um, were talking about in our panel yesterday uh, about music that we sort of didn't account for was the loudness of each genre that's kind of uneven. And that was like, it, it, was, it seemed like a small problem, but from a gameplay legibility standpoint, that's really hard. You know, when you put your unit on the board and you're not quite sure what you're hearing back. And I think we wanted that to be as clear as possible. So we sometimes even went back to the drawing board and remix something a little bit differently or rebalance something a little bit differently just to make sure that um, it was legible for our game, even though that means maybe not as authentic of a musical execution of that genre, but it should make sense for the game first. One of my favorite things about the set and the music in the set is how you can have these different combinations of music, right? You know, it's not that you just have the one track, it's that hyper pop pops in or, or yeah. maestro track pops in from Jin and kind of elevates it to a new level. How much did you guys really think about how the, the tracks were going to combine and create these new types of music when you were actually making them? Yeah, um, quite a bit. I, I think we had quite a few sessions where we'd sit together as a group of composers in the room. There were like five of us. And we just audition against one another all the time. But the one thing that, that I feel like is, is fortunate and also kind of a thing that amplifies us is that this is TFT. We, we're kind of allowing it to be a little silly. <laughs> There's supposed to be like combinations that are unlikely they're supposed to work together. But in some ways, I feel like it's nice. Like one, the one thing that we had found um, the first PBE day was the country executioner with the big sad one. Yep. Those were the two genres we didn't think it was going to go together. And a lot of people were playing it. And it was pretty fire. Makes sense that a uh, y'all alternative. There wasn't quite a y'all alternative there. Yeah, yeah. It's the closest thing to y'all alternative <laughs> that was uh, in exactly. the set. And with that, I mean, we're going to be jumping into game number three here. And we get to see some of that music in action that we've been seeing throughout the entire sure. time. But I mean, throughout the game, Bill, I love if you can point out some of the really like cool combinations definitely, that you definitely. really enjoy a lot out of these, uh, yeah, all yeah. these different musical tracks. I mean, I, I, I think the ones that I see a lot in this competition is folks that play Disco Dazzler, and you were kind of required to play a little bit of EDM with that as well. So that that was one of my favorites, actually, It's is the Disco EDM combination. Right off the bat, looks like we're going to be hearing some heart steel as Phoenix, one, three, who's already got a pretty steel. strong start in these first two games. It immediately met with a Yone from an orb, and right after that, the heart steel headliner, Cassante. Yeah, that is such a, a nice start to be able to pick that up right off the bat. And we'll see what else he gets. We are playing on the component anvils portal here. So players going to have a couple component anvils to start. Can really accelerate things because it can be a lot easier to get that perfect itemization, especially if you do get a strong one cost headliner, you know, hit that Annie, hit that Corky, something along those lines. You can have that perfect itemization to start it up. Yeah, that's one of the big times that we see a lot of the Shojin red buff slams early yep. because red buff especially is a little bit hard to get just off your basic components. But with the anvils, you just need to find one more bow a lot of the time where you get one off of the creeps and then you can just find one more. And of course, Shojin the same thing. It just makes it easier to kind of curve into that if you find one of the other components. Before we go too far into this game, can I just take a step back and acknowledge that I've been blessed by Mort Dog to not only have Chaos in this lobby once again, but Solus <laughs> as well. 
looking at these first augments, we are going to be hit with the gold first augment. So maybe nothing too crazy. Pretty standard play for a lot of these players. So he's actually considering heartthrobs because yeah. he, he had the three heart steal immediately. I think heartthrobs is almost never worth it, personally. In the, in the times that I've played it, it only it. seems like you get value when you can get to five extremely fast. Because with three, you're just not getting enough stacks, especially in the early game, to really get much value out of it. So, yeah, he's going to roll past that. Oh, oh, gem. My oh my god! <laughs> his heart steal on one three and then hits needlessly big gem on the stationary support? I mean, yeah, hey, that's why you got to read it. He's got four heart steal. Aphelios pair in If he hits a well. set, he has five heart steal. I mean, considering how this game's been going so far, he's hitting this set. Yeah, it's, two, it's, two. it's, it's going up. It. Yeah. <laughs> this actually may be a good time for Bill to talk a little bit about Heart Steel, right? This is one of the newer bands that yes. Riot introduced. Can you talk about the process of introducing this to TFT? Yeah, this is interesting. So I I had to make music for Heart Steel before Heart Steel came out, and it was something that. You know, we had to make two songs based on the one song that never came out still. And, <laughs> and it's like kind of a weird thing to think about, right? Where, where you know, the person that established it is um, Sebastian Ajan, who, you know, has written a lot of hits for Riot, like KDA and all these things. So, and his room is just two doors down from me. So I, I collaborated with him a lot just to be like, hey, this, this, do you even vibe with this kind of thing? And, and a lot of it at first was me trying to follow his footsteps on the sounds. And then at one point, he just sort of told me, just like, honestly, you should just do your thing because the spirit of Heartseal was kind of all about like, sort of like, you know, they're, they're a little like, like, they're just like a group of guys who are a little careless and they just want to jam and vibe. And I think you just sort, sort of have to follow that spirit a little bit. Um, another shout out I want to give is a uh, producer, Kill Dave, who also produced that uh, helped produce the song Paranoia as well. Um, we worked with him on this on both of the songs that were in here, and, and he really helped us take the production to the finish line here. Um, the one thing that I, it's worth pointing out too is that for folks that want to play verticals, and this it's probably le relatively unknown to some people, is that if you get to the prismatic level, the music will not play anything else but the, on, the that trait that you have active. So it would stop all the alternative, al alternating with all these other genres, even though you have like maybe a jazz unit on your board or something. If you get to 10 hard steel, it's just, you're just jamming to hard steel. That's only. interesting. It's That's actually so hard to get prismatic. Yeah, I haven't seen a prismatic yeah, yet, yeah, so I actually didn't know. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a, a yeah. straight flush kind of feeling where yeah. you just sort of like, if you get there, chances are you love hard steel, you want to get there <laughs> and you want to do that, exactly. I yeah, we have, there's a lot of these little little hidden functions that we kind of put in just as kind of a little bit of reward. But um, it's it's interesting to see that that's like not everyone hits that, and I think that's kind of great actually. All right, jumping on board, Solus still on this win streak here alongside Prestivin, still very early in this game. But he's got the Urgot, and Urgot is very very good for this early stage two win streak. And he has the Trickster's Glass, is also pretty good for win streaking in the early game. You just get that extra unit on board. Solus is a player that in North America has existed for so long and has kind of existed in different tiers for quite a while, right? There are periods of time where Solus is dominating tournament. You think back to set six where he really did perform amongst the best, and then other sets where he's not taking it as seriously, even 6.5 for instance. The thing about Solus that I love though is he's the kind of player that finds his own edge, which means in the early set, his creative play can really lead to him finding an edge on the competition. I think that's something that can come into play, especially when there's new patches that are coming out, you know, very, very uh, frequently. And we obviously just had one on Wednesday. A lot of the pros that I've talked to are all talking about how the meta is constantly developing, how they're still not even sure if they have the right read on the meta, because lobby to lobby, the people are playing, you know, very different comps, very different styles. Some are more aggressive, some are more fast nine and more passive. So uh, it's really interesting to see, you know, every time we go forward another stage, it does feel like things are evolving. Yeah, and it's not even the first time that we've seen Solus on land, on a new set, on a new patch. We saw it at Summit and he popped off there as well, right? This is the kind of player who really can thrive in these positions where it's not solved yet because he's willing to try and find the line that he believes is strong. Yeah, Solus is pretty intuitive in general. He's a very intuitive player, and so I think that helps a lot when we do have a new set. I mean, I, of course, he does use stats, but pretty much every pro player uses a lot of stats nowadays, but Solus historically was someone who would uh, create a lot of the compositions that people played, especially thinking back to set one. He was the innovator of so many of the different lines that just Ooh. everyone duplicated. Two streakers running into each other. This, this is actually a really big round to see who's going to be able to take this and keep that streak alive. Yeah, I mean, it's the Corky again. The Corkies are absolutely terrifying. 
They've been carrying through so many of these stages, but the super fan getting the red buff and the IE, I think that's going to be a big difference. In Chaos, who has found most success on the win streak side of things, is streaking in stage two, and that's when he's been most dangerous. You called out the power of the component anvils off the start route, because if you can especially find a flexible backliner like Corky, you can lean into either the red buff Shojin, or as we're seeing in Chaos's board, a full three item, because once you find that super fan package, you have two full completed items on your backline with red buff, which is going to scale really well even into the late game, and, and put yourself in a strong position to streak right off the bat. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, obviously the Corky is stronger than than Senna in this position, but when you're looking at Prestiman's board, that Terek is actually going to be pretty beefy. You have the Disco healing, you have two completed tank oh, items. Oh, that's the fight. And they're actually going to run into each other. So all the streakers running into each other, only one person will be able to keep this five streak alive. And that is going to be so much gold going into Krugs. I mean, the big thing is watching this Terek and how much value the Disco can get. We do have the anti-heal. That's the big thing with the red buff. And because that Horky having everything stacked up, it's the crit from the Infinity Edge and the Death Blade being all that damage on the cast just completely wipes the board. Preston can't even find a break and get a full streak into yeah. uh, into Krugs. Not even close. So only the one streaker going into Krugs here and it's going to be Chaos with that big advantage. I mean, he knocked down both the other two people who were streaking, and he was probably the only board that could have actually done it. So matchmaking really working out in his favor. Yeah, exactly. And on the other side, our lost streakers were able to get there kind of uncontested and run into each other. Wet Jungler and Jitong able to get those full lost streaks in. All right, music time. We've got country on the board right yeah, now. This what is tell the me about that this? we're talking about. So the, the, the country music is, is interesting. It's not actually so much like a true country right, yeah. it, it, because the 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 genre country itself i know y'all have been walking around vegas a little bit there's like a rodeo <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah i'm not sure what it was so many cowboys yeah, yeah but i think so much of that genre is is the vocals right the way that they pronounce the accents and the words and stuff we can't have vocals in here so how do we make that thing come through and i feel like i just ended up leaning on the cinematic sort of western uh, cowboy genre to instead it. to to kind of really make that punch through. And I feel like the other thing that we missed a little earlier was a carousel round. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but it plays the music of the first first place person in oh, the lobby. I didn't know. So, so yeah, that. that's yeah, really cool. That's, that's how it works. That's something that um, it's fixed uh, and it's a shared space for everyone. No, I don't either. I know, <laughs> but I, 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 this is something that we, we just did, like, it came online kind of last minute and it was really cool because you is. start to notice some trends by just listening to the music and how the music in the carousel oh. evolves over the round and you can kind of see like, oh, like the early Which rounds are, are usually like, you know, so the punk and KDA because I think it was it was mostly the super fans that are getting played earlier, those that are getting first place because of that extra item essentially. Second gold augment right off the bat. Doesn't see anything too crazy. A couple snap decisions from players, others taking way more time to figure out what they want to play. Last stand offer for Phoenix. This is a big augment that we've seen a lot of players find success with, and it can cap out for those big first places if you find the right board to play and with He's it. also the person who hit Hearthsteel on he stage did. one, right? Oh, so yeah. last stand can, can even potentially work better with that if you want to get really greedy, uh, but that is a risky play. You know, grabbed gonna, it. Okay. So he's, he's going to be playing that, and I'm, I'm curious now to see his board and see if he is still playing. Heart seal, and he is. So you can go really deep. He has five heart seal. This is actually an insane spot. 72 health, five heart seal, last stand. That's you can get strong. so greedy with this, get a massive cash out, and that could be a ticket to a first place in this lobby. His current item slants actually have a lot of very good last stand outs. Uh, Viego's a very good user of last stand. We've also seen a Kali, right? Yes, the, the level nine boards, the big legendaries are good, but having Yana, level eight, eight outs Kendra. are incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he's got so many options with these items, yes, they're good general flexible ones, but last stand, the Omni Vamp the tankiness does benefit those melee carries a lot more. Yeah, I'm really curious to see how he plays out. Actually, I feel like we'll find a lot of information based on Phoenix. Phoenix's next set of itemization, right? Because he does have this Sojin, which means you can play into that Sona, keep those melee units alive. But whether he had, how he wants to figure out killing this rod is going to be a really important next step wow. in his game. I think he just got two Nikos from that orb. So two Nikos and a ribbon popping out of the orb. Guts give him the Nico too here. So that is going to be pretty nice. At least one popped out. I wasn't sure if it was three uh, actually units popped out or not, but he got the ribbon, he got the Nico does get the upgrade off of it. So sitting in a pretty good position, another Heartsteel player here, um, but only sitting on the three Heartsteel. 
Yeah, the big thing that I note on this board is uh, actually slamming the blinged out on uh, stage uh, on the first augment choice, and so kind of committing into that true damage line. But it's such a powerful augment that I think that accepting that, oh, this is enough power that I feel comfortable playing around the multiple different ways you can play true damage, right? If you can go fast nine, play around Kiana, that's obviously the best, but there's also the Senna reroll we saw work earlier, and just true damage of Kali being generally very strong. We didn't really touch on it before. When Precedent did lose his win streak in stage two, you have to keep in mind Precedent, one of those players only sitting at three points right now. It's honestly a spot where even if you go 1-1 one, one in games three and four, you don't know if that's going to get you through because it's only a top two. So you have to imagine that losing that streak for Precedent, especially when now he's sitting in such a strong position with a lot of strong units on his board, it definitely doesn't feel good because he needs to go 1-1 one, one just to have a chance. I'm trying to listen to the uh, the music right now to figure out. Yeah, I was doing literally doing the same thing. Yeah. I was actually, I was, I, Bill got in my head with it. Yeah, I was like, yeah, wait a minute, talk. I've never. Do you, I've have, never done do you have a favorite um, trait for music, Bill? I don't know. I think for me, like I said before, I, I think country is always going to be my favorite because I made it. But I, <laughs> I think it's like baby. I think the ones that I really enjoy playing is the the disco EDM combination, mm. and you know like putting the, the EDM augment on, on Lux, that's always like so fun. How, how common is it? Cause I know you talked about the collaborative process of five yeah. composers, I think is what you said. It's a total of seven. Seven? I think, yeah. I imagine that's gotta be difficult. There's so many ideas that go into really, I mean, it, it is a lot yeah. of uh, songs, a lot of ideas, but ultimately with seven people, there's a lot of things being pitched. There's a lot of overlap, yeah. And I think that in general, I, what we, like like about this set is that there are just the genre differences so we just put everyone to the things that suit them the most you know like I, and i think like there was um jason walsh is not with us anymore but i think he was such an edm hyper pop specialist that like it just made sense for him to do that kind of thing whereas like this you know for me like i love the acoustic genre so i get to do like a lot of country punk stuff that was sort of what i did and the one that was the outlier was heart steel which was kind of like it was you know, coming off of, of the success of Paranoia, of course, but I had to make it while Paranoia was also being made around the same time. So that was interesting. How much do the composers and whatnot actually are, you know, when we were backstage, you were talking about uh, playtests and whatnot. Like, how much yeah. are you guys kind of involved in trying to make sure that the music fits the gameplay and actually playing the game and stuff versus just, I'm going to make a really cool song? We try as much as we can. I think I'm I'm a little bit of an outlier. I, I had sort of, you know, like the uh, music design background where it's not just composition. But I feel like um, a lot of other folks are so sort of like, they have to be ton a little bit more tunnel vision in because their genres are hard to execute or it takes a little bit more time or they have to spend time recording and whatnot. But um, towards the end, because I had this background prior, I sort of come in with, um, a little bit more of like an awareness of how to take us to the finish line along with our audio lead, Allison Ho, and um, our game designer, Milo Wu, as well. Phoenix taking another loss, looking at five loss streaks through stage three. Want to see what that cash it's out really is. I believe he probably has though. one more loss, right? Yeah, Before yeah. it cashes out. So definitely want to keep well, the box on Phoenix shaking, as much so as you can. More than one? Because usually the box shakes before it, it's going to pop, right? Oh, really? Is that one? Yep. So he could be at 114 stacks with only two I think, I think he, I think he has loss. at least two more losses. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it does have to shake before it pops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm pretty sure it has uh, two more losses. And that last loss was really good. Only a two-unit loss. He is quite rich. So he could easily go eight at any time. He's sitting at what looks like 30-ish HP just based off the health bar. Um, but does have that last stand. I don't think he's going to get to nine for the, for the roll no. down. So I it's think gonna it's going to be a level eight roll down. Absolutely. Um, but 70 gold, 33 health, five streak, and we'll see, you know, how good this cash out is going to be. Because if you get something massive, if you get two more losses, you know, upgrade the box a couple more times, you can get into that range where you're getting 30, 40 gold worth of value, and that can be very, very game warping. Yeah, and we talked about how many different, you know, outs he has with the itemization. The only kind of struggle is the Ginsu would be better if you could push to nine. But the thing is, is if you do a big roll down on eight and you just find one Sona, Sona one with the Ginsu is actually already a very strong thing to accentuate a board that you've made a very, very strong board that's on Terry. like a pawn or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that would be get insane. a back cash out. Yeah. That's interesting. Jitung was playing pretty heavy into country. He sold his headliner and he's, he's sitting on seven. So uh, likely going to be trying to roll for one of those country headliners. 
Let's see if he's going to be able to make it happen. Another loss there for Phoenix. This one hurts a little bit more as it is that four unit loss, but he's up to 189 hearts. Yeah, Phoenix getting so much value out of that gem because the front line was enough, but in stage four, that front line is looking pretty weak as we look at our third gold augment of the game. And yeah, nothing really crazy jumping out at me thus far, but I want to see how people are going to make these transitions. Um, we just saw Blitz 2 being picked up on the right side. So yeah, now the box is shaking, so he's going to have one more loss. So he's at least going to get to that 200 benchmark. Uh, win or lose, you would get enough hearts for that. So we'll see if he can actually get up above that. But he is rolling for a headliner now. So he's dropped out of the five heart seal, I do believe. Yep. And is going to be sitting on four right now and trying to start to upgrade his board. But this roll down is not inspiring a lot of confidence in me. Um, rolls quite a bit of his gold. He's pretty poor now and ends up having to settle on the Nico, which does give him three KDA, but that's not what he was looking for. You're not looking for a three cost there. You're looking for a four cost that is actually going to give you some direction in your comp and that is going to be able to get really great use of that last stand. It's a ton of gold on his bench, but it's also a lot of pairs. And the ones I'm mainly looking at, the Holly, Holly is going to use the ones, the items that he has on the front line right now. But the backline items, the Ginsu and the Shoujin are okay for a Twisted Fate. It could help stabilize in the mid game. And Yes, a, uh, a disco board can kind of work out. They utilize the tanky stats well, but they don't utilize the Omni. It's not as, as nice to have yeah, the Omni vamp where you will kind of want that more of the melee centric composition. And I feel like you can't really pivot into a full disco anyway because you need all these low cost units. Yeah, right? exactly. So it's like you could try to splash in three disco with like a Gragas or something like that, but um, I do think it's it's pretty tough. And we're gonna see what the cash out is. It it's is. gonna. Could he a go lot into the, the Zed Yone cloud dive? Exactly. Yeah, I think that's what he wants. wants. Look at those items for the melee carries. Oh, Zed. Oh, wow, QSS that's a QSS finds hit. the Zed. That's <laughs> gigantic. As I call it you out. Call it out, Bill. Like... See, Bill knows his CFT. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. He's got the Riot client. He's <laughs> he's next going. Roll. As, Azale was saying what he really needs right now is direction, right? He has <laughs> holding all these pairs, didn't quite find anything, but being able to find an itemized Zed this headliner here. This is pretty trash, so I'm going to be honest. I agree. It's a lot of one stars on that board. on there, he has good items now, um, but we'll have to see what he's going to do. He reforges the QSS into a Death Cap. So Death Cap's going to go on the Sona, Infinity Force onto the Zed. So he has pretty good kind of bruisery items on this set. The rest of his units are quite weak, but at the very least, he hasn't procced the last stand yet, and he is still sitting around that 40 gold. This Poppy's an absolute monster, yeah. though, and the <laughs> Senate's just staying alive, right? So now this Zed actually not able to get through. Lose again. He wow. might lose his last that stand. It's really very, very That's close. Not good. That's not good. Only two units, so I, I think he keeps it, right? Is this 2 HP? See. Yeah. Yeah, he's that okay. Oh, oh no, it was oh. one, it pops. Oh, all right, no. it's pop. Oh no, that's really bad. I all thought right. it was two HP. Let's see, he's got a transition he's right after this. Zero. Love to stay on Phoenix after horrible. the carousel here because this is a huge inflection point for the rest of this game. We, we're looking at a spot he that looked like a potential first. Oh no. Yeah, Yorori grabs it away. And now Phoenix might end up falling on stage four. This could be an eight stabilization. very easily. I mean, he, he's got to roll zero. He has 40 gold. But yeah, he obviously thought that he was stable enough just picking up that Zed. But this is the thing. We've seen this happen actually a lot in this tournament where people hit a strong headliner and are neglecting to upgrade the rest of the, their board. They're just feeling like, okay, I'm stable enough. I hit a Kiana, I hit a Zed, I hit a Viego. But their board is full of one stars and it's not actually giving the time. So now you gotta roll zero and you gotta just pray. The worst part is it's one stars oh and they're not a lot of one cost or two costs where he picked up little buddies, right? He's only getting a little bit of value from it. Maybe he can find, you know, a better one or two cost to play or he can just find some bigger late game, but He's Diego in the shop, he's not rolling. He might just hold on. He feels say, he has to go nine, I guess. He doesn't yeah, think he, there's any sort of angle nine. to win out from eight. I think the tricky part is he has these AP items on the back line, right? And it's kind of hard. If you want to roll on eight for that, you're committing to rolling really deep, right? It's yeah. not super easy to find a holder for these but three he hit items. But he I think he's just dead. We's see. I mean, we'll see. We'll Solus see. still carrying the Aphelios okay, two yeah, in the back line. So it might be able to actually stop the three. Should be, should be okay, then. The problem is Aphelios has a really good way of getting onto that Zed, and if Zed does go down, then this port's not going to do enough. But yeah, no, this Zed has not sustained the Yone already in the back line, and that Zen is still pumping, so Phoenix stays alive. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, Phoenix is going to have to win. The problem is he's going to have to win quite a few rounds, right? Like, Solus can just go to nine yeah. and, and then roll. Phoenix is going to have to try to get nine, roll down, and be able to win out. But it's really sketchy, because if they make the transition faster, if they're actually... Like, if Solus was on a four-cost headliner at that point, you could have just lost the game from there. So it's it's really scary if he runs into someone who actually goes to zero 
uh, as we're seeing more people do, like Chaos just actually sent all his gold. Um, so a lot of these players are going to start to really upgrade their boards as we're heading into stage five. Yeah, and I mean, Jitong's having to send it to zero here on the country board. You know, Bill talking about this board a lot, the country emo. I get all this going, but it doesn't he's not go hitting very the three far. Stars. Yeah, yeah it, he has to hit the three stars. But even that, I feel like with everyone playing fast nine these days, like you're kind of committed to rolling at seven, and then you, if you don't hit, you kind of screw. Yeah. True damage, Akali on the Zed. Let's see if this could be enough damage to get out. Zed makes it through the Akali. Imagine this going to be enough now. Senna on Senna. All right, Phoenix. That was actually pretty close because the Zed yeah. almost died a couple units prior. His last end diff, <laughs> yeah, for that sure. That was absolutely last end diff. That was really close. Um, Yitong dies. I mean, he he was one off Senna, or sorry, one off um, Samira. Samira. He was yeah, two Samira. off of Urgot, and he didn't he have didn't a headliner, roll. and he has 15 gold. Yeah. So I don't really he understand rolled. why he didn't send it to zero. Like, you're losing, you're, you're on a loss streak here. You know, you're, you're kind of in a rough spot. Um, oh, he has left stand, okay. Oh, he has left yeah, stand. Yeah, I, I, well. I, didn't, I didn't remember that there was that a second helped. last stand. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. I was like, why would you not send players. it to zero? Oh, Phoenix. Phoenix sold his Zed, right? He did. He's looking to make the transition now. Finds a Kiana. Okay, yeah. He went level nine. nine. He's just hoping for the high okay. roll at this point. He, yeah. he recognizes that he's in a very tough spot, and his out is to high roll like one of the, you know, uh, five cost headliners immediately once getting the nine. So he's just trying to open it up for it. I was gonna actually talk about the fact that it's really hard for Phoenix to sell this Zed because he is on one life, but he's playing fearless right now and says, "I'm just gonna opt into the fact that I have the potential to high roll, but." I'm not sure that he has enough gold to get there. I mean, it's, it's also a really tough position for uh, for Jitong because he, he's still not even playing good. any sort of headline, right? Like, he hasn't been able to find the Urgot. He hasn't been able to find the Samira. He doesn't have three star. I mean, now he's holding too many copies to actually even hit the headline. So yeah, it's, he... it's... Four Mosher, actually not that bad uh, getting the Poppy headliner here. Poppy actually makes pretty decent use of that last stand. I'm going to be interested to see if he's going to slam the Infinity Force and some kind of more damage items on it. I think the biggest hit there too is that he does find this Sona, right? So he does have a holder for these AP items that's going to allow him to scale up and potentially try and win out. We'll see. Looks like he's up against a another very strong board from Wet Jungler, though, who is still sitting on 50 gold. So actually, Wet Jungler holding out on capping out their board. So G Tung did hit the Urgot 3, so that's actually really big. We'll see if that's going to be enough to get him through this one. This is getting close, though, for Phoenix, but he should be able to take it down. Poppy doing a great job staying alive. And so because you have that needlessly big gem and you have the on-hit damage from Sona, it's enough damage to take the fight there. Yeah, essentially it's kind of the composition that we saw Solas playing in the previous game where he stabilized on a bunch of Moshers and then a one-star Sona in the back line. And this is just kind of an even better version, right? You've got last stand, you've got the needlessly big gem. And Solas used that to stabilize and then build up the highest cap board in his first place. So Phoenix trying to kind of play around that same style. The problem is he doesn't have the luxury. Solas had a ton of HP he was letting you know kind of chip away phoenix is on one life so bill talk to me about some of the kind of unique traits like mix master and, and maestro and all yeah. these things that are, are starting to come into the game now they're kind of basically like you you look at it as legendaries right and I, you want you want them to come in and really make a, a direct impact to your board same similar to the gameplay so for example mix master it will basically force your drum stem to be this kind of almost this dj -y, you know four on the floor type thing the Maestro is yet another one where, like, you know, as soon as he comes in, you're going to hear the violin solo being played all the time on top of, the, of your comp. And I feel like it's one of those things where, within the design, we know we want it to, to be noticeable right away. Uh, the Alawi as well, she's got her own sort of unique beat that she has going on that is, like, slightly inspired by the, you know, the Polynesian culture, with a little bit of modern beat production, and, and you can kind of hear that a little bit, yeah in the production phase because i imagine you're expecting people to be able to play these very wide boards on level nine level ten can you can you talk about the process of actually hearing all of the sounds together for the first time it was really it was a lot it was very <laughs> sensory overload and i think that we had to build a logic in which like where you are playing legendary soups like this where you can kind of have a little bit of a shuffling going on because we only have like three tracks essentially that, that are rotatable through so let, let's say if you have you know two of the rhythm ones like DJ Sona and, and um, Ill Beats like Ilawi, it's gonna like sort of rotate through the, the two different drum stem a little bit, and without rotating too much, that you're starting to go like, is this even music anymore? Like right now, you're hearing a little bit of that Ilawi beats. 
So a couple of players now actually eliminate. So Ji Jung did in fact die. The last stand, not enough to carry him through. Couldn't actually find those headliners that he wanted. Pretty much it felt like the whole yeah. game long, and that's the risk you take with that country line. And as soon as everyone else as gets well. to nine, you, I think, you know, that yeah. country executioner comp just becomes so weak in the front line. That's one of the differences than what we saw yesterday when Flighty was piloting the country board is that he spent gold very heavily early on because he wanted to maintain tempo and take advantage of the fact People that he's playing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then he preserved high health, was able to get a top two because he was sitting around 50, 40 uh, HP when everyone else was capping out. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen some people win with those boards. Ooh, oh my transition. God, Genesis big transition. Full transition, let's see. But he, he's rolling heavy for, uh, oh, for one of those five cost headliners, but if you spend too much time rolling, you're gonna have no gold to cap out the rest of your board. Oh, he bought the TF, then oh, immediately oh, sold no. it, minus one gold. Eight right. seconds left to he's make doomed. this happen. He has no, oh, no. He has, doesn't have you enough gold buy it. He's spent too much buy gold. it, throw stuff on there, hopefully it's enough. I mean. He has good items for playing around. This but his board is absolute garbage. Oh my goodness! <laughs> he's, a, he's a one star Nami, one star Tarek. You know, two, two unitemized Yorix. Like he doesn't even have his items in. Uh, he's doing a good job of getting them in quickly, though. I mean, it, it did still happen mid fight, so it's you lose a little bit of value. Like the Coco's front line is so not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, Impressive and another bot four. It's interesting, you know. Try try to make that transition, but it was like. It felt like the board got a lot weaker. I guess if you feel like, hey, I can't beat anyone from this position anyway, and especially if you're in a position where you're already down in the lobby, you yeah. have to go, take that risk, go for the first place. So I respect the decision, you know, in, in the context of where he is in the lobby. You have to try to look for one of those super powerful headliners that's maybe going to turn the game around for you, right? Because if you roll, and in the first roll or two, you do hit that five cost headliner that you can kind of build around. But as soon as you didn't hit it on the first couple rolls, the headliner alone costs 12 to 15 gold. You, ha you don't have enough gold to buy the whole board. The it's Zix exactly headliner. what we need. Oh, the Ziggs. We found a Ziggs. Finds it. I mean, it's still good. It got nerfed, but it is still a very good pickup on it level is. 9. He's got frontline already. He's, he's, got, he's got the allowing. Yeah. yeah, he's got good items. You make it happen. He's got to figure out how to get all these items on the board now where they're going to play. Soul is definitely in a position now where he's starting to bleed out. Hopefully, this can stabilize him. Oh, that's rough for Phoenix because this is a bit of a spike from Solus immediately. But the front line's still relatively weak. And we've got the Kiana to from Phoenix printing a bunch of items on this Tom Kench, helping the front line out significantly. He's buying a lot of time and once again leaning on the healing Sona. True damage, Jin in the back line as well means that once you get that ascension, this Jin is going to one-shot anything that your board has. Phoenix might, yeah. might have done it. He actually might have stabilized. This might be a first for Phoenix. We look at the composition of his board, the way it is put together. He has so much frontline. The healing Sona once again, which he just won with. The Jin that he just won with. This is the full setup. And now, this time he has ascension because he's got the needlessly big gem. So it's just better than what he won with last game. <laughs> I mean, he had an incredible start to this game. Being able, he had the the one four three heart steal, had five heart steal really early on. Hit that with the last stand, so it's a really deadly combo. But it was looking risky for him for a while. He was barely able to actually eke out a couple rounds, then be able to stabilize, cap out his board a lot higher. Did elect to not roll heavier on eight. And I know if I was in his position, I would have absolutely rolled at zero on eight because he had such a weak board. It felt like alongside the headliner, but he had just enough to get through get himself to nine, now in a position to actually win the lobby instead of doing what I would have wow. done. Wow. Lose <laughs> Roll an eight and go, and go Just try six, to, yeah, seven, pray something for like a that. fifth or something yeah. like that. I mean, it's the nature of this format, right? When you're playing for that top two position, you have to be willing to take that risk. But I, mm -hmm. I kind of want to contextualize Phoenix in the place of North America, right? Because this is a player that has existed in NA for a very long time. And even going back to set seven, when he had this breakout tournament at the Astral Cup, a lot of people did not give him that much credit. In set nine, though, he joined this K3 stu uh, Soju study group all of a sudden was kind of put in the spotlight. People give Phoenix way more credit nowadays than they have ever before in the history of TFT. Interesting to see him sub out the Sona that was working quite well, instead trying to find a little bit more damage, but it does soften his front line. And now we see running into a little bit of issues. He's still stronger here. He will still win, but this was a bit of a closer fight than we saw some of the previous ones. Yeah, it was, but still four or five units left in that yeah, back exactly. line. I don't think anyone's going to be able to beat him. If you stabilize on nine with the last stand, it is really tough to take down those boards. Point totals across the board. I know we saw nine points from one of the players, 10 from, from one, 11 from another. These are all players on the bubble that are competing for those top two spots. That's going to be able to give them an edge over the field as we head into the fourth and final game after this. And we see what jungler fall in fifth. Definitely one of the players with a lot of promise coming into the tournament, second place at the world championship, and now 
Gonna be back against the wall in the final game to try and make it happen and get a top two spot. Like Coco, another very strong representative from Umiya. Not very surprising to see him, you know, make it this far in the event and also make this push for a top two. Maybe representing Amiya if Wet Jungler's not able to turn it around before the game. And then one of these players is going to be going down here. We'll see if the Sona can get it done or if it's going to be that Ziggs headliner in the background. Sona gets the cast off, but it's the Ziggs falling apart. clearing the board. And it's going to be Coco going down here to Solus. So Solus pushing that much further is going to make a top three. And we'll see if another player does get eliminated, but not just yet. Chaos at seven health. Solus at five health, and Phoenix, of course, sitting at that one health mark after the last stands. Yeah, I mean, but still, as you said earlier, I just don't think anyone's found the ability to beat him. I'm still, you know, not sure if I loved the, the Sona cell particularly, but I don't think it really makes a huge difference yeah. at the end of the day because this board is so massive. The last stand buffing up that front line. You've got the Omni Vamp, so it's not like this Jin is going to die to some rambit, random ambient damage. And you can see Jin the strength of it when you hit a board like this. When you have two-star Yorick, two-star Alawi, two-star Thresh, two-star Kiana, all of these things that are there to buy time and nothing on his bench, right? So if the round goes long, he's going to be stacking up those violins, pumping out the damage on the left side. That is not a ghost board. Is Solus going in there? We'll see if he's going to be able to take it down. Up against Chaos's board, who honestly we haven't talked about too much, but is playing around at three-star Misfortune. We'll see if it's enough damage. Putting out a lot. The Ziggs oh, and the, the MF. Oh, gets the Ziggs, but still falls and the re not able to take it chaos oh, oh, oh. goes down in third place ad sona popping off yeah the yeah. sniper's focus infinity sniper's edge it got to the end and just pop, 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 pop. <laughs> take her out well solas really was able to actually cuss us out you know getting a top two from this position he was looking like he could have flamed oh, out yeah. pretty early in this lobby oh my god so many of those <laughs> close <BM>. moments <laughs> camping oh. the item just to jack it from him all right, Phoenix looking to potentially make a victory lap. 10 win streak up to this point in time. Not exactly sure what Solus can do. He could be what? happy he got second. <laughs> You're right. I think that's what he Sometimes should do. we just take those. It's, it's yeah. a stand up, handshake, and be happy. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of games that you play where you just realize, hey, my board is capped. This is as good as it's going to get, and it's not good enough, right? Uh, but you could definitely be really happy with the second. Phoenix played a risky line, was able to make it work out. And this is something that I think we're seeing you know, more of more of as we get later in the tournament. People realizing they can't play conservative and win out these lobbies against so many skilled players. Yeah, I mean, I think Phoenix will be thinking about that, you know, moment where he decided to say, you know what, I if I go out eighth here, I go at uh, eighth here, I need to push to nine, I need to hit that high, high roll. Uh, he'll be thinking about that for a very long time because he stabilized this into another first back to back. Wow. He's very likely to advance as long as he has a pretty consistent next game. And Phoenix looking real good to move on to our top 32. We've said so many times across this tournament how there's this element of any given Sunday, anybody can break out, anybody can step into the light. We saw yesterday players like Flight who are not necessarily considered the favorite going into their lobby. Phoenix. Certainly a strong player from North America, not the first seed, not always giving credit, but he's making an opportunity for himself to truly break out. And you can see how happy they are, you know, chatting it up on stage after. He was sitting right beside Solus, I believe, yeah. there on stage. So kind of being able to go up against the person you're right beside is, is a lot of fun. But Bill, it was great having you up here. Talk Thank about you, guys. Posing the music. Love Y'all it. have done incredible work. We're loving Remix Rumble. It has been so much fun to be able to, to play the new set find all our favorite tunes oh, yeah. and kind of find these these unique combinations that are types of music that i would have never listened to otherwise exactly and that's the point of it all right where it's just like you get to have fun a little find some really unlikely combinations and just like jam out to it there's like this interesting relationship here right where obviously you represented on the musical side the composition side but obviously now you're, you're here in vegas and you're seeing yeah. the competitive <laughs> scene all kind of exactly. take place i imagine that it's kind of a different world for you to see your creation kind of be contextualized, I guess, in, in a competitive format. Yeah, a little bit. And, and I feel like what's... <laughs> Look at that guy. <laughs> He's so happy. Yeah, we've got all the Phoenix highlights on this screen. We're going to see kind of this journey as he dropped all the way down to zero health while well, one with the last stand. And then crafted this board kind of from some jank where he put together, you know, he sold the Zed and then tried to roll down and he had to kind of cobble together that Mosher board. And then pulling it from there, he's able to climb all the way up. I mean, what was like the kind of the, the big key moment that completely turned it around? 
I think the, the, you know, we talked about it before, the fact that he was willing to say, I'm not going to roll, I'm going to yeah. read it out, because if I go eighth, it does not matter. I'm playing for first, I'm playing to advance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, that was the key moment. That was kind of the inflection point of the game. Um, you know, when earlier, you know, we thought he was in such a bad spot, when he hit that dead headliner, and then, you know, was it was losing that fight so badly that the last damn frost, I think a lot earlier than he was hoping to have it happen, you know, I, I know I would have rolled to zero on eight there, just try to get as strong of the board as I can and just see what I can kind of eke yeah. out. But you know, this is this is one of the greatest strengths I think that the top pros have is that they're so good at evaluating board strength and knowing exactly how much power they need, what they can get away with, what they can't, when they need to roll, when they don't. There's this element of spot recognition in TFT, right? Spends but doesn't break the game. From the ashes. From the ashes. You love it. No, no, yeah, it's very true because I, I feel like he really like sort of like changes the board so much throughout the whole game. And I think we talked about this backstage where this is one thing that pro players are so different from us is that they're not afraid to sell. No. They will sell at any point in time that makes sense for them. And, and that's usually more often than what we would do. And general. you can see now how close this lobby is actually getting. Phoenix out in first, 20 points, but Solus and Chaos tied to 18 oh, points. Oh my goodness. We've got, you know, 15 points for Coco there. Yoroi down at 14, Wet Jungler at 13. Suppressed event uh, and Jitong pretty much out of it. You know, guaranteed not going to be able to, to move on, not going to actually catch up as far as those points are concerned. But for the other players, you're in there. Yeah, I think Phoenix. Chaos and Solus and Lecoco as well are really going to be, wow, look wow. at his Love lobby graph, position. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he makes that slingshot all the way back to the first place. Going into the final game though, right? We're looking at players like Solus, Chaos, Lecoco who are all still in a position to maintain a top two position. For players like Lecoco, however, you really need that top two to even have a chance. And then on top of that, you have to hope that players like Solus and Chaos kind of fizzle out. Yeah, exactly, man. That's the big thing, right? I think that, you know, if from Wet Jungler up, I think they're still live. But yeah. it's going to require a lot of good circumstances for a player like Wet Jungler at 13 points to squeak into that top two. And I think it gets so interesting when you're coming into these final games because the way that you play out the lobby changes drastically based on the other people that are close to you in the points are doing, right? So if your opponent is having a really strong board, is looking like they might actually pass you in points, you've got you've to gotta figure out a way to kind of cap out higher. If they're looking really weak, maybe you just need to play for a top four, right? So it really does change their strategy and change the way that they want to play. And for these people that are the top dogs that are close to actually winning out, people sometimes are trying to like roof their boards and contest yeah, them and absolutely. do things to actually, you know, stop them from finishing so highly. So there's so much strategy that goes into these final games. And I always find it so interesting to see how it actually changes and evolves. All right, well, with that, I want to thank Phil for coming on and sharing all the insights. Thank you. For the music in the set. It was very enlightening. Azale and I were sitting here just like, wait, that's that's how that works. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we were Came learning, online in the learning, last two weeks of development. Learning yeah. so much over the course of that. But we will find out how this lobby will conclude. We're going to go to a short break, but the TFT Vegas Open will continue right after this.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Team Fight Tactics of Vegas Open. We've got one more game of this lobby to decide who our top two are to move on to the top 32. And I know across the entire venue, there are plenty of other lobbies going on trying to determine that same fate. And as people have talked about throughout the event, it is so incredibly difficult to sneak in and get that top two. <laughs> oh. Found you. A <laughs> couple more TFT talent out on the floor. Exciting to see them all. But as we're moving forward into these other lobbies, there's been a ton that we've been seeing. What are some of the players you were looking out for to make it in? I mean, I got to rep my region, right? I'm from Tri-State. It's players like Pocky Gum. It's players like Milk. We replay. Bosso skills. Some of these players making it to the final day. But listen, it's hard to advance from here. You can't expect everyone to make it. Yeah, that's absolutely for sure. But I want to take a look around the uh, entire venue, take, take a look at some of these other lobbies that we can, and look for those standings and see exactly, you know, where some of these players have been and who is looking towards advancing. As so we take a look here, Farmer staying on top with Yunwilf. This is what we saw earlier in Lobby 3 with the Sean's Lobby. Uh, I mean, look at this too. The point differential is massive in between like second and third place as well. Yeah, so yeah. both of them are hyper running their lobby and I think they are in very, very good positions to be able to make it's, it forward. It's basically sealed now. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's been a long time since we've seen X the Farmer on top. I remember way back in set five, oh. he was on top. Flancy running all the way back. He was at the bottom of his lobby at the very start of the day, he went seventh. And then we see a second and a first for Flancy, one of the favorites of the tournament from China coming in at the top of the table. And you can see Soju in fifth. So, you know, three games played. It's a tough spot for him to be able to make up that four point difference up towards the top. But it is possible, you know, really for, for everyone in that top five to still get up there. All right, in lobby 12, Milk has climbed all the way to the top. But this is a tight race between Stay Alive, Sasa, and Milk all at 17 points. And Stellar could even still find an upset at 14 if he finds a first or a second. Yeah, tight lobby. We talked about some of these lobbies kind of being locked. This one, though, it's you suddenly have these hero players going to the into game four that you're going to be watching. Zaza, Stellar, Minhi. I imagine Groxy's probably just outside of that bubble because of the top two cut. Well, you can see Milk, you know, finished at a seventh, then he had a second and a first to be able to bounce back up towards the top. And AKA Wonder here up Ooh. at the top. Oh, no. Dish oh. and Asa near the bottom there. I think Asa might still be live at that 14 points. It's going to be tough to make it above the rest of these players, but AKA Wonder really coming out strong in these last two games. Yeah, AKA Wonder, I know, is one of the players that make specifically, I think, had her eyes on to do really well in this competition. It's so funny, because she he also kind of got an interview buff, where, like, right after, like, I think she talked to him, uh, went first in the lobby, so uh, that is always nice to see. Yeah, exactly. Love to see <laughs> that coming out of AKA Wonder being able to pick up that win. Uh, I heard uh, some rumors of interview buffs affecting EMEA players all oh, over. Really? I heard yeah. Casey Double oh. had an interview with Panda and immediately hit a Lowey 3 in the very next game. <laughs> It's insane. Okay, we got to see what our uh, EMEA counterparts are doing when they're going around interviewing these EMEA players because suddenly they're finding wins. Maybe I need to go interview Crone again, see how he can keep doing it. You know, I'm on the screen. I feel like everyone I've been interviewing has not been doing very well. It's like they sent me over to interview Soju, he comes out fifth. I was going over to interview Robin Song, he comes off with Angel. You can't oh, yeah. talk to any of the NA players. No. Dale, you're not Stay away. allowed. Don't leave the couch. All right, this well, host. It's the interview's after. So, <laughs> Speaking you know. of of those interviews, you were saying makes caught up with AKA Wonder. We've actually got that here. Let's go take a look. I'm here on the floor with AKA Wonder, one of the biggest influencers and players coming out of Spain. And of course, I'm so happy you made the long travel to the TFT Vegas Open and you made it today too. Right now, your position is a little bit scary. How are you feeling? I mean, uh, I'm so hyped, I'm nervous, I just finished my game, I'm top five and top three, I probably need one and third or something, last two games. But it's so exciting to compete in such a good place with crowd and everything. I'm very happy, but right now I'm shaking, you know. I, you, don't, you don't really, I don't really um, get re nervous really easy, but at that moment I'm, man, uh, I'm super happy being, being honest. I'm so happy to. You're doing fantastic. We're all cheering for you. Is there any specific interaction that you had so far at the TFT Vegas Open that you really enjoyed? Anything you want to share? I mean, I, I met Mordok, which is always fine. Uh, he was so, so nice to me. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I, I actually have so many interactions that I love. Meeting all the European players. For, for once, we are all together in the same boat, you know? So that's super interesting. We usually fight against each other, so we are together right now doing, you know, talking, talking to each other, going together to eat dinner or something. It's pretty cool. I, I don't I don't remember right now anything special, but everything uh, is so cool here. Meeting all also new people from NA that we don't really see each other's face that really often. It's so cool to be honest. I mean, if everything's special, I'll accept that answer too. Back to you guys. All right, that was an excellent interview. I mean, it did give the uh, the buff to AK Wonder going in the next game, and he was talking about nerves and how nervous he feels. And it was a big thing that Gangly and I sent out a survey to a bunch of players, and so many of them were like, oh no, I don't get nervous, it won't affect me. And you heard him say it, oh, I don't get nervous, but he was shaking, he was having a lot of you know issues with nerves, but he's still playing through it, and I think a lot of players are in the same boat. It's funny, we, we looked at each other the second he said that, because it's so <laughs> many players in this tournament, and I think, honestly, just didn't understand what the LAN environment would feel like. So you go in saying, I don't get nervous, or, it's not going to affect me, I'm going to be fine. Suddenly you're here and you're out of your comfort zone. Exactly. I mean, there's such a big difference playing, you know, in your bedroom, at your house, you know, in the same place you're always playing at, you know, the same comfort zone, listening to music, temperatures the way you want it, you know, the clothes are the things you're normally wearing, you know, everything is the same, but you come here and so many of the players I've interviewed and talked to have been talking about the fact that, oh, there's so much noise, you can hear all these people <laughs> talking, and, and when I'm doing my roll down, people are talking about what I should be taking, and it's, you know, it's really, really hard for them to kind of get past that at first and, and be able to play the normally way they would play. Where are the snacks too? Like yeah, you can't true. just leave yeah, your right? computer <laughs> and go grab a bag of chips or something. These players really are locked in and focused, especially as we look ahead towards this final game. All right, setting the stage for this final game too, right? We have our main characters, so to speak, those players that are competing for those top two spots. Players like Chaos, players like Solus, players like Wet Jungler and Phoenix as well, who we saw topping the last game. No one else wanted anything else but Silver Symphony. Did you see that? Yeah, people <laughs> like it. And the thing to watch out with Silver Symphony, uh, Symphony is going to be the recompobulators because while it's not always a good take, because the five costs are so good on this set, if you do hit it early, four costs on three, two have the option. A lot of times it can be worth just going for and seeing if you hit one of the stronger ones. Even yesterday, I remember we saw Chaos take that recombobulator and then be able to make a strong board, go fast yeah. eight, eventually make it to nine and find a top four. I mean, it's interesting because we've seen some really good ones, and we've also seen some ones that have completely tanked a game, right? Because if you do hit one that doesn't kind of give you any sort of cohesive line to play towards, or you recombob into, you know, you have all AD items and you're only getting AP units and things like that, then all of a sudden you're kind of just down on the augment in this really awkward spot where you have to retransition again. Is there a, a strategy behind when you might pick it? Like if for some, I'm, I'm not a recombobulator player, so I don't know this, but what if maybe four people are sitting on that augment? Can you see that? Can you see when people actually take that augment and maybe go later? Yeah, so one of the big things with Recombobulator is if you have very flexible items, it becomes a lot more reasonable to pick because you know that, hey, I can use the removers and I can put it where these items need to be. The other thing is if you have an upgraded 3 cost on 3-2, it's a bit of a high roll to hit that, but if you do, an upgraded 4 cost instead is a massive increase in power, and that can be a way to go about it. The other thing is maybe you have a medley of 4 costs that you picked up early in the game and you're going to get multiple 5 cost units. That's another way that you can continue to spike the board, and those are when you'll kind of consider it, but not before you... If you've locked in on a strategy, you probably don't want to re -combob. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to, and, and if you just happen to kind of like high roll into some early 4 costs, things like that, right? Like sometimes you just have them in your shop and you're going to be you know, trying to cater your bench towards that re -combob. Uh, you also can, of course, get it you know, as your final augment, where I have seen a uh, game where people super high roll, hit like a three-star Samira into Recombob, and then it's like, okay, well, you won the game. Yeah. Big hit from Chaos here, who finds the Heartsteel headliner uh, Kasante, but on top of that, also takes Silver Spoon. Chaos leading into this event had, let, had told me that the way he wants to play the game is around tempo. He's not a fast nine kind of player. We even saw in the last game, right? He opted to play around that reroll misfortune. While all of these players are going to be looking for Fast 9, Chaos wants to play around level 8, build a stable board, and really what he's just trying to do, if he can make that top 4, is outplay Solus. 
The very fun thing about this is uh, the way he's playing this is a little bit different from that because this opener with the Heartsteel, Cassante, and Silver Spoon is fantastic for playing Fast Knight because you play around the Silver Spoon, you get tempo early game, you win streak stage two. Because you're a higher level earlier on, you see more shops to be able to hit the three cost Heartsteel units, and then you can play five Heartsteel later on. So it, it does lend towards it, but you could just play around the items and play around level eight still. Well, and the problem is he's not slamming any items, right? So he's yeah. actually, you know, he's level five. He's going to lose the White Jumper on that level four who actually has the Hodge Slam on that Eve, and the Eve's able to sustain through it because he hasn't put any items down. You know, a lot of players in these kind of positions will just slam last, a last West and commit to an AD line, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted to stay more flexible. That comes with the cost of losing some of these early rounds. A lot of these players that we've seen playing more tempo tend to be playing towards that AD flex. I've spoken a lot with the AD flex players who tend to actually feel that breeding bow and glove in particular really helps you cap out on level eight because if you're able to play around even shroud instead of playing Last Whisper, it not only allows you to still play backline units like Ezreal and Caitlyn, but it allows you to keep the outs open of playing those melee carries like Riven and Zed that we've seen do really well. I feel like we also haven't seen a whole lot of AD carries that the Last Whisper is kind of like the fit for. It's like it feels very inflexible when you look at maybe some of the carries that might want that, but you leave yourself really open if you can use those components for something else. I think the big thing is reroll became less popular. It was very, very good on Misfortune. It was a needed item on Samira, right? Mm -hmm. This is something that you wanted to build on those reroll lines. And because they haven't been popping up as frequently. We actually thought they'd be a lot more impactful than I think they have been across this oh. tournament. Ooh. CLS priority, but wow, what a close fight between these two. That is really close. And not a bad loss for Chaos, but again, he's going to be on two loss. You know, with Silver Spoon, it's not really where you want to be. Um, you know, the advantage generally, as you're saying, is in that early power. You just have the extra unit early on here, but uh, it does have Heart Steel in now, so that does help things quite a lot. Was able to actually pick up a set, so. A little bit of luck there is going to make this Lost Streak not feel so bad. Preston with the Senna online. Four Senna's, yeah. Four Senna's, but unfortunately in this position where no matter really where he places, he's, he's probably not advancing. Either way, he does get the opportunity to play spoiler. But you can take some spoiler. people down with you. That's right, that's right. <laughs> I'm well, looking at those items, though, and we were saying even just in the first two games, Precedent was really leaning towards trying to find that Ari in the late game. And so I wonder if is this another angle where he is trying to look for that Ari or that AP carry, and is he actually going to be able to get there? I mean, it's going to be really interesting. When you're already on four centers super early, if you find one or two more in these next couple stages, you know, maybe you actually just commit to a reroll and say, you know what, screw it. I'm already, I'm already out. Let's just uh, play really high tempo. Let's just try to cap out really early and, and see if we can actually punish some of these people who are trying to go greedy. And the animation is fine for it, right? Because leaning yep. towards that Ari and another unit that can utilize the items that you would want to slam for Ari is actually that Senna. So I, I, I'm with you, Zell. I think that is a possibility. You could look for that, especially, well, never mind. I was going to say, if you find Blinged Out, but we are on uh, Silver Symphony, so you actually can't even find that <laughs> augment this game. Chaos opts to take the bow here. So I'm interested to see where his slam is going to be. It's possible that he, he does lean into something like Brunans, which has a lot of power up front, and then can actually be flexed in on level eight when you're playing some of these different, both frontline and backline AD carries like Zed, as well as Ezreal or Caitlyn. So what jungler has a super fan and now already slammed the early Hodge, so double Hodge on the Evelyn. It's actually really strong early on. I think this is one of the, the early headliners that sometimes kind of overlooked and underrated um, because it, it can have a tremendous amount of sustain. It's even going to slam a spark. Interesting. So it has the spark down, uh, which is kind of hard committing you to that AP line, but it's something that I don't really see much of because generally people who are playing AP want to push nine and eventually get Ziggs. And Ziggs has that shred on it, so it feels like you're committing to an AP line, but also not a Ziggs line, so it's almost like Ari kind of only. Like, you don't really want it with Karthus Akali, so you're kind of just playing like KDA Ari, and that's almost the only line I really see people build Spark with. Yeah, the only other big thing you get from it is the tempo, because Spark yeah. is a very good early game item, and the fact that it gives you more damage, right? So having that Evelyn in the front line, applying the damage, applying the shred for herself, she becomes an absolute monster. And so really it's what Jungler's saying, okay, I want to keep this win streak as long as possible, so I'm going to utilize these components in order to do so. And we might even see him pivot out of AP and just be kind of down an item, but the economy that he gains from the win streak is worth it in the long run. Yeah, I mean, if you can, if you can go on a full win streak, I think that, you know, that is worthwhile. It's always just the, the kind of risk you take, though, when you're making one of these choices. It's not an item that I ever really like to slam, you know, unless you're in such a dominant position where you feel like you can kind of lock yourself in.
unfortunately loses yep. the last round, He's right? So he's playing around tempo, tempo, but it doesn't work out, especially because he lost to Le Coco, one of the other bubble players who's competing with Wet Jungler for those top two spots. We are now joined again by More Dog. Welcome back. Hello again. What? Hey, buddy. <laughs> you know, got How a quick you bite doing? I got good. I got a quick bite to eat. Said hi to uh, the Brazilian co stream. And nice. Now I'm back here. So very nice, very nice. seeing how game four nice. goes here. Like Coco trying to maintain this streak. However, up against Prestevin, who is certainly trying to play spoiler here. And the Senna 2 a little bit too strong. Yeah, he's got six of them. He also got double gold from uh, from the Bard, which actually, like, it's nice to get the economy, but it does a lot less as far as the combat power on that proc, right? So it uh, could have made a difference because he had a Bard 2 there, that double proc gold, which is 1% chance, right? Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's slower, but it also will still send uh, another note yeah. after. That's the okay. thing with Tip is it gives you a gold, and then it sends a Second new note. Pass, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's slower though. But. It, it is slower. It's always interesting too because when you I play a lot of Bard, especially in the late game when the heal comes out, you're actually disappointed. You're like, I, yeah. I, just, I need you this just want damage. damage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, they're Fire. already finding the rapid fire variation, not the heart steal on five loss. Going to have to find some way to slingshot back in stage three and not take too much damage, but probably not the exact hit you want to find when you no. have the AP leaning items on your bench right now. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a Yone, but again, he didn't find the heart steal thing, and I don't think you really want to lose much anymore, because you're 63 HP at Krugs. Like, he's second lowest is 85, so he was getting absolutely blasted in a lot of these rounds, and he's going to have to find some way to stabilize. I always feel like these kind of, when you take these early five losses, and you're really getting blasted every single round, especially in a lobby like this, where we had Silver Spoon, we had people pu pushing early five, early six, and so on and so forth, you take so much damage, and then it becomes a really difficult decision on how you're going to play it out from here. Because it's like, okay, do I try to go six and roll a little bit and stabilize? How much money do I spend? Because if you're overspend, then you lost all the advantage of going five loss anyway. Your economy isn't going to be that great. This is one of the tricky parts of stage three, because if you're rolling on six, typically you want to be able to build a board that allows you to play front to back really well. Because that's, that's a lot of what set stage three is. But when you already have the Aphelios headliner and you want to play around it, you're probably not selling it. I think he actually is yeah. just going to commit to the center reroll. Yeah, um, you were talking about that earlier. Called yeah. it out that we saw. Pick it up, and now he's got the super fan in. He'll probably just drop that later. Go true damage, and maybe play around this. Exactly. It's like you know, you talked about blinged out. If you get blinged out, then maybe you commit to it. But like when, obviously, he's not going to get it in this game. Right. Yeah. But when you natural six centers, you're why not? Why not? Right? Yeah, I agree. You know, I think it's, at that point, it's worth items actually good. committing to it. Yeah, the items are good. Uh, it is a really strong three star still. Recombobulator. Chaos. One more time, Keith. Come on. There's a couple of them all around here. Oh, yeah, you're right. Is that wet jungler? One three the other two. Chaos still has it. I think it. Chaos might take it. Yeah, he, he yeah. More called he's it out. Hovering. He rolled the other two. Looks like he's hovering item grab bag. Let he's us see it. it. Let us see it, Chaos. Once again, give us the recombob. Did he do it? He did he it. He did it. Oh. He did it. For the fans, Come Chaos. On. Let's see it. What'd he get? There's a Jin and an Ezreal, hey, so he's got Big Shot okay. online. Uh, yeah, he's still it's a little not... underwhelming. You don't yeah. really want to play Jin at this point in the game. Come on, Ward. What are you doing? <laughs> I, I feel like if you had a Shoujin, the Jin would actually be okay at this point four in the game shot. with how slow combat is. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, uh, and the fact that you have four Big Shot is pretty powerful here. But yeah, otherwise, the fact that you're still playing on Quirky, you've got these uh, Pantheons of all things, so. Yeah, and I mean, I always, I always feel like Core Big Shot feels kind of underwhelming because I end up, anytime I create these these sorts of boards, my front line ends up being yeah. too weak. Yeah. And you, it, it's really hard. It feels like to fit the Core Big Shot. You know, things like high and stuff, especially when they're not itemized, don't really give me a lot of value. So I, I expect him to start to pivot out of it. I'm a little bit surprised they didn't just play the Blitz and the Garen and, and play two Big Shot. Um, but that yeah, obviously exactly. didn't work out for this round. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I also think that one of the biggest weaknesses of Jin in this early game, even though the rounds are long, like Mar was saying, a lot of times you want to hold things on your bench. Like you're trying yeah. to put together comps, you're holding pairs, you don't have enough room, and you, you can't afford to sell them to get more power during the round. So uh, it ends up making Jin a lot weaker because he can't hit his ceiling. Get the most cursed combo of an early Jin recombob with cluttered mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty rough. Uh, <laughs> 44 health, by the way, at 3-3 right now for our last place player. This is a... 3-3 set of 3. Look at the rolls, by the way. He spent 4 gold on rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Rolled twice, set of 3 at 3-3. You, you look at his face right now, you know what's going through his head? 
where was this game won? Yeah. yeah. That's what's going through his head right now. He's like, this is a great spot to be in, End but it's, just, two. it's too End late. Game three. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's too late. This is not enough to save me. I'm going out here, so... A little unfortunate. Players are still competing for prize money. There is, I believe, a gap between the top four and bot four of each lobby in terms okay. of the prizing there. So he may not be able to play for actual position uh, later on in the tournament, but he's able to play for position in terms of uh, prize pool. Yeah, so I guess you still want to see this spot. And there's the Jin actually gets taken down. But I guess Chaos's Recombot board wasn't enough to find a, a win here in this fight. Well, and Preston does have that three-star Senna, but he also has, I think, like a one-star Kennen. And, you know, his front line is, is nothing, right? So as the rest of the board starts to upgrade, uh, I think he's going to get a lot stronger. I'm kind of curious on, on what all of your take is. You know, from this position, should he commit to rolling a bit more and trying to get that stronger front line? Or just take the fact that he got an early... 10 to 3 and try to push 9, just try to push those levels and try to cap out higher. Whenever I'm in this position, it it, it feels really weird because you want to take the high roll. One star Lilia, one right? star Nico, one star Echo, one star Cannon is his front line. I think you have to kind of uh, you know, recognize the fact that you shouldn't have hit that Senna without rolling as much as you did and, expe and expect to roll a little bit more. Your options here are either to go 7, roll really deep, or roll more on 6 now. I, I think the big thing here is you have to look at the health, right? It's like, if you were in trouble, then I think you maybe roll down. But the fact that you have this much health, worst case scenario, you lose five rounds in a row as you econ back up and push forward to find things like the Echo later. You build that front line later. And then you're so strong at that point, you should be fine. So I think here with this board, you just, you kind of level, you hopefully see an Echo in your shop and then you build that around the front line around that. I, I agree with more. I think you need to push levels. I think the early tanks are not going to be what you want anyway. So what you're rolling to upgrade Kennen and Lilia, when I don't think you want to play super fan in this game. So instead you'll just then level the seven and sell them and then try and hit something else. It, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. You want to make the I fourth off for Lilia when I can go nine. And yeah, just go nine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's what I'm saying. Come on. I want to remind everybody that Solus and Chaos, these two players who are tied for second in the lobby right now, 18 points a piece. So as we continue on in this game, we'll have to see how they match up against each other. They're both basically just playing to beat the other person and not let whoever else is in that bubble win the game. And Chaos is still sitting on this four big shot. It's working out pretty well for him. Has down on the RE, so he texts that in. Did hit uh, that headliner Nico, so it gives him KDA alongside that four big shot. Has the even shroud slam down, so a pretty darn powerful board at this point. Still sitting on 40 gold as well. Yeah, that's one of the powerful things about Recombobulator in this set is that you take like your two cost, re gets Recombobulated to a three cost, and then you're back open for another headliner. Mm -hmm. So you almost got like the full value out of it. And that's why I think this augment has gone up in popularity quite a bit. I'm really curious with, is there any sort of logic that favors giving you a Recombobulator board with similar traits or anything like that? Because nope. I feel like there's a large amount of games where it feels like people hit things that work together. <laughs> nope, it is, it is literally... No. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, the, the, I mean, that's one of the fun random. things about confirmation bias, right? But yeah, no, it, it literally is full random. Like, it just draws a number 1 through 13, picks that unit, and says, here you go, here's your new All one. Right. So... But sometimes it works out, and like you said, you get so the things I that just complain work when they together. Get full, yeah, of yeah, course, of course. Trade. They Thank just you. high roll. When I, I click that. it, it's the least synergistic units that you could possibly put on a board. <laughs> That's why I don't click it. <laughs> so, yeah. Because yes. I always think I'm going to get unlucky. Even so, when yeah. I'm getting lucky, I just expect to get unlucky. So, 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 so I'm never clicking those. So Gangly's getting excited because... Uh, I mean, we see Yoroi here. I mean, I got very excited when I saw the three star. I got a little less excited when I saw what was on the three star. <laughs> yeah. So this is scary because, like, if you don't get an item remover, what do you do here? Because, so those who don't know, tech super fan in. That's oh, what you do. Yeah. You tech go. super fan hey, in. Bravo. And all of a sudden, Yoroi fixes his board, gets those items off the Samira, is able to. But he has no Samira items anyway. Right, right. I was going to say, because Samira. <laughs> That's Shou... less good than right. what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Shoujin actively griefs Samira. Right, right. Have time. It's like, yeah. So I'm glad we got that off there. But to Azale's point, where are the gloves? We need the gloves. We need something yeah. else here. All right, you I want to pop them talk... off, and then you put them back on when you realize you have nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Chaos's board here, right? We talked before about the strength of playing frontline, backline, right? When you play well, front to back and you really have good. four big shot, all of a sudden, yeah, find this Zach headliner. And those four big shot, and we're talking about the uh, unitemized Jin may not do a ton, but when you have this much time, he is going to be able to ramp up, and with the four big shot AD, deal a lot of, a lot of damage. I mean, he's, he's level 8 now, he's on a 7 streak, he's going to be able to win this one as well, so keeping that streak alive at 8, the you know, first one to actually get it, I think, in this lobby, Pressman 8 now as well, but he's in a really good spot. 
Yeah, we talked about, you know, the, the four big shot in the Jin, but the, if you looked at that fight, the Jin didn't actually do that much. It was really just a Corky, which we've seen Corky be very successful. Corky too. And then combine that with the four big shot, that's an even better Corky than before. And so that just puts him in a great situation. And it looked like points wise, you were mentioning, you know, Chaos and Solus kind of the top right now. Chaos on this eight round win streak, Solus kind of crashing and burning a little bit, 47 health. Well, Solus just rolled zero on, on eight. So he just went eight, rolled down. I want to see his board and see, you know, what kind of position he's getting himself in as we're watching Coco trying to remake his board. Does hit that Zed headliner. Long items. Um, and has a lot of crowd divers there. Was you know, that a crowd diver plus one on the headliner? Did anyone push that? I think it's EDM Looking because he's it, got yeah. the EDM thing. No, EDM, with yeah, yeah, so, yeah. It's interesting because EDM is definitely one of the traits if you look around this tournament. I think we've basically seen no real EDM. Yeah, I saw I saw a luxury got one roll Lux, in one yeah. game, a three star Lux EDM, but that was about they it. They probably got like third or fourth. Or... I don't even think it was the top four. I'm <laughs> yeah. It might have been fifth. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't so. bad, but it was like around. Yeah. Around okay. Around. Look at the Samir items, by the way. They're back. <laughs> yeah. it's, like I, it's like I said, you take them off, you put them back on. Put Super fan back in. One uh, more time, right it back. It's still in. That's what the IE is. Oy, oy, oy. Uh, uh, so again, the way Samira works is every auto, if she crits, her rating goes up. That gives her a bunch of attack speed. And then when the ult casts, based on the higher letter, you get more damage. So if you get up to S and then you cast that ult, it can wreck people. Shojin makes you cast quicker, which resets your letter, so you don't really get the full benefit. You need those full crit items here. Chaos now finding a headliner Akali, which is a good champion, selling a lot of the big shots, moving those ED items. But now we're in this no frontline situation that we see a lot of the times when we see these transitions. Yeah, it's, it's so common, right? You know, players generally do really prioritize the carry headliners as opposed to those frontliner headliners. Um, and a lot of these situations, it means they're spending so much gold, so much itemization towards that carry. And then it's kind of surrounded by a bunch of, of garbage, <laughs> um, which, which makes it sometimes tough for it to do that damage. Yeah, that has been the big issue overall. And I think a lot of the times we see people even skipping a lot of like frontliners to build the board because they're trying to save gold to make sure they can afford their headliner and hit the right one. And I think that's where we see a lot of players falter. And when we talk about those big misses on the roll downs, I feel like that's what's happening a lot of the time is instead of settling on a headliner, maybe even renting the unit, you see people roll deep and they don't have enough money to build a real board around it. And Preston now obviously has stabilized and proved that, that front line quite a lot, but he's gone eight. He didn't spend a lot of gold to do it. He's on that five streak, he stops Chaos's streak. We have to look down to Solus as well, who has won two rounds since actually spending all his gold. Um, we can see what is his board. Solus is on that right side. So he is playing uh, that kind of crowd diver line, it looks like. Has Zed, has uh, the Yone in there, as well as the, the Mord and the Karthus. So Pentakill, Crowd Diver. The other big player I want to talk about is Phoenix. He has a lead, but he's not guaranteed by any means. There's two people below him who are very close with Chaos and Solus, but he's found this Ezreal, I'm assuming, headliner with the upgrade, since Phoenix is also sitting at level eight. And those are fantastic items to stabilize around. It's just if he can find a good front line to go with it right now, playing with the super fans. Yeah, one of the fascinating parts about this format where you go to top cut is that this final game, the players cannot actually build enough of a gap over each other to guarantee their spot in. So Phoenix, even though he was able to take first in that last game, still only two points up on Chaos and Sola. So definitely not out of the woods, needs to have a strong finish. This is one of these interesting uh, decision trees too, is because he hit the, the big shot plus one on the Ezreal headliner. I always find it that pushes me towards feeling like, okay, I should play four big shot again, you know? But I, I feel like a lot of times I actually have more success by just dropping both the other big shots, sitting on two big shots and, and adding it in, right? Cause he's sitting on a Kai'Sa one and an MF one. You know, he has Blitz on his bench. He has Sona on his bench. Like, do you think that those would just add more value in this in this spot? You read my mind. I think this is a spot where four big shot is not the correct play. If you had a secondary carry, maybe it becomes yeah. worth it then. But having that extra front line, this is where you run those traits like two Bruiser and two Sentinel. But even if your front line isn't that strong, just the extra armor and health that's they giving your that entire time. team is just so much effective value. That's the way to go. And so that can really strengthen the board a lot. I remember being on the floor yesterday, just looking around and finding one of Setsuko's games who was level eight on a law streak, but was able to stabilize on a six Sentinel with just eight bit background playing around that Caitlyn. In stage four and early parts of stage five, until people really cap out 
those strong legendary boards, having enough time for your backline to ramp up is really going to be enough to win you a fight. And this is really interesting. So, you know, decided to just full send it on a, he's staying on a, trying to hit these three stars, looking for the three star bags, but haven't seen a lot of the three star Samira just for executioner. I've only really seen, seen people playing that around that country line. Um, but of course not this time, and g Tung looking like he may be going out, but see if he can hold on for a few more rounds. Holly is going to fall, right? He got one at least. He's, he's holding on at least one more, but I, I don't know that he's long for this world unless he can hit this MF3, but even then, I don't think it's stable enough that you're going to win yeah. every fight for the next, you know, while to outlive anybody else. People are going to be nine soon, right? You look yeah. at Pressman, he's been eight for a while. He's still on 50 gold, so you're going to have people either capping out these really high boards, and yeah, if, if you're not hitting your MF3 until stage five and later on, you're still at seven when you're doing it, it's tough. The health totals here are really tight at the end of stage four as we take stock of the lobby. Uh, the main players, again, that we're really looking at. <laughs> and, and then there's Preston, right? <laughs> but Phoenix with a two point lead, 30 HP. Lecoco, 34. Chaos, 34. Wet Jungler, 46. Solus, 47. And Solus turned it around real hard that stage, playing around the Zed. Wanted to call out the augment choice, Silver Veil, giving that time just to ramp up a little bit. That's a great choice with the Zed. Oftentimes, Zed really struggles with getting CC. You feel like you have to build a Quicksilver. That's going to allow him to build. You have the BT, the Edge of Night, the Quicksilver. Throw on like an IE or something like that, and that Zed's going to be crushing. I find Silver Veil a pretty weak as an early augment, but late, I find yeah, it yeah. really, really strong. You know, even just surprisingly, so much value I get from my frontliners, right? Because your frontliners don't get CC. They get that little bit of extra attack speed. Something that allows them to get that spell cast off, which can really make all the difference. Big opportunity for Solus to figure out what he wants to make for his third item on this Zed. We'll see. Is it going to be something like an IE? Yeah. It's looking like it. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Look at that. Hey, we, look at that, Mort. And more. We talked about it yesterday on the cast. Like he plays it, the oh, game or something. <laughs> a lot of people do tend to play these crowd divers and edge lords around the back loaded damage. And Zed certainly is capable of doing that. But when you can oh, give them that front loaded damage, it can really turn the fight around very quickly. As yeah, Jutung did hit that three star MF, so we'll see if it's going to be enough to keep him alive against Phoenix here, who has found that headliner. Caitlyn casting out pretty good positioning with the MF and it's going to be enough to get him through another round here and it's going to be Phoenix taking wow, a pretty big hit that's a five face. unit loss so he is now potentially on one life here depending on how bad that next loss is yeah, and his board didn't look particularly Seven strong loss streak either as well and he's on he's he's broke he's broke his board doesn't feel that strong it's very tough because he's in the best position to make it in right he's got the highest score but a he bottom four is not safe at all, and an eighth would be, he's probably not in. If yeah, he I mean, that would be catastrophic, right? Because Jitung was looking like he was just going to go out and kind of protect you from that. Um, but in this case, now, Phoenix going to be nervous, especially if he goes up against some of these super strong players. Prestivent finally did lose uh, and drop that win streak. Was it, considering what he wanted to do now. It feels like the theme of this lobby is we keep seeing these amazing carries, right? We're seeing these MF3s, some Mira 3s, the, the Caitlyn 2s, the Ezreal 2s. But we're seeing almost no front line, right? No one's choosing to take a headliner front line. We're not seeing many two stars. Like, that's a, that's a Nico, which is okay. So not a lot of investment in front line, which is turning these fights into, like, if it goes wrong, it goes wrong very quickly. Now your Roy might go down, but there's the stun. Oh, yeah, cast. my the big goodness. Vex saving the day with that cast there. The timing after everything else had fallen. Phoenix and Chaos right now. Eight loss streak, six loss streak. Phoenix lost again. Really rough. Good. Two HP. Yeah, he could he could very easily be eighth, and then all of a sudden it goes from, you know, him being so happy after that last one where you think you're out for sure, you're going to be moving on to, hey, he's facing down elimination and he doesn't have any gold. There's not really anything for him to pivot towards. He did get that Sona two, but is it going to make a difference uh, from this spot? So hot take here: Sona two without a Ginsu's is a waste of ten gold. You, that, that was a chance where, again, this could be more frontline. What is the Sona? Like, she's providing traits, but you're not even really benefiting because you don't have something like Jazz in. It's just a really rough situation here. Do you think there's a, any world in which, you know, you should be, you know, selling the one RE, putting your second RE, putting at least the Nash or something on it? I mean, Sona's going to die without even casting. Yep. Chaos and Phoenix right here. Very important, important fight for the both of them. Let's see how that yep. turns out as we take a look now at Yaroi and Jitung. Phoenix is definitely dead. Yaroi's going to go down as well, but did Phoenix end up in seventh? Or will it be eighth? It looks like it's seventh because oh. Yaroi took a big loss to the HP lands, but a seventh, maybe that saves him if Chaos falls very soon as well. 
right? Because this is going to be 22 points. Chaos needs to find four. I'm not sure that it does, to be honest, right? We had a lot of those players at the top end-ish of the points, right? Players like Wet Jungler, like Coco, I believe we're in that 15-point range somewhere around there. We'll have to see it when they come back on. So yeah, you're right. This might actually spell disaster for Phoenix. And that's the brutal thing about these lobbies is one bad game can mean you're going home, right? Yeah. One seventh, one eighth, and sometimes that is going to be the difference. You need to eke out every single placement you can get. And it's almost misleading, right? Because like, for example, a press player like Precedent who got that eighth early, that seventh early, it's kind of like, okay, you've made your piece and now you have to play two more games. <laughs> but for a player like Phoenix where it's like, I did so well, and then to crash at the end, that's going to be really heartbreaking, right? You're like, all I had to do was go like fifth, and I would have been fine. Mm -hmm. And to, to rough it, you know, it's like that's where the pressure builds, and you start making some maybe not ideal decisions because you're just like, I, I'm in my own head. So it's wide open for Solus now at 18 points. He's at the top of the lobby in HP. He's wind streaking. His board actually looks good. You were talking about no one having front line. This front line is actually pretty solid. He's got the Sentinel in, the Mordekaiser too. The edge lords are actually relatively beefy, so they can kind of buy a lot of time for this Zed. And overall, he just does a lot of damage. So Solus being able to continue to put that together. And then we have to start looking towards, you know, the Coco and Wet Jungler as potential ways to catch up because Chaos is really on death's door here. I mean, the interesting thing about, about Solus' strategy in this game is he hit eight, he rolled to zero, stabilized, and then he's just decided, you know what, I'm staying eight forever. Because he he's, he's, he's going to think uh, he's going to move out of this of this round by just getting like that fourth or whatever, as Mort was talking about. So he's not electing to actually go towards nine, but it's not like he's close to a Yone three or anything like that. He doesn't have any extra copies. So there's not really any room for his board to grow on eight. I mean, interestingly enough, other than Precedent, everyone is eight, right? And I think pretty much every other lobby, especially at the start of this group, we were seeing the nines on five twos, yeah. right? We were seeing a lot of that. This game, it was like, no, the pressure is high. Every point matters. And for some players like Solus, it worked out. For others like Phoenix, it kind of backfired. Big thing to look at now, Chaos falling in that last fight. g Tuck holding on by finding the Misfortune 3. And because of this, you know, we're really looking at the Coco who is at 15 points, Wet Jungler who is at 13. Are there ways for them to squeeze into that top two? Ji Tung last fight had a really strong matchup into those melee carries because of how much single target damage MF can provide. Oh, this oh, barely oh, 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 loses that fight. That's actually crazy. I thought for sure the early fresh hook from Preston's side slow down the MF so much. You did get that perfect chain into the back line. I thought that, that g Tongue was gonna be toast, but six win streak now from four HP. He was looking like he was about to get the fattest eight. Like he was, you know, still stuck on seven. Everyone had been pushing up, um, but you know, moving himself into that top five and who knows where he can go from here. I'm kind of surprised the three-star mid's fortune made enough of a difference to just never lose another fight for, for six rounds because the front line was still relatively soft, but the MF just having enough damage, I think the Jazz spat was the big difference, giving so much extra HP to the board. Yeah, it makes a big difference, and I also think the fact that no one no one went nine in this lobby. I mean, that's a big thing, and the other thing about MF is she's very front to back, right? If there's two tanks, she has a long time to get through them, but we keep talking about this is a lobby yeah. with not that much front line. As soon as she's on those backliners, they die very fast. Look at these items. This is Deathblade, i.e. Giant Slayer. Like, if you hit a backliner, they're going to go pop. I feel like that's pretty much the, the best in slot type of, of build for MF. I feel like you build heavy AD, it does so much damage when you're able to cast those spells. And as you're saying more, we're not seeing anything like a three item blitz two with a bramble or whatever right, that's right. gonna get stuck on. Like watch this fight, right? You're hitting an, a, a Mordekaiser with one item. Each ult is just gonna wreck, right? And so the Mordekaiser is already almost dead before the ult. Now you're already on the Akali. You're doing a ton of damage and like, Everything is melting now, right? This MF is just hitting soft targets, and every ult is just like deleting things, easy wins, and it feels like that's what's gonna be the fight art. But like you said, a Blitz 2, that could be the thing that like, nope, I can't get through this. Yep. Wet Jungler goes down, and all of a sudden, it's kind of this interesting spot where if Jitong and Prestivant go 1-2, it kind of opens it up back up for players like Phoenix who went 7th there, right? Where we said it may not have been enough, suddenly it actually could be. Yeah, the biggest one right now is Lococo to look at, right? Sola should be pretty much locked in with the top 4 here. 18 points is major competition, have already bought forward in this. But Lococo was the one at 15. He was the one who was kind of a little bit outside looking in. And with Phoenix at 22 points, Lococo now needs to find that second or better to even find the tie, but Phoenix went first twice. This has got to be a first for Lococo. He's really got to be playing for that. 
You can see the reposition there from Jitong does actually swap his MF over to the opposite side of the Zed. Let's see if that can make a difference. Because Zed's already getting in the back line, but not on the side of the MF. Other, other hand, Lecoco with that pentacle board looks like is not. Oh, actually, wait a second. Is now on the back line of Preston. Not quite enough, though. Coco, does he live? No, no. no. goes down. Coco goes down. Still a fourth though, because Wet Jungler also went down here. And so Jitong, I mean, you know, obviously not going to make it on, but like definitely have a redeeming final game here at the very least, playing this MF on this eight game win streak. Honestly, feeling still kind of like the strongest in the lobby with a comp that frankly, we have not seen much of this tournament, right? Like it, it's MF, I don't think it's been something I've seen all weekend, really. It's funny because, you know, last patch we saw so much of this ramping damage dominate the meta. However, we're actually seeing, even with the changes to the Misfortune build, how the upfront single target damage is very valuable, especially like you're saying, in these lobbies where we do not have a significant frontline dominating the, the lobby. Looking at this fight, Misfortune trying to punch through. Jitong trying to stay alive, but finally running into a real frontline. This is what Moore was yep. talking about, right? You run into these big BB tanks. We got this Poppy that MF still can't take down, and that's going to spell it for Jitong. Press event has actually built such a strong board. But that's going to do it. Yeah, the big thing in that fight, too, is there was the Poppy, but there was also the Kiana generating those tank items yeah. that made even more frontline to deal with. And again, that spells the weakness, right? MF is still a front to back carry. And if you can't get through the front, you're not going to touch the back and just get wrecked. And so now we see Precedent versus Solus. For Solus, kind of a victory lap here for Precedent. Again, kind of going, where was this game one through three? But overall, nothing too crazy. And at least Precedent can, you know, with his new DSG tag, can hold, 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 hold his head high. That's a hard one. So. All right, well, the head-to-head, -head, we see both the boards. Solus trying to punch through and get that first, but end of the day, I think he's done enough, and really, he's got to be happy with his performance in this game. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be able to take on Preston either. The Kiana too, VT just got picked up as well, so he has that three items on that Kiana. It's going to be really tough to take down. Um, does have the Edge of Night as well, and just going to be putting it over on that same side, so stealing these items away from that head. Already multiple three, four items popping over onto his team. Yeah, just going to be farming so many stats. Mort called it out. We've talked about Kiana all weekend as being, you know, the best way to kind of cap out the board at the very top end because of all this extra value you get from either printing items or just, you know, loading <laughs> them during a fight. So I don't know if you caught the player cams there, but you can see Solus, he's kind of relaxed a little bit. He was smiling. <laughs> he was calling out to somebody like, yeah, I got this. So again, even if he takes a second here, that's all he needed. He is in a great spot here. And to go from top 128 to top 32, that's a massive accomplishment. I expect to see a smile on his face. And Solus has been around since set one. He's been doing great. That's got to feel so good. Absolutely. And I, I think he really recognized in this game, he was never going for first anyway when he stayed on eight forever, yeah. right? Like he was not close to you on A3. It was not like he was rolling for anything in particular. He was just rolling to stabilize his board and see, okay, I just need to finish reasonably high and I'm moving on. He stayed on eight. He's able to make that happen. Precedent, great final game from him as this should be the final fight here. Going to be able to walk out of this tournament, as you said, more with his head held high in first place in this final game, Ooh, representing this guy as well. Yeah. But Solus, he's going to be going to the top 32. Solus has to feel good. You know, it actually feels a little poetic, Mort. I'm sure, I'm sure you may even remember it. This is not the first time we've seen Solus play uh, and pop off with the Zed Viego combination as well. Right? <laughs> oh, that's true. Solus. That's great. Yeah, the summit makes its return. Solus, a stable in North America. And you know what? People may not always consider Solus a top 15 player, but you can see it right now why I never doubted him. Solace, rank one in my heart, baby. Congratulations on moving on. Yeah, that's so big from Solace. And I'm, I'm curious if we'll end up seeing exactly who made it because I think it's Phoenix has still stuck in. I think, I think so. I think with everything else that happened, all the people that were threatening dropping down, seventh was enough. It was really off the back of two first places. So such an impressive performance from him as well. You gotta be sweating though. Oh my God. Yeah. In the oh, final yeah. game, you're like, Ooh. not like this, but we'll Look at that smile. Look, final standings. Look at that smile. That is happiness. That is somebody who's just like on cloud nine a little bit, just feeling really good, so. And we've said it so many times that this is like the magic of LAN, right? We don't normally get the player cameras. We don't normally get to see everybody react live to how everything is going. And so it's the magic of Vegas that we get to see how all these players react. Jumping into highlights here, you can see the players getting ready, anticipating what's going on here. 
precedent we saw hitting that early Senna, that headliner that again has been the early game dominant head preferred headliner. You get the Shoujins, use the super fan cast so much doing the true damage here. Chaos playing around that Corky as well. We saw that Recombobulator giving him four big shot, giving him enough strength. Set certainly in the mid game on the seven win streak, turning it into an eight there, feeling really good. Really only being overshadowed by the precedent here. And so Chaos made great work of that transitioning. And then Jitung, who was in that really awkward position here. You can see him in eighth place here, level seven, kind of struggling, but made a great comeback with this misfortune. Got it all the way back up to a third place, which is great. We see Lococo here kind of getting wrecked, so. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, so few players can move on. We've already eliminated down the field an incredible amount. And it started with over 500 players. We're moving on to only 32 remaining after just our second day. And then, of course, we're going to have another lobby. We're going to narrow that down to the final eight players. We're going to be battling it out tomorrow to become the Team Fight Tactics Vegas Open champion. Now that is going to be so exciting. Here are those final points standing. Solus, 25 points. Yep. Phoenix in second in 22 points. Wow. Just narrowly edging out Coco, who had 20 points. Chaos, who had 21, 21 points as well. Oh, my so goodness. So only two points between second and fourth. But that's the difference. We've seen it all tournament long. Every single placement is massive. And Chaos finishing sixth there, a fifth would have been a tie. A fourth would have been him advancing. These are the moments in tournament, and I hate to say this with the players here, that honestly haunt you for so long, right? <laughs> because you think to yourself as you go to bed at night, I could have saved a little bit of HP here, a little bit of HP here, and maybe scraped out one additional placement. And yeah, you know what? We play a game of variance, but being able to Look save one placement is the expression of skill. Yeah, more Look at this saved. graph. We talk about graphs here, right? This is a graph where press event clearly just won, That's won, a good won. Graph. That is a great <laughs> graph. That is, that is the kind where you're like, did I just hide? roll what's going on here this game is too easy uh but again i think for Preston, he's just thinking where was this the other three games? yeah i mean so. uh he did hit that three star center with only two rolls so obviously Ooh. very happy about that pushed him into the late game but we are ready for the interview it's gas standing by with solace on stage all right everybody give it up for solace Solus, congratulations. You made it on to the top 32. What are the emotions immediately running through you? You've made it to the very top of this tournament. Oh, I just relieved. I was uh, shaken. For sure. I mean, it's got to be an intense situation. You go into the final game. You've got a good points spot with 18, right? You're one of the top three. Did you play any different in that final game knowing you already had the lead? Oh, yeah, because I'm up against like the people who are tied with me. They, had, they were really good players, so... I, I want to outplace them, so I actually scout and see what spot in to like end my game, end game come with, like what counters. All right, it worked perfectly. And we were talking about some of the earlier games you were playing, playing around level nine and getting there in very creative ways. We saw the Mosher with the Sona trying to buy some time for you. Is that something you had practiced or is that something you came up with on the fly? Uh, I mean, it's pretty basic. I just copy like my friends, like, you know, this self sets to go, yeah. All right, Solis, well, going into the top 32, how confident are you that you will be able to convert, make it to that final lobby? Uh, uh, in the morning, I wasn't confident at all because uh, yesterday I had no wins, but today I play much greedier and I know I need to make top two to go through. So I think I'm pretty confident. All right, well, thank you, Solis. You heard it from him. He's confident he's gonna make it to that top eight. Thank you, Solis, so much. We're gonna throw it to a break and we'll be back with more of the Team Fight Tactics Vegas Open. Okay. 
Welcome back to the TFT Vegas Open and after roaming the floor for four games, I'm also now ready to get on the desk. You as well, Panda, but we have a special guest with us here. Kiyun has joined us to uh, talk a little bit about how it feels as a competitor here uh, at the Vegas Open. Uh, I'm ex really excited to be here and um, yesterday I, I got day one, but the games were really fun and then the event was like really well planned out. So. I'm really excited to be here. Yep. And overall, how's it been kind of finally having a big TFT land? We had Summit last year, of course, but this is yeah. obviously much bigger scale. You've been playing for all of TFT's history, basically. How does it feel? Does it feel rewarding, satisfying to have something like this finally happen? Uh, yeah, yeah, it feels uh, good to meet all the friends that you've been playing with um, like for like years. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely good. And um, like, I don't know, like, this set is one of the like, most fun sets I've played. So it also just goes in hand in hand. And yeah, it's, it's been good. I'm sure all the devs that are here love hearing that. We've been talking to them a little bit as well. But of course, the big question that is looming over the room is who actually made it a top two cutoff is kind of unprecedented, I would say, in TFT. It's very, very rough, and only very few players could go through it. And we do have our lobby standings here. Lobby 5 coming up here with Young Wolf and the Farmer making it through. And some big names not able to make it through. Sean's not going to make it. Tex, the Philly and Coach are also not going through. And here we go. One of the big players from yeah. China who made the trip over here has world experience making top four back in Dragonlance. Cannot actually make it through to the top 32. Like you said, it makes brutal cutoff even yesterday as well. But in this case, all the lobbies are stacked here, and it's yeah. so much harder to actually finish in that top two. I just want to point out it's two NA players, top two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's wait for the rest of the standings, yeah. buddy. We have <laughs> Lobby 4 here with Kaiju Kaiju. I think you were just doing an interview over there. Um, and then Flancy, of course, uh, one of China's, I would say, most successful competitive yeah. players coming through here in the second spot as well. Uh, we are going to take a look at Lobby 12. Let's see who made it through there. Stay Alive and Zaza. Actually, right the moment when I walked past, Zaza was getting up and I was like, did you make it? And he's like, yes. And that was a crazy lobby as well. Going into the last game, 17 points for Milk, for Sasa, and for Stay Alive coming out of SEA. So it was really down to the wire. Milk got eliminated at minus one HP. That same exact fight, Sasa stayed alive at one HP. So incredibly close, a real nail biter. It, it sucks, of course, to see Milk going out. I think he's one of the best players from an A. And it sucks that this guy is overall as a team uh, didn't do so well in that yeah. day one, but day two especially. It was such yeah. a tough, again, the format is brutal. Uh, no blame on anyone, uh, but really, really sucks to not see Milk make it.
Um, this lobby, you can see another DSG member getting out. Which yeah, is lobby three. Um, AKA Wonder made it out, and I'm not familiar with Maddie's though, but they both smurfed it. Yeah, and this was a rough one as well. There's Soap in there, Jazz Latte, mm -hmm. Asa and Panda from Korea, not actually the Panda that's with us on the couch here. <laughs> but AKA Wonder, I think, has to be kind of a success story of his own because in EMEA, obviously people know him, but he hasn't really had that competitive success. And then in a format that's as cutthroat as this one, he's suddenly shining. He's the only Spanish player left. He used to represent Team Liquid as well. Uh, he used to have a Hearthstone background and now coming into TFT and still performing at a high level in strategy games overall. So a really happy person to see him succeed. A, a big friend of mine. I think he's been really smurfing. He came into it, as you mentioned, not really a favorite, but still a strong player. But he's played really well across the first two days. Yep. Uh, I, I was watching his game. He was also doing really well. And I'm excited to see him uh, in the next round of 32, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's yep. right. Yeah, it, it were. it's so quick, right? We went here and it feels like it was only an hour ago with 512 players and we're down to such a small group and it's even going to get smaller leading into day three. But of course, there's four more games before we go. There are lots and lots of action to come. And uh, I'm very curious to hear what has been going on on the floor, to be honest. Uh, we're going to listen in and see what people have been saying and whether or not they're good at trivia, I think. Ooh. Everyone, Azale here at the TFT Vegas Open with Riot Effect and Faker Wife. <laughs> uh, we're going to do some trivia. Since you're a dev, I was told to give you some hard questions. We'll start with what is considered a medium question. Okay. First one is, name all of Kane's traits in Remix Rumble. Wow. Uh, one is the Hurt Still. Yes. Uh, one is the Edge Lord. Yes. Is there one more? There's one more. It's like his personal trait. You know how Jin has Maestro? He has his own individual one. No, I don't know. You know what is uh Damn, this is hard question. I have no clue. It's wild card. Oh, wild God, card, yes. yeah. Which champion is known as the Harbinger of Doom? Hmm. Any hint? <laughs> he's very spooky. Oh, he's spooky. Oh, Nocturne? No. Wow. Which champion yells Demacia as he charges into battle? Garen? Garen. Garen. Yes. Yes, it is Garen. We'll see it. Which champion was the first to be introduced after the game was officially released? That's a hard question. This is, this is in the easy bucket, but it's hard. We're talking team fight tactics? I think it's League of Legends. League of Legends. So, all right. Lamis uh, is there already. Cat was there. It's a trick 2G favorite. Uh, is it Warwick? Udyr, Udyr, okay. What full item was made from a sword and another sword in set one? Is it not Death Blade? No, it's not set one, right? Oh, sword of the Vine? Is it Sword of the Vine? No, no, it's not. Which is the youngest champion in the game? Youngest champion? Blair. Blair? Like, just recently released, or? Like no, 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 lore-wise, lore as, as though they're age, they're age in the game. Milio? Annie seems pretty young. Annie? Annie or Milio? Milio gives up younger vibes. <laughs> Milio? Milio? It's Annie, it's Annie, you guys almost had it, almost had it. What is the ultimate ability of Zed called? I feel like all league players just say R, ultimate. <laughs> um, You're not wrong. It, st it starts with death. Uh, death mark? Yes, okay. yes, correct, correct, correct. One. What full item was made from two BF swords in set one? Red buff? Wait, 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 no. It wasn't, was it death blade? No, it's, okay, set one. Set one, I don't remember. I, I, we played set one. I think it was like a, like a crossbow or something. Wait, it wasn't, it wasn't Phantom Dancer. I don't think it was Phantom Dancer. Um, that, was, that was like bow chain. Or something, yeah. Um, oh, right. What are some old items? <laughs> <laughs> was it Red Buff? Go with it, Red, Red Buff. Buff? Infinity Edge. So, which unit in Remix, in Remix Umble has been a 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 cost at some point throughout TFT's history? And it's currently a 1 cost in TFT. Lulu. Lulu is a three cost in right now. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. 
Kasante? Yasuo. Yasuo. These, that's a hard question. That's a hard question. Thank you very much, guys. Hope you're enjoying the event. Hello, everyone. I am here with Dylan, who is the competitive lead for the TFT Vegas Open. And I'm so excited to talk to you to get your thoughts on the action so far. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. We've been planning this event for over a year, um, and it's been running really well um, overall so far. And we're just really happy to see the competition continue. Has it lived up to what you were hoping in terms of where you would like to see the level of play, how everybody has been enjoying the event? Yeah, um, we've been seeing a ton of tweets about how it's sort of, you know, emulating the vibes of like MLG events of the past, and that really makes us happy. There's a ton of people that are working on this that, you know, kind of helped build esports um, back in the day, and it's really cool to see um, everyone like super involved and, and just happy to be here. The competition has been really fierce, and I know that all of the competitors are trying their best, but sadly, after day number one, 75% of the field did get cut. So what is it that they get to do now? Yeah, um, so there's a second chance um, competition going on um, with all of the competitors that got out on day one, um, and that's going on right now, and it'll also be going on tomorrow. Um, and there's also essentially side events um, that anyone can play, including spectators. Um, there's hyper roll, normals, uh, developer normals, so you can you know play with some of the devs. And then there's two special events. There's Mastermind and 4v4. So Mastermind is going to be essentially um, one player versus one player controlling four PCs. Um, and then they'll basically play musical chairs going around to all of the stations um, trying to get the best, best placement across all of the um, four, four accounts. Um, and then there's also 4v4 where you can grab a group of your friends and play against another group of four. Um, and then same thing, uh, you know, add up your placements and then you can win as well. And you can win a TFT poker chip um, if you get top four. And then if you win, you'll get a uh, poker deck um, that's customized just like from the merch store. Well, that sounds like an amazing prize and also some really amazing game modes. What would you say is your favorite? Um, I'm really excited to see Mastermind. Uh, there's a dev that actually invented it internally, and they've never done it live, and uh, I think some of them are going to come over and, and try to play it. I think we might have to capture some of that action. But, Dylan, thank you so much for sharing that with us, and I'm glad you're enjoying the tournament. Thank you so much. We're here on the TFT Vegas Open floor with Brock and Bobo, part of the Vegas Open team in charge of doing some of the coolest stuff on this venue. Headliner Kaisa, the headliner's over here with Jin as well, the prize tower and the tunnel entrance. I want to ask you, Bobo, yeah. what is the inspiration for all this kind of stuff? Where do the ideas come from, really? Yeah, totally. So with the tunnel, uh, portals were introduced in set nine. It's, you know, adds a little variance to each game. We wanted folks, when they come here, to have that portal moment, right? And it looks like it might be an evergreen mechanic going forward, so we wanted to celebrate that. Uh, with the Kaisa statue, it's Prestige Kaisa. It's the first Prestige chibi skin that we really wanted to celebrate and get that made, you know? We got the Annie statue at Riot HQ. Maybe we can add some uh, TFT flavor at Riot HQ, so that's super cool. Uh, prize Tower, that's basically we wanted to celebrate how you have the treasure realm and treasure tokens inside the game, how you uh, get Little, new little legends and all that. We wanted to get people, give people an opportunity to uh, have that same experience in real life. Uh, and then, I don't know. I think these uh, these headliner moments are pretty, uh, or band moments are pretty self-explanatory. We just wanted to celebrate the music in the in the new set. I think everything is really awesome. I love the prize tower, especially. It's so so cool. Looking at you, Brock. I want to ask about the timeline for something like this. These are huge pieces. They look very complicated. What is the execution like to bring something like this to the Vegas Open? Well, first of all, we're part of a much larger team that brought this to life. Uh, all of the things you see out here, statue, hall of headliners, prize tower, took many forms, many different iterations, and ultimately what you see is what we fell in love with and what we thought would be the best representation of, you know, the first time TFT coming to Vegas. They wanted to give the fans something to interact with and celebrate being here. Thanks so much, guys, for your answers. I think overall, all I can say is chef's kiss to everything that's done here. It's really so, so awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much. And we're back here at the desk, and Azale is now with Hello. us as well. I hope you had a little bit of a break, but we are ready to talk a little bit more about the action that happened all throughout today. And of course, we would love to hear from you specifically, Kyun, and, and hear what you have to say about like some of your friends that are playing, some of your teammates. Um, yeah, um, all of our teammates, all of my teammates got eliminated. <laughs> I today. was trying not to say that. Yeah, um, yeah. so just, we're just here for a good time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but you did have some friends on the main broadcast lobby, Solis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At a very high level, not part of your org right now, but you 
been, uh, I think, linked with Solus a lot in the past. Uh, are you happy to see him having some success? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've known Solus since I won, and uh, we were on the same org on TSM Lake uh, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, my knee was good, and he also had like a really good strike going into the tourney, and we were looking at like, his matches or anything like that. So definitely not surprised, but also excited that he's doing well. Can you go a bit into what Tolos was doing and, and what worked out for him? Um, like early on the last patch, it was like a fast nine meta, but like last patch, he was already like trying out melee cares and stuff like that, and trying out like different stuff. So he definitely knows like more lines than other people, I would assume, which is why he's doing good. So is, it, is there anyone you said you're not really surprised that Solus is doing well? Is there anyone that has really surprised you? You know that you think is playing particularly well, like or that you didn't well. expect to get as far as they have? Um, I, I don't remember. I just know that a lot of people got upset. Like Kobe getting out on day one mm -hmm. as well was like an upset, and a lot of good players definitely didn't uh, had upsets. So, but I don't, I don't think I remember like anyone that's playing particularly well. How much do you think it is the different environment that's playing into that, right? You know, Bobe went out on day one, Setsuko went out on day one, a ton of people went out yeah. on day one, obviously, who are you know, considered you know, tournament favorites, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people I've talked to have talked a lot about, oh, yeah, I hear everyone behind me, there's so much noise, it's really hard to focus, it's so different than at home. Was that something that you think played into it for a lot of players, uh, or, or maybe yourself? Personally, me, I had no problem with it. I had no issue with it. It's just that um, the three-game sample size is really small, mm -hmm. so the, it's, the variance is pretty high. So I think that's the biggest point. So how is it to like actually sit there and play? Can you hear the other people? What are you hearing? Can uh, you hear the main stage? Yeah, you can hear the main stage and stuff, but it's like not that big of a deal. Like honestly, <laughs> like the only only like thing that's like the most big, big, biggest deal is like the sample size of the game. But mm -hmm. like uh, obviously the sample size has to be small because we're going from 512 players to a to winner one. in like yes. three days. <laughs> so. Yeah. Very fast pace, yeah. but we are looking at the overall standings here again on the big screen. Some names coming through that I'm personally super excited about. Uh, you were just talking about Solus. Is there anyone else you're rooting for here? Um, not. I'm not particularly rooting for anyone, but um, Flancy, the, the the Chinese players, they're yeah. really good. Like Sudo Wudo, I think Koro won. He's playing under mm -hmm. Koro one and Flancy. Because uh, um, Flancy... Uh, I saw them play, and then they're like, they're playing a different game. <laughs> is there something in particular that stands out? You know, you talk, uh, they're playing a different game. Is it a different style, or is it just, just that, how they make um, their boards, or what? Right now, in the current meta, you really want to roll an 8 for the headliner for cost. But sometimes you're like, you don't have the resources, like the HP or the money to do it. And uh, making those games into like a fourth, like a third or second, uh, rolling on level six or seven is like really big. And I saw Sudo Wood or Coral One, uh, he did that like twice yesterday. So like he didn't get a good opener, he was like a low rolling. And then he made that into a top four, which is like what um, differentiates them between other players. Somebody that was just now on the standings here is Beppo, and I got the chance to talk to him yesterday. He's an absolute character, and I think he tweeted as well, saying, like, I got knocked out, but I still love TFT, and, like, posted a picture with more dog, which I thought was so nice. I think that's the big thing. A lot of players got eliminated day one. Obviously, it's disappointing, especially if you come from, you know, EMEA, from Latam, from really far away. It is disappointing to get day one, but... I think the best thing to do there is think about you know, the upside. You're still in Vegas. There's still two more days left. In this case, one more day tomorrow and this next round. There's still a ton of people here that you can call friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's networking opportunities as well. I think it's it's not the end of the world if you get day one in a chance like this. And there will be more opens <laughs> in the future, hopefully. Yes. So there's more chances to come back and, and do it right. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, how have you found this? Is, was this your first big LAN event? Um, yeah, this was the first my big uh, event. I was at Summit before, which was a few months ago. And that event was also really fun. But I've never been to like a gaming event, so definitely my first time. How was how was the vibe being on a team now with like ten teammates and everything coming in? You know, maybe preparing uh, together, hanging out together, talking about strategies and stuff. Like, was that something that you actually really enjoyed? Yeah, it feels good. I mean, we were already like friends. Basically, Toast picked up picked us uh, all of all of us like our friend group. So it's like no difference in the vibe or anything. <laughs> um, but he just but said, now I'll you have the cool merch. Yeah, you look gonna, official. Yeah. We're just basically um, stealing <laughs> Toast's money, I guess. <laughs> well, I personally really love the merch as yeah. well, but we are going to go to a quick break, and we'll hear from all of the people again in a couple of minutes, so don't go anywhere.
Hello, it's Roger, Riot Prism here, and I'm here with Mix. and I was just embarrassed by Azale as he asked me the hardest questions he could find, uh, and after a good bout of crying, I'm here to take some revenge on somebody completely different. Uh, so, Mix, are you ready? I am as ready as can be. All right, what is the ultimate ability of Zed called? In this set? In this set. Something finisher, I don't know, ex executioner, something. I'll give you a hint. It's what Azale did on me during this cast. He death marked really? me. Death mark. Death mark. There you go. I knew that. Yeah. We, we both of us knew that, actually. Uh, <laughs> okay. Are you ready for the next one? You're doing more? Okay. Yeah, one more. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which unit in Remix Rumble has been a one, two, three, Four and five cost throughout TFT's history. I think that's Yasuo. You got it right. And I'm even more embarrassed. Okay. Well, that's it from us. This is Roger and Mix, and we're going to uh, go take off, I think. I'm going to go cry again. Okay. Hey guys, I'm here on station four with the winner of the lobby, Kaido Kai. You had 23 points in total. You smurfed it with some really good competition. Flancy and Soju both in this lobby. How are your general feelings this game, this game in this lobby? Well, you know, it's crazy because I was only planning to get top 256 here. So the fact that I was able to get top 32 is a lot of luck, but it feels amazing. Coming to the next round, do you feel you're a favorite now? Do you feel you're still an underdog? What are your general, your confidence level coming to the next round? I think uh, my performance has been a lot better than I expected. I think I learned the patch really well. Um, so I'm definitely not a favorite, but I'm not out of the competition for sure. Thank you so much and congrats on qualifying. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm here with Ashmu, who's one of the competitors at the TFT Vegas Open, and I just saw you have the largest pop-off. Can you talk me through that? So it was really stressful. Game one, I went seventh, and game two, I somehow brought it back to a first. Game three, I think I, I should have won, but I went third again. So the lobby was really close. Like, the first, there was, like, three people competing for the second spot, and somehow I brought it back. Somehow I uh, went... Yeah, let, let's actually look at this really fast because we're doing this interview and while talking, your board is playing out right now. You're so confident. What's your board state? So it's pretty much, uh, I took Silver Spoon. I was playing for the early heart steal. I think that's pretty much like uh, what brought me like past day two, everything. And uh, I hired this Yone Crowd Diver on, uh, on seven, so. I went for 23, and that's how it is. I guess I'm a high roller. <laughs> you might be a little bit of a high roller, but also I think it's a very cool that we get a chance to celebrate this moment for you and the fact that you're going to be moving on. How does it feel to know that you've made it this far? It feels absolutely amazing. I, I wouldn't have dreamed of coming here, actually. Like, when I started, I started in PBE, so I started, like, day, day one, pretty much, and I was, I was bad. I was, like, Masters, Diamond, like, not competitive level, you know? But I've worked so hard for so many years, and to be able to finally stand on this stage with everyone else, it's, it's actually a beautiful moment. I'm so proud of, like, myself and everyone else who competed with me. It's amazing, actually. And you had a huge group of people behind you, too, that were cheering you on. So how does that feel, playing in a live environment like this? It's... It's unbelievable. Like, these people I've known online for two, three years, you know, talking to them, hanging out, watching, playing, studying, you know, and seeing them in person, supporting me and everything, it's just, it warms my heart. Like, I'm, I'm almost in tears, honestly. It's amazing. It's truly amazing. 
Well, I can hear the emotion. I can hopefully hear the confidence for you as well. Check out the board. It just got the first, and he didn't even need to be there. Ashmu, thank you so much. Congratulations, and best of luck. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. I can't believe that he got away with this. There was even like a dragon. He didn't pick up the anvil. He just stood there giving one of the most wholesome interviews I've ever heard, and his boy won the game for him. Can I just say that is some of the most gnarly BM I've seen in any <laughs> game of any like any time ever. My man is playing against someone who's over there probably sweating for their life, selling off their board, trying to roll down, trying to figure out some way to beat it. And he's giving an interview, yeah. not even rolling his goal, not even picking up his item. I think that's my favorite clip. <laughs> like, that <laughs> is crazy is so what we just saw. And then the game is so BM. <laughs> that's so, so cool. <laughs> The perfect contrast. Yeah. I think it's great to see players like Ash move players like Kaido Kai over at, at Station 4 who didn't consider themselves a favorite but still make the top 32. I think these underdog stories are really cool to see among these huge favorites from other regions from NA as well. Don't read the it's list. It's so awesome. Yeah, don't. <laughs> Looking for the camera. Yeah, it's so cool to see like all the people that are still here. And actually, we did have the clip earlier of like the second chance tournament. And I'm still like in my mind comprehending the masterminds format that they have here where mm -hmm. two players play against each other but on four accounts each it's like what i want to see that i need to like check it out later eventually it sounds so fun Wait, that's actually wild it sounds so chaotic and fun yes. at the same time <laughs> it's a test of i think apm in game yeah, but also yeah. in real life running yeah. around different stations <laughs> trying to get your it's PC. a workout it's Man, a good workout you've got to well. use the team comp planner for that one there's ain't no way you're remembering everything you're yeah. trying to pick up on every single board just running in a circle pick up the team five planner just roll it down and return yeah. <laughs> imagine the carousels i mean <laughs> four oh. carousels at one time <laughs> a fun story um in set one dog used to play on like two computers and he accidentally queued up two challenger accounts and he was playing two games at once and he both top two both games oh, <laughs> what? Both how but, do you do that so this is like dot x2 because <laughs> there's four computers right that's wild. I would actually love to see some top player. You, you, that's content. This is free content. Yeah, Get the disguise people, yeah. go over there and start playing against each other. It's 4v4 with two people. That's yeah. actually cracked. That's free content. Well, we're going to check in on some more lobbies. Lobby six coming up here. Let's see who actually made it out of that one. I'm very curious. Broccoli, Broccoli and Turtle Duckling making it through Flight C. We had an interview with him earlier in the tournament yesterday it was a lovely interview unfortunately not making it all the way and look at the point totals absolute smurf from mm -hmm. top one and two 28 yeah. 27 points on this next one humbug Bobby. also popping off michael just barely qualifying over liquid wow, so close. i was watching that lobby they were right next to where we actually come out of the backstage and all of the latam crowd was like watching this lobby cheering it on and when he finally made it over the other players they were screaming in excitement it was so good i mean it's actually crazy how many close lobbies we had the one yeah. that was on main stage as well it was two points between second and, and fourth you know it's, it's really one placement can make all the difference in these games lobby nine here another german and making it through Kevin Parker making his way to the next round is something I'm super excited about. Out of the top 32, if my uh, math checks out, I think it's about eight players from EMEA making it. So 25% now really in the good. field are EMEA yeah. players. We mentioned it, you know, there's not that many players compared to NA, but the quality players that make the jump over here across the Atlantic, they're really showing up. And this is lobby 10. I feel like we saw three, three lobbies in a row on these where the lab players got third. Yeah, that's well, actually yeah, kind of rough. They're, yeah, they're all missing by by like one, two, three points for their whole squad. Because there's what 25 or 30 of the lab players here. Yeah. They had a whole crew walking around. It's actually a pretty cool, cool thing. Yeah, I love the outfits as well. It's so good to see when you can kind of say like, oh, you know, this is the disguise crew. This yeah, is the lab yeah, crew. Yeah. They're like all visually, even <laughs> like Team Juno with their jackets. I think that's so cool. But also a lot of tiebreakers, especially yeah. in these rounds here. We need some uh, some team battles for. Uh, <laughs> First CFD, you guys can queue up some double up against each other. <laughs> but top top 25% moving on is brutal. Uh, obviously, there's going to be very close lobbies, good players making, uh, not making it out. And uh, yeah, it's going to be really exciting for the next top 32. Well, we're going to go to a quick break. And after that, we'll be ready with more action. So don't go anywhere.